Chapter One of By Way of the Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. Chapter One Revelations. It was in the dawn of a winter morning that Wayne Pearson was awakened by a kiss softly laid upon his forehead. He opened his eyes to see his father, dressed in a new gray suit, valise in hand, bending over him. "'Why, father, are you going away?' Wayne asked, wide awake in an instant. "'Oh, I didn't mean to waken you, my boy, but I wanted to give you a good-bye kiss.' I am going on a little journey that I have no time to tell you about. Aunt Crete will explain. I trust you, Wayne, to be a good, brave boy, and believe that your father thinks he is acting for the best good of all concerned, however it may seem to you. Goodbye. The father stooped and kissed his boy again, while Wayne clasped both arms about his neck and held him close. The boy lay still for a few minutes after his father had left him, thinking over those words about trusting him. Of course he would always believe that his father did just right. Perhaps, he said to himself, father thought I acted vexed yesterday when he wouldn't let me go sailing. I wish I had said that I wasn't and that he's all right every time. I can't think why he told me to be brave just now. Is anything going to happen to me, I wonder? Whereupon he bethought himself to get up and ask Aunt Crete for an explanation. Just then his eyes fell upon a picture hanging at the foot of his bed. He had not noticed it the night before. He remembered now that when he went to bed the moon shone into his room so brightly that he had not lighted the gas. It was a full-size head done in water colors so lifelike that the blue eyes and lovely mouth seemed to smile down at the boy, who gave it a long, worshipful look, wondering greatly the while why it had been taken from the library. It was a delight to have it in his room, but why had it been given to him? His father liked the picture better than any of the others. Tears came into the boy's eyes as he gazed, and thought what a heaven of joy it would be if his mother had indeed come into his room once more, from that long journey whence he well knew there is no returning. Only a little over a year since she went away, his beautiful mother. It seemed long ago in one sense, yet her words and tones and looks were vivid as ever. He turned away suddenly and made a rush for the dining room. "'Aunt Crete, where has father gone, and when will he be back?' Miss Lucretia Pearson, Mr. Pearson's elder sister, who had guided his household since his wife's death, turned a pair of keen gray eyes upon her nephew, and studied his face for a moment to discover if she could whether the boy had any suspicions that this was a journey out of the common order, before she answered.' Your father has gone to Massachusetts on important business, and I think he expects to be gone two or three weeks. So long! And Wayne's eager face shadowed. Well, he said after a moment, father said you would tell me all about it, that he hadn't time. What is there to tell? Wait till after breakfast, Aunt Crete said willing to postpone her communications as long as possible. We can't talk over family matters very well while Anne is coming and going with the waffles. No sooner was breakfast over than Aunt Crete was hurried to the library by her impatient nephew, whose eyes were at once observant of certain changes in the room, especially that of fine oil painting of a sunset scene hung in the place of his mother's picture. "'Aunt Crete, what does this mean? Why was my mother's picture taken from here? It was the prettiest picture in the room.' The boy's tone expressed grief and a suggestion of indignation. "'Well,' began Aunt Crete, after an aggravatingly long pause, "'that's a part of the whole story.' 
Then she added grimly, half to herself, I do wish your father would tell his own secrets and not leave it for me to do. Secrets? I like secrets. Go on, tell quick, please. Wayne was in a quiver of excitement. Aunt Crete's hair was sprinkled with gray, and she had passed through many trying experiences, but this was one of the hard spots, needing more tact and wisdom than she possessed. She drew the boy down beside her on the couch and began in a voice that sounded strange even to herself. Wayne, did you never guess, not one little bit, that changes are coming to this house? Changes? What can you mean, Aunt Crete? The very worst thing that could happen to this house has come already. You and father are not going to die too, are you? Did it never enter my boy's mind that he might sometime have a new mother? A new mother? Nobody can have but one real mother. Do you mean a stepmother? With ominous emphasis on that word, step. Aunt Crete, you must be joking. Tell me the whole truth right out in plain words. Well then, here it is. Your father is going to marry a Mrs. Hamilton of Boston. He has gone there now for that purpose. He will bring her home with him, and she will be your new mother, or stepmother. There it was, plain and hard. Aunt Crete's soul writhed in pain for the boy, though she gave no outward sign. If only he were one of those careless, rollicking fellows who would forget all about it in ten minutes and bound away with a laugh and a whistle. But he was not. He would brood over it in solitude. His intense nature would be stirred to its depths, and he might become rebellious or morbid and gloomy. The boy's face had grown white as his aunt talked, and his eyes glowed with something like anger as he asked, did did my father take my mother's picture out of the library no aunt crete assured him i did that i thought you would like it to be in your room after this a stepmother the boy groaned as if in that word he had sounded the depths of all misery somebody else in mother's place how could father do it i can't i won't stand it i won't and then this boy, with the instincts of a man, rushed away to his room. He must be alone with his sorrow and his anger. It is pitiful to see boyish lips compressed and youthful brows drawn with mental pain. Aunt Crete suffered with this boy. She said to herself as he dashed away, Yes, I've made a mess of it. I knew I would. It does seem a strange state of things, I declare. The fact is, it is downright cruelty to that child and nothing else. Men are queer. Then Aunt Crete fell to congratulating herself that she was as the angels in heaven, knowing nothing, by personal experience, of this most mysterious, troublous ordinance, marriage. Wayne had believed himself to be getting too old to cry, but once in his room, hot tears and fierce sobs had their way. So that was what his father had meant when he spoke to him about being brave. Certainly he did need courage to face such an awful trial. The bitterest drop in his cup was the feeling that his mother was forgotten. Somebody else was to come into that house and live in her room and use her things. And father was willing to have even mother's picture put out of his sight. He must have known about it, and bought that handsome new one to take its place. It was dreadful to be angry with father, but he was. The more the poor boy thought about it, the fiercer his anger burned. He recalled his father's words that morning. Was it only that morning? It seemed to him that he had heard the news weeks ago. Believe that your father thinks he is acting for the best good of all concerned. How could it be possible that this horrible thing about to happen could be for the good of anybody in that house? I won't stand it. I'll go away somewhere, he declared in frenzy as he got up and paced the floor after the manner of an excited man. 
I'll pack my trunk this minute and be off before they can get here. He rushed toward the hall door, intent upon bringing his trunk at once from the attic, but as he went something stopped him. It was what had often checked him before, his mother's eyes. When she was living, it had often needed but a look from her to set right his wayward spirit. It seemed to the boy that she beckoned him now to stop. He fancied he could hear her voice. "'Take care, mother's boy. Keep the reins steady. Don't let that temper of yours run away with you. Try to bear it patiently.' "'Oh, mother, mother!' he broke into a passionate cry. I can't, I can't, it will kill me. Oh, if I only could die. He meant it, this poor boy, just as much as we older ones, when with every nerve tense with anger or sorrow we wish ourselves dead. Yet as he looked into those eyes and longed for his mother's presence, his fierce mood insensibly softened. On the bureau near where he stood was a box where he treasured little keepsakes of his mother. As he opened it now and brought them out, tears rained over his face. There was a pair of light gloves that she had last worn, shaped to her hands. How well he remembered those hands, small and white and plump. A fine lace-edged handkerchief with a faint violet odor clinging to it, and a light blue satin ribbon that she used to wear around her neck. They brought vividly before him the fair, sweet mother with loving eyes. He had other mementos of her, costly ones, of gold and silver and precious stones, but none of them brought her warm, tender presence like those which the imaginative boy had secured for his own. When Aunt Crete came in search of her boy, he was lying on the lounge, asleep, and the hand which pillowed his cheek held his mother's handkerchief and gloves. "'Sleeping for sorrow,' Aunt Crete murmured, and she went out softly. In the library that evening the boy sat alone in the twilight, still engaged in puzzling his young brain over life and its mysteries. It was there that his aunt found him, and he began at once— "'Aunt Crete, I wish you would explain one thing to me. Why isn't it just as hard for father to put somebody else into mother's place as it is for me?' Aunt Crete was silent for a whole minute. The truth was, the same perplexing question had come to her, but she had dismissed it as belonging to the mysteries of that mystic sacrament, marriage, of which she could not be supposed to have knowledge.' how should she be able to explain to the boy? At last she said, My dear boy, don't you know there are a good many things that puzzle wiser heads than yours? When you get to be a great scientist, try to unravel some of these knotty points. Perhaps your father would say that the fact of his having been very happy with your mother was an excellent reason for marrying again because he missed such companionship and was unhappy and desolate without it. But he had us. Why wasn't that enough? Oh, Aunt Crete, you will always live here, won't you? He asked the question eagerly and hung upon her answer. Here was another hard spot. It seemed impossible to tell him that she must go away as soon as his father returned, but it had to be done. He bore it better than she had feared, the greater trouble having dulled his heart to all lesser ones. But he murmured desolately that he could never get on without her, and begged her to change her mind and stay. No, she said firmly, I shall not be expected to stay. This is not my home, you know. I only came because your father needed me, and he will not need me any more." "'Perhaps he will not need me any more, either,' said Wayne, with slow bitterness. "'I wish I could go away. I'll tell you what, Aunt Crete, I'll come and live with you. Why, we can have jolly times.' Boylike, for the moment he forgot his wretchedness, and his face lighted with a new hope. Aunt Crete's heart went out with great longing to the dear boy whose eyes looked so wistfully into hers.' 
she would have asked no greater joy in life than to have been able to take him to her heart and home but she must not feed him upon false hopes and her tone told nothing of her heart there are several reasons why we can't do that in the first place we shouldn't have anything to live on i haven't much in the world besides the old house and i live a long way from any good school but the chief reason is that your father would never consent to it he wants his boy with him does he if he cares for me why does he go and do something that i just hate and despise the passionate look that his aunt hated to see came into his face again she feared a stormy life for the sensitive highly organized temperament we were happy together continued wayne as happy as we could be without mother and now it is all spoiled a stranger coming in her place and you gone i shall get into all sorts of trouble i know i shall she'll want me to do things that i won't do and then there'll be trouble with father you don't seem to understand how hard it is going to be for me how little he guessed what depths of tenderness were hidden behind aunt crete's calm face and business-like ways neither could he see the tears on her cheeks for the twilight had deepened into darkness as they talked come and sit here by me she said presently i want to give you a little lecture i can do it better in the dark then if you look cross i shall not know it wayne when you were on the banks of the st lawrence last summer if you had seen a boy in a sailboat steering toward the rapids as fast as he could go and there was no one to warn him you would surely have shouted and signaled to him that he was in danger wouldn't you now i see whirlpools ahead of you and i'm going to warn you wayne dear one need not go over the rapids to wreck his life one of your dangers is selfishness you are forgetting that there is anybody but yourself to be made happy and you are angry with your father questioning his rights and even his love for you then you are conjuring up troubles that may never come and cultivating a wicked prejudice against one whom you have never seen she may turn out to be the best friend you have in the world there's one danger for you my boy that is at the bottom of all the others to find fault with what god lets come to you is to rebel against him he had some people long ago who rebelled and because of it they had to spend the best part of their lives in the wilderness there was no other way to bring them to their senses i do hope wayne that your life will not have to go by the way of the wilderness i'm in at this minute said wayne just as dark and ugly a piece of woods as can be found the relations between wayne and his mother had been peculiar being the only child he was much with her and in consequence grew wise beyond his years the fear of grieving her had been his strongest motive for good conduct he almost literally shared every thought with her and was always on the lookout to shield her from annoyance or danger it was months after her death before the boy could open his heart to his father there was an element of sternness in mr pearson's character wayne obeyed him because he both honored and feared him he had obeyed his mother because it was his delight to please her of late however a strong and tender bond had grown up between father and son mr pearson had made his son his companion in walks and drives and short journeys and there had come to the boy a proud sense of comradeship which had charmed him and now behold a stranger was to come between them as the time drew near when the bridal party might be looked for aunt creek grew nervous and excited she had not fully obeyed her brother's instructions there was something more to reveal to wayne something from which she shrank so it was not until the afternoon before the travellers were expected that she girded herself for another conflict wayne at the piano had played persistently for nearly an hour he had gone over all the tempestuous pieces in his repertoire 
his nervous excitement finding vent in the loudest pedal, then his mood suddenly changed, and he ran his fingers over the keys in improvised minor strains. Aunt Crete sat in a shaded corner and watched the back of his head. It was a beautiful head, covered with waves of light brown hair, yet she noticed that its pose was slightly proud and defiant, whereat she sighed. She sympathized with those dirge-like notes, yet how did she know, after all, but what that she had to tell might be received with joy? At last the piano was closed, and Wayne came over to her. "'I have been thinking,' she said, "'how nice it would be if you had another boy here to visit with.' "'Yes,' said Wayne, Two boys can have better times than one, if the other fellow is the right sort. "'If both fellows are of the right sort, you mean,' retorted Aunt Crete. "'I'm glad you would like it, because it looks now as if there would be two boys in this house instead of one.' "'What?' said Wayne. "'Aunt Crete, what do you mean?' "'Now it must be told,' and she hurried on. "'There is another boy, Wayne.' your mrs hamilton has a son somewhere near your own age and he will come here to live of course oh wayne i do hope you will be brothers indeed without any step between she spoke in a matter-of-fact tone as though it were an everyday occurrence to have stepbrothers suddenly let down into one's life wayne stood transfixed his eyes on aunt crete's face as if he had lost the power of speech before he recovered it, the doorbell rang, and guests were shown in. In the pine grove near the house was a shaded nook that Wayne claimed for his very own. To that retreat he rushed with his astounding piece of news like one pursued. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two He Meant to Be Good. To say that the Pearson home was in a state of expectancy is to put it mildly. The very chairs, as they stood in formal rows against the walls, told that something unusual was about to happen absolutely fleckless cleanliness and propriety were observable everywhere but if aunt crete had really tried to banish every suggestion of a home she could not have succeeded better she had done nothing of the kind poor woman but had made an earnest effort to accomplish her best albeit her heart felt like lead she was at this moment arrayed in her old-fashioned bristling black silk with a garniture made of lace and ribbon choked about her neck. It did not become her, and she had been heard to declare that she never felt at home in it. Possibly she had chosen it for the day on this very account. Certain it is that in her inmost heart she never expected to feel at home in that house again. She had taken her seat in the parlour, in the straightest-backed chair that the room contained, and without even knitting work to keep her company. This also was a concession to the supposed proprieties. She wanted to greet the new Mrs. Pearson in the most respectable manner possible. In vain did she try to pinion the son of the house at her side. As a rule, he was more than willing to stay with Aunt Crete, and liked nothing better than one of her grave, old-fashioned stories for entertainment but on this day he declared that he hated the parlour, and did not want to change his trousers, the ones he had on were good enough. He had worn them to the minister's house the night before, and he guessed the minister's folks were better than— But here the boy stopped, no names should be mentioned. It was true enough that he hated the parlour. If poor, kind-hearted, blundering Aunt Crete could have understood it, every nerve in the sensitive boy's body quivered with the pain of some cruel memory. In the parlour he could see nothing but his mother's coffin, as it had stood in solemn state, half buried in flowers. Could he stay in that room to meet her? 
but he knew instinctively that such ideas would shock Aunt Crete, therefore he kept them hidden. Every room in the house was more or less hateful to him on this day. They were all peopled with sorrowful ghosts of the past. When he had to go up and down stairs past his mother's room, he placed both trembling hands over his ears and rushed headlong as though followed by phantoms. His sick nerves almost made him believe that he heard behind that closed door his mother's voice. There were moments when he was sure of it, and that she was crying. Still, being the boy he was, Wayne controlled outward sign of these mental conditions, and looked only a little paler than usual, and ate somewhat less at the breakfast table, saving his appetite for the big dinner they were going to have, his well-intentioned and hopelessly blundering Aunt Crete suggested. After that, Wayne could not finish his glass of milk. He knew he should choke if he tried to swallow. Be it confessed right here and now that the chroniclers of this life are perfectly aware that they deal with a history that has been often told. The introduction of a new mother to a shattered home is certainly a very common affair. But so is death common, and love, and hate, and life itself for that matter. Yet so long as there are individual hearts to suffer, there will be individual experiences that will vary from that of other individuals, and that will deserve to be written, it may be, for purposes of study. Because, if by understanding human pain we can by any means lessen its volume, we are bound by the rule that guides all lives worth living to do so. That this experience might have been made almost infinitely less painful to Wayne Pearson can be easily demonstrated. Had the father, who had sacrificed much for him, and, studying his tastes, had succeeded to a remarkable degree in meeting them, taken up his own cross and gone frankly to the boy with the story of his needs, and by degrees, kindly and wisely as he knew how to do it, had accustomed his son to the thought of the new mother, though it might have been a pain, the loyal part of the boy's nature would have risen to stand by his father, and the utter abject misery that a young soul feels when deserted would have been spared him. To have been made his father's confidant would have gone far in itself toward reconciling a boy like Wayne that the father's love was weak, and had in it an element of selfishness, was distinctly shown by his shirking his duty in this regard, and putting off his cross on the shrinking shoulders of his maiden sister, who loved the boy Wayne as she did her life, and who had, all through the years, taken pains to hide that love under a mask of almost indifference. Oh, Wayne knew that his aunt liked him, and was good to him, and sacrificed something to make him comfortable, but that he was her one special and peculiar treasure, dearer to her than any other creature in the world, the boy never dreamed. A knowledge of this fact would have lessened his pain. People who do not understand human nature will wonder to hear that Aunt Crete had lain awake nights to plan just how she should divulge the great news to her boy. Yet could she have done it more bunglingly, had to bungle been her object? Pity those poor mortals who, with warm hearts and good intentions, have yet a genius for blundering. They are not few in number. Up in his own room, crouching down before the open great fire which burned for him because he liked open fires, his pale face paler than usual, save for one small bright spot that burned on either cheek, the poor fellow waited for his fate. Every other spot in the house had grown hateful beyond endurance, and he had broken away from Aunt Crete with the passionate announcement that he would not stay downstairs and wait for the carriage that was momently expected. He was all but breathless with wonderment as to what would happen next after that carriage arrived. Would his father come in search of him, and should he get his first kiss alone there in his room? If so, what should he say? Oh, what could he say to his father? I will try to be good, he murmured to the glowing coals. Oh, I will try. I don't want to hurt father as he has hurt me. 
mother wouldn't like that she said a boy should always think first of his father then he broke off to wonder further would they perhaps call him downstairs to meet them and would that other boy that awful boy be there aunt crete had fancied at times that the other boy would be a relief even a comfort to wayne it might have been so arranged one can fancy the father sitting some quiet evening in the firelight with his arm about his son telling him softly tenderly of another shadowed home of a boy near his own age whose father had gone away forever of a mother who was desolate like themselves because of a grave and of his saying by and by when all questions had been asked and answered and the boy's heart had grown tender over the loneliness of others some word like this what would you think my boy of our trying to brighten these two lives could not you be a brother to this lonesome fellow he had a brother once but he died are you willing to share your father with him if he will let us have a share of his mother wouldn't we all be happier and better able to do our work in the world if we planned this way of living it could have been done some such words as that would have made a difference forever in the life of the desolate lad who crouched before the fire and felt himself deserted and deceived if his father had but talked it over with him still poor fellow he meant to try to be good and he said to the coals presently that his father would surely come and find him and hold him tight for a minute and kiss him and he would say to him just that father i will try to be good and then the bell rang and there was the opening and closing of doors and the sound of trunks being banged up the steps and all the hum and bustle of arrival and the boy sat and waited strained his ears for the sound of his father's voice and of that other voice and held his breath and felt faint and giddy as he heard their steps ascending the stairs they were coming together then if his father would but come alone but they passed his door at the head of the stairs and went on into his father's room instinctively he glanced toward the communicating door although he knew that it was closed it nearly always stood wide open and wayne had been wont to look upon that room as belonging to him almost as much as it did to his father a dozen times during the process of dressing he ran into it to say a word to his father a dozen times that day he had closed the door and opened it again and closed it the final decision was that it should be closed some rare instinct of self-abnegation went with the decision since there were to be two in that room instead of one they would perhaps like it better closed he meant to be good he listened for his father's voice and heard it a cheery happy voice once he laughed wayne had always liked his father's laugh he did not understand poor fellow why it should strike like a blow on his heart just then certainly he wanted his father to be happy they went down again both of them wayne listened and listened he thought they would come in he could hear his own voice saying politely how do you do ma'am by way of greeting would that be the way to do it if one meant to be good but they went down the tension on his heart lessened a little his father would go with her to the foot of the stairs and come back alone in search of him he waited and waited and no one came if his father had but gone up to the boy that afternoon it might have made a difference with wayne's whole life's story was ever truer poet than he who recorded as the saddest words it might have been three quarters of an hour afterward came susie the second girl mr wayne she said your father wants to know where you are and why you are not downstairs he says you are to come to the parlor right away the parlor if they would only let him say how do you do ma'am in any other room than that he did not make a good impression well sir his father said where were you my boy i expected to get sight of you as soon as our carriage turned into the square 
and here we have been at home for nearly an hour. Actually his father had expected to see the boy come rushing around the corner to greet him. Why not? That was the way he had been doing of late, after ever so short an absence from home. On the boy's part, it seemed that his father must know that wherever he turned his tear-filled eyes in that room, they saw only an open coffin. All that the father saw was the trace of tears, and he did not like it. Augusta, he said, this is the boy. His voice sounded cold. It seemed quite as if they were planning to hire an errand boy. How do you do, my dear? said Mrs. Pearson, and she touched her lips to his pale cheek. She was tall and fair, and had blue eyes, and very light brown hair that was arranged in what the boy called crinkles. All that he said about his experience afterward was that she did not look in the least as he supposed that mothers always did. Her voice was pleasant, and she went on, talking about him. He looks pale, Edward, and rather frail. He is only a year younger than my Leon, and there is the greatest possible difference in their appearance. Not that he isn't tall enough, too tall for his years. We must try to broaden you out. I am afraid you do not take enough out-of-door exercise. Leon will remedy all that, though. He is a regular athlete. It was all very kindly said. She could not be expected to know how disagreeable it was to the boy. Hadn't he been told all his life that he was too fond of his books and too little inclined for out-of-door sports? Wasn't Aunt Crete always exclaiming anxiously over his thin chest? And didn't he almost despise athletes? Great rough fellows, he thought them, who were always behind in their studies. He had not a word to say to this new lady, and he remained silent and awkward. His father darted him an annoyed glance, which but sealed his lips the closer, and finally said coldly, Well, my son, if you have nothing to say, we will excuse you. But he followed the boy into the hall and spoke sternly. Wayne, this is by no means the sort of greeting that I had expected at your hands. I thought I could trust you, and believed that you would honor your father. I want you to understand that I shall expect you to show a very different face to your mother the next time she sees you. If you cannot control yourself tonight, you would better not come to dinner until after we are done. Wayne turned without a word and began to mount the stairs. His father looked after him with a yearning heart and a heavy sigh. The boy was actually stubborn and meant to fight. He had not dreamed of such a condition of things. Wayne had always been such a gentlemanly boy. The door into the dining room had stood open, and Aunt Crete had been a forced listener to this little scene. She appeared in the hall now and did not mend matters. Her face was red and her voice like an icicle. If I had been you, Edward, I would have choked myself before I spoke in that way to Wayne. The poor child's heart is almost broken. I am not aware that he has cause for excessive grief, answered the master of the house coldly, and I look to you, Lucretia, not to uphold him in rebellion. I have done what I believe is for the best good of all concerned, and my son must understand that I am not accountable to him for my actions. I uphold said Aunt Crete. The land knows I... Then she stopped. Nobody had seen Aunt Crete cry for years, but just then she distinctly felt a lump in her throat that she knew was as large as a hen's egg, and was certain that she could not trust her voice with another word. Mr. Pearson turned and went back into the parlor, and perhaps he may be pardoned if he gave the door a more determined push in closing than there was need. The unreasonable man was disappointed in his homecoming. Never was there a more forlorn and utterly vanquished fighter than that poor fellow who threw himself on his bed in an agony of weeping. He did not go downstairs for any dinner. He was sure that a mouthful would have choked him. Aunt Crete came herself with turkey and cranberry and all manner of dainties and coaxed, 
but he only shook his head and murmured in muffled tones, "'Aunt Crete, I would if I could, but I can't.' "'Poor little fellow,' said Aunt Crete, "'it is too everlasting mean.' But she made no attempt to speak the words she might have said. Her heart had been much ruffled by her brother's stern condemnatory words." Late that night, a small brown head raised itself from its pillow that was all but wet through with tears, and listened eagerly. Its owner heard his father's step moving about the next room, and his father's voice. He listened, breathless, as the steps moved toward that closed door. His father would come in and kiss him good night. He always did, no matter how late home he was. Then he would put his arms around his neck and whisper in the darkness that he meant to be good, and had meant so all the time, only the words would not come. And the father, the other side the wall, stood still and considered. Should he go in to see Wayne? No, he believed not. The boy might still be obstinate, and he might say something in his annoyance that he would wish unsaid he would wait until morning and give the youngster a chance to be reasonable. So, for the first time in his life, when his father was at home, Wayne Pearson received no good-night kiss from him. If he had, many things might have been different. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three If Only. When Wayne got downstairs the next morning, he was relieved to find that his father, having an important business engagement, had taken the first train to town, and that his stepmother, fatigued with her journey, had not yet risen. Aunt Crete, too, was gone. She had bidden him good-bye the night before, although he had secretly determined to surprise her by being at the station, but he did not waken in time. It was a doleful breakfast he took by himself, smarting the while, under the sense of his father's displeasure, and forlornly desolate without Aunt Crete. It began to seem to him that he had no friend left in that house except Anne, the cook who had lived in the family ever since he could remember, and who came now with cheery words and a plate of muffins. In momentary dread of that stranger's appearance, he made short work of breakfast and hurried off to school. Mrs. Pearson was more than pleased with her new home when she stepped out on the broad porch and gazed about her that morning. She was charmed. The house was substantial and roomy, standing on an eminence which commanded fine views in all directions. If the style of architecture was somewhat old-fashioned, it was atoned for by grand old trees and spacious grounds stretching and sloping to the shore of a wide river, which went placidly on its way to the nearby sea, so near that this morning its blue expanse seemed in the vista between the trees, but a piece of the sky reaching down to meet the earth. It was early springtime, when the willows were just beginning to show tender green against dark pines. The blue and green and brown and purplish tints mingled in a soft haze as if nature had but sketched into the landscape a few more hints of what the summer glory might be. Mrs. Pearson took in all the delightful possibilities of the place, feeling that sense of elation which is born of possession. She walked up and down the long porch, exulting in the pure air, contrasting it all with the life she had lived for the last several years in a crowded city, with limited space and limited means. How wonderful that she should suddenly have come into this fair heritage! And stranger still, that the love of a noble man should have come into her lonely life, and that her boy should have again a good father, who would care for his well-being as if he were his very own. He had promised it, and she trusted him absolutely. The newcomer found it pleasant to go on this little tour of exploration about her husband's home, 
quite alone, tarrying where she pleased, to look or muse. She passed on into the parlor and library, large, pleasant rooms full of windows commanding charming views. She studied the furnishings. Her taste was fastidious, and another woman's individuality was expressed there, a woman whom, in spite of herself, she regarded as a sort of rival. It would be natural to find fault with her work, but there was no fault, and it half nettled the new woman to think it should be so. She sank into a luxurious chair, and the mirror opposite told her that her lilac morning gown trimmed with soft lace was extremely becoming, and that she fitted well into her surroundings. Again she congratulated herself, while her heart brimmed over in pride and gratitude. And yet, with all this affluence and satisfaction, there was an undeniable fly in the ointment. There usually is. The remembrance of it came now with a pang to Mrs. Pearson. That boy, her husband's son! There came also a sharp reminder of the altogether kind and fatherly way in which her husband had taken her son to his heart. It made her wince, yet she hastened to apologize for herself after this manner. That is a very different matter. My dear handsome boy wins everybody at once. But this cold, silent fellow, actually assuming haughty airs. Who could love him? Oh, why did he have to be here to make unpleasantness? But it startled her to find such thoughts trying to get possession. She resolutely shook them off for the time, and continued her survey of the house. The upper rooms were delightful. It was as if a kind and thoughtful friend had selected carpets, draperies, and paper hangings, with special regard to the taste of one who was coming there a stranger. She lingered in the exquisitely appointed guest chamber, but unwelcome thoughts came to her how that other wife had been busy and happy planning and arranging it for her. She went from it to Wayne's room, and found there the same careful attention to every detail of grace and beauty. Still, it is better suited to a girl than a boy, was Mrs. Pearson's mental comment, and that is one trouble with that boy he has been spoiled. One can see that he has been taught to consider himself of utmost importance. The object that caught and held her attention, however, was the portrait of Wayne's mother. It impressed her at once as a face of marvelous sweetness and purity. The lovely eyes looked directly into hers with a searching gaze. Did they say, "'You have taken my place in this home,' Will you be a true mother to my boy? The better nature of this woman stood in reverence before that other woman whose place on earth she had taken. There came to her a sense of unworth and insufficiency. It would not be easy to fill this office which she had dared accept. It would require her best. Still, she would try. She would do her duty by her husband's son so far as in her lay. Yet, even with the resolve, came a sigh of deep regret that there was such a person in existence, and there swept over her an unreasoning wave of jealousy and dislike, not only for the boy, but for that pictured face. So began the struggles of a life that had the promise of unalloyed happiness. Mrs. Pearson made haste away from the searching eyes, and turned her thoughts to more agreeable subjects. Her son Leon, her idol, was coming that very day. There were little motherly touches to be put to the lovely room set apart for him. How delighted he would be with this beautiful home! If only— And again the mother sighed as she thought of that other boy, and of what she had been promising— a shadow fell across her spirit as it occurred to her for the first time that the boys might take a dislike to each other, and endless quarrels result. In such a case, one of them would have to be sent away to boarding school, and Mrs. Pearson knew well which should go if the question were left to her to settle. Ella Fallett was the name of Wayne's pony. A farmer back on the hills, 
with whom the family had boarded one summer, had presented him to Wayne on the boy's eighth birthday a promising young colt. In a transport of gratitude, Wayne had forthwith called his little horse Ella Fallet after the donor. The formidable name soon shortened to Liff, and they grew up together. The gentle creature seemed to know almost as much, Wayne thought, as another boy. He developed into a beautiful animal, with shining coat and silky mane. He was fleet and spirited, yet perfectly obedient to his master's voice. Wayne, who never tired of skimming over the country on Liff's back, no sooner returned from school that afternoon than he set out for a long ride. He omitted going first into the house to be welcomed. There was no Aunt Crete waiting for him, and his intuitions told him that his stepmother was no more desirous of his presence than he was of hers. The ride lengthened itself. The boy wished that he could stretch it out indefinitely could ride on and on beyond that glory in the western sky to some other where and so escape the homecoming that he dreaded at last however he trotted up the driveway in time to see his father and a boy a little taller than himself alight from the carriage at the door the other boy had come wing would have gone on to the stable but his father as he went into the house by a motion of his hand and a look, said that he was to stay and be introduced to the newcomer. Mrs. Pearson had descended the steps and stood with outstretched arms to welcome her boy. While she held him close, showering kisses, Wayne felt a thrill go through him. So had his mother welcomed him. Would ever anybody do it again like that? Aunt Crete loved him, but it was not her way to show it by caresses. His stepmother rose several degrees in his estimation. He felt almost sorry for her when her boy broke impatiently away, exclaiming, "'Oh, there now, hold up! Don't lather a fel—' "'Leon!' His mother's voice was sharp and imperative. Slang was her abhorrence, as Leon well knew, so he hastened to atone. For, fond as his mother was of him, she could treat him to hours of silent coldness when displeased. Throwing an arm about her, he said with that smile which always disarmed her, "'Why, you make as much fuss, mother as if I had been gone three years instead of three weeks.' Then, catching sight of Wayne, who had dismounted and stood holding his horse, he called out, "'Hello, who's this? Oh, that's the little popinjay you wrote me about, is it?' Wayne had advanced a step or two, and was about to extend his hand, but drew it back when he heard this rude salutation, his cheeks flushing with resentment. "'Ah, quite a pretty boy,' Leon went on in a mincing tone. "'He's bashful, isn't he? What's your name, dear?' He came nearer as he spoke, and gave Liff a poke in the ribs which made him rear. "'Shame on you, Leon!' his mother exclaimed, suppressing a smile. "'You are becoming perfectly lawless!' Leon had a silent ambition to be thought so. One of his mother's friends went about saying rude things to people in a serio-comic way, making everybody laugh, and the boy admired it. Wayne wheeled his horse sharply about and went rapidly toward the stable without having spoken a word to his stepbrother, who sent a derisive laugh after him. Once in the stable, with the door fastened, Wayne fairly ground his teeth in rage. That impudent, hateful, horrid boy! To insult him in the very beginning! In his own home, too! His heart swelled in bitterness against his father. It was not enough to put another in his dear mother's place, but there must be that hideous fellow to make life miserable for him. The thought of his coming into that house to stay was perfectly intolerable. The boy had been trying for the last twenty-four hours to become reconciled to the thought of another boy coming there to claim father as his father, and having a right to everything about the place. There had been brief minutes during this time when he tried to assure himself 
that it would be pleasant to have a nice boy there and have good times together. He had almost persuaded himself into that belief when the dream of pleasant companionship was rudely dispelled. The moment he caught sight of Leon's bold black eyes and something like a leer on his otherwise handsome face, his heart sank like lead. Mr. Pearson, through a half-closed blind, watched with eager curiosity the meeting between the two boys. He was too far off to hear any words, but he saw that one boy with smiling face appeared to be making advances which the other met with silence and dark looks, even turning abruptly away in the midst of it. The father was vexed and disappointed, and the son was now in no mood to seek the reconciliation for which he had longed. This was a beginning which did not promise well for pleasant relations between the boys, and no one who had taken pains to study their different temperaments and training would have hoped for it. It was well that Aunt Crete was not present in those first few weeks of the new family, or there might have been an open rupture. As it was, there were no keen eyes to look on and judge, and it may be glow with anger. Mr. Pearson was as blind as most men who have married a wife. The halo about her was as yet undimmed. Everything connected with her was sacred, even the young scapegrace who was all deference and reverence in his stepfather's presence, but in his absence mimicked his grave dignity and laughed to scorn his words of advice. Mr. Pearson had resolved, in the beginning of his infatuation for Mrs. Hamilton, that he would take her son into his heart as well, and it would not be difficult, bright merry fellow that he was. When one is disposed to be blind and deaf to faults in another, the way is open for genuine liking. Mr. Pearson had ambitions too. The world should for once see a family who, maintaining that relation to each other which is supposed to be peculiarly productive of strife, were nevertheless beautifully harmonious. He was prepared to exercise patient forbearance toward his stepson, and surely his wife would love his sweet-spirited boy. But he had apparently misjudged. Here was his submissive son taking on a rebellious attitude, a boy remarkable for loveliness of character suddenly become unlovely. He could not understand it, this lawyer who was rated by his fellows as a man of keen perceptions. He did not know that there was quietly carried on in his own house a series of cunning devices for tormenting and humiliating his own son. Jokes, the inquisitors called them. His own amusement was one reason why Leon never lost an opportunity to annoy Wayne, at least that was the one he gave to his mother, who sometimes reproved him, though with a smile lurking behind the words. She herself was coldly kind to Wayne, and such kindness, when long endured, is little better than a series of blows. There was a deeper reason than love of fun, though, which was the secret of Leon's actions, and that was jealousy. One source of pique was Wayne's musical gifts, cultivated by able instructors and much practice. When he played for guests, it was gall and wormwood to Leon to hear praises showered upon the performer. He did what he could to embarrass Wayne at such times, usually managing to sit near the piano and keep up an undertone of talk, teasing and mocking until the victim was perfectly furious. The auditors sometimes called the music spirited when Wayne, with a frown on his brow, pounding the keys with vim, longed instead to let his force fly at the exasperating fellow who stood smiling by his side, officiously turning the leaves in a way to cause blunders if possible. Once the young musician was adroitly tripped up on his way to the piano, and nobody but the victim knew how it came about that a boy sprawled on the floor, his music scattered about him to his own and his father's intense mortification, while his amiable stepbrother flew to his assistance. There were other indignities too numerous to mention, and it must not be supposed that Wayne bore them in silence. 
he had been carefully taught that resort to blows in the settlement of difficulties was brutal it was not possible though to refrain from pouring out his indignation in a torrent of words met by jeers and rude laughter which often misled the parents into thinking that the boys were making merry instead of quarrelling and through it all wayne had no sympathy from his blinded father it was strange how often the boy appeared at a disadvantage contrasted with leon's bright ways he seemed dull and sullen and it was charged to chronic rebellion we are severest on the faults of those we love most just because we love them and long to have them blameless and why did not wayne tell his father all and claim his protection partly because he had the usual schoolboy code of honor which condemns one who reports the evil doings of another boy there was another reason once in a desperate fit he had broken out with an account of some outrageous prank of leon's when his father silenced him with my son i am astonished have you no more manliness than to come to me with complaints you must learn to take fun as it is meant and like other boys who know how to take care of themselves those words cut the nerves of the sensitive boy like a knife never again would he complain to his father he went away by himself and there followed one of those conflicts which change children into men and women oh the pity that it should begin so early end of chapter three chapter four of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a crisis they were father and son even a careless observer would have known that as wayne pearson had grown to manhood certain marked characteristics of his father's face had repeated themselves in a pronounced way in his it is a question whether the very similarity of their natures did not help to make it more difficult for them to understand each other the merest glance into the room at this time would have shown that disturbing forces were at work the father's tones were as cold as ice i sent for you wayne not to have a lengthy conversation but to speak certain very plain words i am simply weary of this sort of life and feel that i have endured it perhaps too long it is of no use to hide the fact that you are a sad disappointment to me instead of improving under the most patient treatment possible matters seem to be growing worse every report that comes to me shows an advance in i hesitate to pronounce the words but sullenness and vindictiveness seem to have become characteristics of yours i am afraid that the mother whose memory you have professed to love would not recognize her son if she were with him now i can only hope that she at least is spared the pain you have given me but i did not intend to say this it has all been said before and proved useless my words this time shall be to the point i have reached a decision either you will apologize to leon for this latest insult and in my presence that i may see and hear for myself or he paused involuntarily as his son turned from the window and confronted him the young man's face certainly offered no encouragement to him to proceed well sir wayne said at last or what or consider yourself no longer a college student at my expense with every want even anticipated i choose to bestow my money upon a son who at least tries to show me that he appreciates my help wayne's heretofore pale face flushed so deep a crimson that it almost seemed as though the blood must burst through the sensitive skin his lips were quivering but he was biting them to prevent it and his eyes flashed ominously as he threw back his head with a gesture that was peculiarly irritating to his father perhaps because it was his own and said i shall certainly offer no apology to leon hamilton sir very well then take the consequences consider yourself excused 
in your present mood i have seen quite enough of you as he spoke mr pearson wheeled away from his desk but wayne did not wait for him to rise without further word or glance he rushed from the room out into the side yard down the lane and so by a path well known to his childhood which led him presently to a lonely place along the beach so dreary looking and unattractive to others that they rarely visited it but the boy wayne had fought out many of his childish battles just there and by a sort of instinct he turned to it again in his young manhood now that another crisis in his life seemed to have been reached nearly six years since he began to tramp there as a child and tell to the restless waves the story of his humiliations at the hand of his stepbrother but never had the passionate heart of the boy been so stirred as now when on the verge of manhood he paced the sanded shore and added yet another chapter since the first hour that he came he has done his utmost to rob me of my father and my home and this is the climax he has succeeded i am not only worse than motherless but my father has deliberately thrown me off and taken in my place this usurper who has hated and bullied me through the years and been upheld always by his mother i apologize to leon hamilton my father will find that i will follow my dead mother to the grave rather than that he is weary of this sort of life who isn't he has borne enough he thinks he will find that i have the crisis has come at last i knew it would he could not think connectedly he could not give even the waves that came constantly up to hear about it a lucid account of how the climax had been reached he could only tramp about like some wounded creature of the forest and utter at intervals half sentences that merely hinted at the fires of passion and of pain that were burning within him apparently a climax had at last been reached and the way to it had been long and hard one curious fact was that it had been hard for most of the parties concerned and not one of them had been able to imagine to any extent the other's pain there for instance was mrs pearson it will be remembered that she entered this home with a resolve in her heart to do her duty in full measure and it shall be frankly admitted that at times she had earnestly tried to do it she had brought with her a sincere affection for the head of the house and a real desire to make a home for him but she had also brought one consuming unreasoning passion she had an idol and its name was leon for this son of hers no sacrifice was too great despite the affection which she certainly had for her husband she would never have become his wife had it not been plain to her that for leon to secure a father who was an eminent lawyer would be much better for him than to remain only the son of a quiet widow who had but a few hundreds a year of her own and no influence in the great world she would not have liked to own that she married her husband for the sake of her son yet if she had understood her own heart that might not have been too bald a way to put it plainly she did not understand her heart very well nor begin to realize how hard it would be to open it to the son as well as the father yet as has been said she had tried neither was she inclined to be hard upon herself for her evident failure could she be blamed for taking her own boy's part who should stand by him if not his mother then when one boy was good-natured and merry and fun-loving and the other was silent and cold and sullen could any one be blamed for seeing just where the fault lay on those rare occasions when even she was compelled to see faults in her own son she excused herself for shielding him on the plea that the poor boy had no father and that she must be both mother and father to him as for mr pearson it would not be fair to him to say that in planning his second marriage he had forgotten his son on the contrary he had thought much about him and had convinced himself that the step he was about to take 
would be in every way an advantage to the boy. But this was not until he had yielded himself so entirely to Mrs. Hamilton's influence as to feel sure that he wanted her and her only for his own life. If the woman of his choice had chosen him for a like motive, it would have been better for the son, because there is no genuine love for a man that does not to a degree include his child. Mr. Pearson had come into the new relations, not only with a determination to do his duty by the boy Leon, but with a yearning affection for him because he was his mother's son, and a real desire to take the place as well as the name of father. What an infinite pity that in all his plans and hopes he failed to take his own boy into partnership! To go over the story of the years already passed since the new relations began would fill volumes, and would simply be history repeating itself. For the most part it was a record of failure. Given such incongruous elements in a home, none of the persons concerned understanding the other's heart or motive, and at least one of them not caring to understand, what other record could be made? Wayne, it will be remembered, had meant to be good. He had carried that idea in his heart and struggled with it spasmodically. Had the new brother given him half a chance, he would perhaps have come off victor but it will have to be admitted that Leon Hamilton was inherently selfish and tyrannical. His nature throughout was hard. Not that he had not occasional good impulses, and there was a sense in which he loved his mother, but he loved not her, nor anybody, nor anything, half so well as he loved himself. This inherent trait had been fostered by his mother until he was honest in the belief that the world had been created for his enjoyment, and that whatever hindered that enjoyment must be pushed or kicked out of the way. They had struggled up through the years, until now Leon was in a few months of his majority, and Wayne was just twenty. The two young men were in college together in a town but a few miles from home. That is, they were classmates, but they by this time so thoroughly disliked each other that they came in contact only when necessity compelled. It had been arranged early in their college course that Saturdays and Sundays should be spent at home, but on one pretext or another this plan often failed, one or the other remaining in town. When Wayne came out alone, Mrs. Pearson was so disturbed and so full of anxious surmises, as well as of hints that were disagreeable to her stepson, that life for the three was not comfortable. But when Leon came, reporting gaily that Wayne was all right, but had chosen to go off on a lark of his own, it would have made the absent one's sore heart sorer to have known what a thoroughly good time they had without him. In a curious sense the two men were rivals in class. Wayne was by nature a student. He worked thoroughly, and commanded the respect of his classmates as well as of the faculty. Leon, on the contrary, lived for what he called fun, but he had a good memory, and was quick-witted and unscrupulous. He could spend half the night in his chosen amusements, then borrow the notes of a careless student, make free translations therefrom, on his cuffs, or any convenient surface that could be easily concealed, snatch at a few lines of the text, put on a bold face, and come off sometimes with flying colors. Occasionally Wayne would be so enraged by the success of these barefaced maneuverings, as to lose his presence of mind, and make a poorer recitation than his rival. Such an episode was sure to be followed by an extraordinary account of the affair at home, always given laughingly, and with such an appearance of high good humor on Leon's part, that Wayne's contrasting indignation was very marked. Sometimes a word of caution would be called forth from the mother after this manner. "'Leon, dear, what a sad tease you are! It really isn't even college manners, I should think,' to be hilarious over the misfortunes of those who do not happen to be as quick at their studies as you are. 
she meant it for good and it sounded well to the father what could it be but an unfortunate spirit of jealousy that caused the blood to rush violently to wayne's face at the sound of the words there were times when he darted a look at leon that his mother said afterward was positively suggestive of danger it is not the intention of these historians to linger over the boyhood of those two whose lives were so unfortunately linked it has been thought wise to give to our readers these glimpses of the beginnings and to hint at certain of the stumbling blocks that might before they grew large have been easily taken out of the way and then to go on to the account of the life journey as it led through devious paths and often by the way of a wilderness up to what we call the end it is hoped that the reasons for making the record will be made plain as the reader progresses but the evening before that interview between wayne pearson and his father with which this chapter opens wayne had been hard at work in his room at college an important recitation the closing one indeed for the college year had been scheduled for the next morning and wayne who believed that he stood a fair chance for the honors was making a last careful preparation when he was interrupted a response to the tap at his door admitted a senior with whom he had a slight acquaintance who began without ceremony pearson do you know where hamilton is this evening i have not that honor said wayne i rarely have well this time i happen to know and he is in a bad place there is another row at riders poor little nixon escaped from there a few minutes ago and came to me with the story he says hamilton is the worst one there he doesn't know what he is about you understand and i am afraid he will get into very serious trouble the authorities are especially on the watch for Ryder's place just now, you remember. It won't mean less than expulsion for everyone who is found there. So I thought perhaps, excuse me, I don't want to be officious, but Hamilton is a relative of yours, isn't he? No, said Wayne, with unnecessary emphasis. He is my father's stepson. Oh, well, I thought you might like to save your father's name, you understand something could be done before the discovery comes but not afterward i am afraid i chanced to learn what the outcome would be though well no matter who i won't interrupt you longer good night then wayne dropped his book and leaned his elbows on the table and his head in his hands and thought expulsion disgrace dishonor were these not what leon hamilton deserved was there a greater cheat or a more worthless rogue within those college walls than he was not his influence among those younger and weaker than himself wholly bad yet who knew it heretofore the fellow had been sharp enough to escape all publicity and to maintain a sort of reputation for scholarship even ought he to be helped to continue his duplicity but on the other hand it was his father his own splendid father whose name and reputation were hopelessly linked with this young scamps it was his father who paid the college bills and to whom all reports were sent he seemed to see the whole story of the disgraceful scene at riders blazing in the next day's papers with his father's name put in bold type we understand that young hamilton the principal actor in the scene is the stepson of the eminent lawyer edward w pearson esq and then would follow sentences that would drag their family affairs before the public and make his father's face burn with shame it must not be he must try to shield his father even though in doing so he should have to help that villain half an hour afterward a detective in citizen's dress made his way through the confusion that reigned at a questionable place known as riders and tried to make plain to the bewildered brain of the chief rioter that a gentleman in a carriage at the door wished to speak to him it ended in the detectives calling two policemen to his aid and even then it was with difficulty that hamilton was conveyed to the carriage once within however 
he sank almost immediately into a drunken stupor, and when they reached the college, Wayne and the detective had but little difficulty in getting the fellow to his room and bed. Then Wayne locked the door upon him and went to his own room. In the morning, finding the young reveller still sleeping heavily, he again locked the door and went to breakfast and to his recitation. It was two hours before he came back to find the lock broken and his prisoner escaped. Later in the day he learned that Hamilton had taken the eleven o'clock train for home. Meantime, the threatened disclosures concerning Ryder's house had taken place later in the evening, and the papers, as Wayne had foreseen, were ablaze with details. A shiver of relief ran through his frame as he glanced them over, and found no mention of the family name. Once more, Hamilton had escaped. The whole affair gloomed the day that would else have been bright for him. The coveted honors had been won, and he was taking home the newspaper account of prizes, with his name at the head. But he was taking also a heavy heart. The time had come when he must certainly break the silence that he had carefully maintained ever since his father had, years before, charged him with being jealous of his stepson, and forbidden him to come with tales of him. This time disgrace had been too imminent, and his father's name had been shielded at too great a price. The son must choke down his pride, and let the truth be known now once for all. It happened, however, that he reached home by an earlier train than his father, and it was Mrs. Pearson who met him, white with anger, to ask how he dared to follow a fatherless boy to his retreat after having publicly insulted him and stolen his honors from him. It became evident that young Hamilton had not taken an early train for naught. By dint of careful listening, and a quietly put question now and then, Wayne learned that he was supposed to have drugged his stepbrother the night before, and then to have locked him into the room, from which he had escaped with difficulty, the motive being to keep Hamilton away from that important recitation, and so win for himself the honors that but for this would undoubtedly have been his stepbrothers. Wayne was simply dumbfounded over this state of affairs. Well as he thought he knew Leon Hamilton, he had expected to find him, this time, somewhat subdued and anxious to buy silence. Behold, instead, he had made Wayne's duty well nigh impossible. Before he had determined just how to try to meet this new state of things, Wayne was summoned to an interview with his father, and the father, who had just come from an exciting talk with his wife and Leon, without asking a word of explanation from his son or permitting a suggestion that there might be another side to the story he had heard, had addressed him in the way that has already been told, and then dismissed him from his presence. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Apologies. After pacing the beach until he was worn out, Wayne turned his steps toward his green sanctum in the pine woods as by natural gravitation. It had been the scene of many a boyish mental conflict and somehow the spot had a calming influence. Perhaps the resinous fragrance is soothing to sick spirits as well as to diseased lungs. He sat down on a knoll, leaned his head on his hands, and tried to look the future in the face. His father had again condemned him unheard on the testimony of one to whose faults he was still blind and deaf he must now begin to plan his life without reference to his father's aid. While he nodded his brows in perplexed thought, he became aware that a familiar form was approaching, and he sprang up in glad surprise to welcome Aunt Crete. "'Nobody in the house could tell me where you were,' she said, as he bent and kissed her as of old. 
i thought though i should find you here in your old haunts and when i came up the hill wayne it looked a little as if you had come out here to settle affairs with somebody or something just as you used to then the aunt looked him over with those keen kind eyes of hers a long scrutinizing gaze wondering if the last two years of college life in which she had not seen him had made or marred but she was satisfied with the lines of the pure mouth and the clear eyes which met hers unfalteringly well begin aunt crete said briskly taking a seat on a cushion of pine needles tell me all about yourself quick for i have not long to stay i am on my way to uncle daniel's to spend the rest of the summer and shall take the night express from here so go on aunt crete do you remember the sunset on the river through that opening in the pines look at it now isn't it glorious yes it is but i have not time to talk about sunsets what about yourself you need not try to turn me off on another track you are not happy wayne i can see it in your eyes better talk of sunsets or anything rather than my miserable affairs the young man said gloomily why rehearse them when we have but a little time together it will only make you unhappy but aunt crete was not to be put off she questioned and cross-questioned until she knew the whole putting together what he told and did not tell and why in the world have you not told your father all this long ago because he long ago refused to listen to any complaints and i resolved never to trouble him again on the subject that fellow represents to father that i am jealous of him he tells all sorts of lies about me which are believed because i will not condescend to plead with my father to have as much faith in his own son as he has in a stepson he shall know the truth aunt crete said resolutely i'll go and tell him myself this minute the idea of his suspecting you of such things don't you do it aunt crete he would despise me if he thought i got you to interfere it would be of no use either he is as completely under the influence of that woman and her son as if he were hypnotized when i'm not in a rage i'm sorry for father he has to walk on just such a line because tears and hysterics are a terror to him when i discovered that leon was drinking and running into debt i thought i ought to tell father for his own sake but that villain had got his ear first and trumped up a lie about me as he always does and father believed it as he always does now he must take the consequences i shall not tell him the injustice of his treatment of me is outrageous the trouble from the very first said aunt crete sadly has been that miserable pearson pride you allowed your father to get wrong impressions and were silent because you were too proud to explain when you should have defended yourself i must maintain my self-respect wayne said with his head held high aunt crete sighed and was silent at last she spoke half hesitatingly wayne it is sad enough to have you on bad terms with your father but there is something that troubles me more than that you said you hated leon yes i said so and i do it's the naked truth and i cannot deny it he that hateth his brother is a murderer quoted aunt crete solemnly if you knew all that i have suffered from that torment you would not wonder that i have lost patience he is perfectly satanic he has made my life miserable i have envied the merest clodhopper who had a happy home don't preach forbearance to me i've got beyond that but a christian cannot cherish hate i am not a christian aunt creed what made you think i was i thought so because once upon a time a certain dear boy declared his purpose to love and serve his lord that boy was lost long ago turned into a wretched prematurely grown-up creature but don't let's talk of that any more time is going and i must talk to you about my plans you know i am cast off now 
Father said I might consider his aid at an end unless I apologize to Leon. I shall go away from here forever. I am tired of this anyway. Don't think of such a thing, Aunt Crete said with energy. The idea of your going away and leaving everything to that rascal. Have a talk with your father and make him understand. He is hasty, I know, and he is in a trying position. But I am sure that he didn't really mean what he said. Don't cut loose from your father. Finish your college course at least. Then your way will be clearer. You can come and live with me then as long as you like in the old homestead. I'll provide the home, and you can provide the bread and butter. Aunt Crete felt at ease about Wayne's future, because his mother's not small fortune had been willed to her boy. But, by her request, the boy himself was to be kept in ignorance of it until he became of age. Before Aunt Crete continued her journey that evening, she secured a promise from Wayne that he would have an explanation with his father that very night. Accordingly, when he returned from accompanying his aunt to the station, he went to the library to fulfill his promise. His father was not there, and there seemed to be an unusual bustle and stir in the house. Jonas presently drove the carriage to the door, and soon his father came downstairs, traveling bag in hand, and hurriedly explained that he had been summoned to a distant city on important business. As he bade Wayne good-bye, he left in his hand a note. Wayne hurried with it to the library, and read as follows. Dear Wayne, I am compelled to be absent from home for several days at least. Perhaps I have taken the pranks of college boys too seriously, and been unnecessarily harsh with you. So consider, if you please, those last words of mine unsaid. It is true, I am distressed that your manhood has not yet overcome and cast out that strange spirit of jealousy that seemed to take possession of you on Leon's first coming to us. It seems to me that he has shown much forbearance. Do try to have things different between you. His generous nature will overlook everything, I am sure. My life out in the world is extremely harassing. If I might enjoy peace and quiet in my home, it would be an immense relief. Father. If Wayne had been humiliated and angry before, he was furious now. What had not that smooth-tongued enemy of his accomplished? It was just as Aunt Crete had said. He had himself been foolishly silent. Now, indeed, his father should know the truth, if he could possibly get it before him, and he would not go away. He would stay and assert his rights. He did not know how soon an opportunity would offer. It was growing late, but still he paced the floor, absorbed in bitter thoughts. Suddenly he was aware of another presence in the room. His stepmother, clad in a white wrapper, stood, ghost-like, in the doorway. "'Wayne,' she began haughtily, "'what is the meaning of this? Do you know that it is almost twelve o'clock?' "'Well, and what of that?' he asked. "'Are you not aware that the house should be closed by this time?' She began closing and fastening windows as she spoke. "'Excuse me, but I'm not ready to leave this room yet,' Wayne answered. When I am, I will attend to the locks. Mrs. Pearson looked at the tall young man before her, and swiftly took in the fact that he was actually no longer a boy. But she was not to be cowed by him. She drew herself up with dignity, and said, I think you forget that I am the mistress of this house, and close it when I please. And I think that you forget that I am the grown son of the master of this house, and as such have a few rights worthy of respect. Notwithstanding the masterful air, Mrs. Pearson walked toward the lights as if to turn them out, saying, It's all nonsense for young people to sit up late, and I don't intend to keep my house open and ablaze with light at this hour, inviting the notice of burglars. Wayne laughed scornfully. The idea of burglars in that quiet spot where he had spent his life was preposterous. 
he too came and stood under the chandelier, and there was a silent conflict between the two as they looked into each other's faces. And I do not intend to be turned out of the library and sent to bed as if I were ten instead of twenty at the command of one who came into this family several years later than I did. Wayne's eyes glowed with excitement as he spoke. His stepmother had the advantage of him, for she remained cool outwardly. She was, in fact, speechless with surprise for a moment. Her stepson had been haughty and cold, but never before had he blazed out like this. Indeed, she said presently, you must make your conduct match your age then. Men, that is, gentlemen, are courteous to women. I shall not condescend to quarrel with you, but be assured that your father shall hear of this disrespect to me. Whereupon Mrs. Pearson walked majestically out. In her room, and preparing for rest, she called herself a fool that she had managed so miserably. The boy who had suddenly turned into a man, and become her enemy, she might years ago have charmed to her allegiance, even as she did the father. Wayne Pearson did not sleep well that night. Added to all his other troubles, he had himself to reckon with. At his own tribunal he had been tried and convicted. His stepmother's words held a sting. His standard of what was due from man to woman was extremely high, even chivalric, and it covered him with shame to realize that he had transgressed a law which he particularly prided himself upon observing. He had treated a woman, his father's wife, with discourtesy. There was just one thing to be done. He must apologize. Oh, the misery of going through this ordeal with that icicle of a woman! But there was no other way out. It was no fear of consequences which made him thus decide. He simply could not respect himself and do otherwise. The next morning he was up early, going about restlessly, waiting for an opportunity to speak to his stepmother. He wanted it over with, but there were guests in the house, and it was not easy to find her alone. However, after breakfast she happened out on the porch, not knowing that he was there. Wayne came forward eagerly, his hat lifted, and bowing with a grace that Mrs. Pearson had often remarked in him, he said, I beg your pardon for speaking to you as I did last night. It was very rude, and I should not have forgotten myself so far had I not been greatly incensed over another matter. His stepmother gazed at him in unqualified surprise. This was a new phase in a young man's character. Wayne had always avoided a direct issue with her since he had grown older, so there had been no occasion for apology. Her own son was certainly not given to confessions of wrong. What a queer fellow Wayne was! She knew he was not mocking her, his tones and manner were respectful, and his eyes looked sincere. She was not entirely proof against so courteous an apology. For a moment her heart warmed to him. Then an ugly feeling that an action so noble condemned her own son turned the scale. He from a child had possessed a lawless tongue and never dreamed of apologies. She thought within herself, Wayne is probably trying to buy me off. He supposes that if he confesses, I will not mention it to his father. When she spoke, after hesitation, her, certainly, was as cold as if it had frozen on the way out. During that day, a vivid account of the library scene was forwarded to her husband. It had concluded with, I am really worried about Wayne. He looked perfectly furious. But there, I did not mean to trouble you. Of course, we must bear with him and count it one of the means of disciplining our spirits in patience. I am truly sorry for you. It never seemed to occur to Mrs. Pearson that her husband had aught to complain of in her own son. Mother Love had a mantle broad and long to screen him from eyes severe, but alas for Wayne, whose faults were seen through a magnifying glass. In the afternoon, 
Wayne took a sudden determination to spend the Sabbath with a friend several miles distant by rail, so he left home soon after luncheon. He had not been long gone when Leon sauntered out to the stable where the horses of the two young men stood side by side. He began to saddle his own for a gallop, but discovered a loose shoe. Instead of delaying his ride for a little and taking his horse to a nearby blacksmith shop, he laid hold of Wayne's pony. Then he gave a long, low whistle, a signal with him that he was somewhat perplexed and nonplussed. A slender chain passed about Liff's neck, and then threw an iron ring in a beam, and was securely fastened with a padlock. "'Aha, my boy! We'll see whether you have got the better of me this time,' he muttered, as he ransacked his pockets for keys. It was not the first time that Leon had attempted to ride Liff, but he was so cruel to animals that Wayne would on no account trust his horse to him, and had taken this precaution to make all safe during his absence. He carried one key himself, and had provided Jonas, the man of all work, with another. It was like Leon to be more than ever determined to ride the horse as the difficulties of accomplishing it increased. Jonas was at work in a far-off lot, and the horse could be secured if he could only unlock that padlock, and unlock it he would, somehow or other. He went upstairs and got all the keys that would be likely to fit. At last, a key belonging to an old valise almost opened the padlock. A little filing, then the key turned in the lock, and the horse was free, or rather, he was in bonds to a tyrant. While Leon saddled him, he could not keep the grin from his face that the other young man so hated. Very soon he trotted down the road well pleased. Liff was the perfection of a saddle horse, for, added to unusual ease of motion, he was even more fleet and spirited than Leon's own, and the young man had long been maneuvering to secure him for a dash over the country. The sun was throwing long shadows when Leon came plunging at full speed up the carriageway, and nobody would have recognized the gentle Liff in this wild creature with distended nostrils and covered with foam. It happened that Liff's master, not finding his friend at home, had returned by the next train, and at this moment came up the pathway through the grove, amazement, horror, and fury in his face. He was just in time to hear from among the vines about the porch a soft voice with a note of distress in it exclaim, "'Oh, that poor dear horse!' And Wayne knew that it was not his stepmother's voice. End of chapter 5「six of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six enid during the last fortnight there had been a guest at beechwood whose presence had the same effect on the household that a burst of sunshine let into a gloomy room might produce not that the inmates of that home were continually warring but when there is not perfect harmony, the atmosphere is more or less affected by it. The house was often gay with music and laughter and merry guests, who, despite good cheer and abounding hospitality, were conscious of a chill in the intercourse of the family themselves. Enid Wilmer was the daughter of Mrs. Pearson's dearest friend. Their intimacy, begun in school, had been cemented through the years by correspondence and occasional visits. When ill health obliged Mrs. Wilmer to spend a year at certain springs in Europe, she decided to leave her daughter Enid in the excellent school where she had been a pupil for two years past. Learning of this, Mrs. Pearson petitioned that the young girl be allowed to spend her summer vacation at Beechwood. "'Let your dear girlie come to us,' she had written." we will take the best care of her. Leon is at home, and will be delighted to ride and walk and row with her. Who knows, dear friend, 
but that it might be the small beginning of an attachment which would fulfill our early dreams that our children should belong to each other not of course that i would encourage love-making thus early but it is well to have them acquainted mrs wilmer was only too happy to have her daughter in her friend's home during a part of the long separation there is a type of modern schoolgirl flippant irreverent ill-mannered which one shudders to encounter until life's experiences and the grace of god have chiselled and polished away insufferable egotisms and vanities such was not enid wilmer indeed it was a wonder that a nature so sweet and unspoiled should have sprung from the unfriendly soil of wealth and fashion the families had not met in several years but mrs pearson had written much of her son so that enid quite looked forward to the pleasure of having a sort of brother to go about with her unless perhaps she should stand too much in awe of so great a paragon as his mother had painted him leon too welcomed the thought of a young lady guest for so long a time when they met both were disappointed leon's loud bold ways and his taking a sort of possession of enid from the first not in a brotherly role either but as if she were a grown-up young lady repelled the girl he darted impressive glances at her from his big black eyes and rattled off sentimental nonsense mixed with silly compliments enid on the contrary had thought of herself as not much more than a little girl and leon as a nice boy who would be a good comrade to ramble about with her leon was amazed that his efforts at flirting met with so little success when he flashed unutterable things at her from eloquent eyes her own earnest grey-blue ones gave no answering flash but gravely regarded him with innocent steadfast look as if she did not understand such manifestations when he grew bolder and talked about what she called foolishness she would promptly take herself out of hearing of his voice or surprise him by spirited banter turning his love-making into ridicule without mercy the womanly intuitions even of her brief seventeen years told her it was but hollow talk and mockery the other boy whom enid met at meal-times and occasionally in the evening was a problem to her reserved rather silent it was difficult to know him but his grave kind eyes and courteous manner won enid's liking and what she saw of him belied what she continually heard from his stepmother and leon mrs pearson had remarked to her yes every house has its skeleton only it has flesh and bones in this case if it were not for wayne pearson we three would be perfectly happy my husband is devoted to leon and we have lovely times when we are alone but wayne is a disturbing element as you will soon discover he has a sullen jealous disposition which is like a dark cloud in our home there is always some difficulty between him and leon on account of it his temper carries him to great lengths sometimes i will admit that leon is a bad tease and does aggravate him from pure love of fun wayne is one of those fellows who cannot take a joke sort of wooden you know and leon does love a joke if it weren't for his merry brightness i don't know what would become of us sometimes but the chief trouble grows out of wayne's inordinate jealousy one reason for that is that he does not learn so readily as leon it is trying of course to see leon so far ahead of him getting praises and honors and all that sort of thing the poor fellow has to get his education by the hardest i don't know how he would come out of it if it were not for leon's constant help but let me tell you how he repays him then followed an account of the story that leon had brought home that he had been locked into his room by wayne in order to prevent his being present at that important closing recitation all this did not have the effect on the young girl that might have been supposed enid found herself believing despite it all in the clear-eyed young man who sat opposite her at table 
and she longed to put some brightness into a life that seemed to have so little. She pitied him, and Wayne received many a telegraphic glance of sympathy and goodwill from the lovely innocent eyes, which he prized more than he would had he known just what prompted them. No young man likes to be pitied by a girl. Enid had been at Beechwood long enough to become acquainted with Liff. She had even, one day, enjoyed the privilege of skimming over the country on his back, and she made many a visit to the stable during his master's absence to give him a dainty bit. So her horror and indignation were almost as great as Wayne's when she saw the jaded creature that Leon brought home after his wild ride. She was in full sympathy, too, with the owner of the beautiful animal in the debate which followed. "'What does this mean? What business had you to take my horse without permission?' Wayne thundered. Under other circumstances, Leon would probably have made an insolent reply, but he knew he had an audience. His mother and Enid were on the porch. So, in a smooth, calm tone, he said, it means, my beloved brother, that I had an important errand at Milburn. My horse had lost a shoe, and I could not delay, so I ventured upon your well-known generosity, and took yours, for which I crave your royal highness's pardon. You wretch! You brute! burst from Wayne's lips. Look at him! He's ruined! The young man had been obliged to hold himself with a firm hand to keep from seizing the whip and laying it about Leon, regardless of the consequences. The rider dismounted leisurely and flung the bridle over the horse's neck, saying as he did so, There, I was going to take him to his stable and make him as good as new, but not after such abuse. As usual, Leon appeared to his mother, who had silently listened, to be the injured one, and she said to Enid, There, you can see now what I meant. Did ever anyone hear of such a fit of anger over so small a thing? He is always just so mean and disobliging. Poor Leon! It seems a shame that his home should be made unpleasant by that fellow. Enid, fearing that she could no longer repress her indignation, excused herself and went to her room. A few minutes later she stole away unperceived, by a roundabout way, to the stable. She stepped back when she reached the door and saw Wayne with his head bowed on the neck of the horse. When he lifted it and began to rub lift down, Enid walked softly in. She had a basket in her hand containing a bottle of witch hazel, some soft cloths, and a few lumps of sugar. "'I couldn't help coming to try to do something for poor dear Liff,' she said, coming to the horse's side and patting him. "'It was horrid to treat him so. I do believe Leon used spurs, cruel fellow. Liff's great eyes look at you mournfully, as if he wanted to ask—' Where was my master when this dreadful thing happened to me? If Wayne had seen Enid approaching in the distance, he would probably have fastened the stable door, for he wished to be alone with his anger and grief. As it was, he could not trust himself to words. The feelings that surged within him could find no fit expression for innocent ears. He only bowed his head and tried to smile when Enid asked, May I help you comfort poor Liff? He could but smile indeed when, after she had bathed the wounds made by the spurs, she poured witch hazel liberally over the linen cloth and washed Liff's face as if he were a human, drying it gently with another cloth. She would have bathed the horse from head to foot in the refreshing lotion had she been allowed to do so. Then she combed and stroked his silky mane talking fondly to him the while, and plumping lumps of sugar into his mouth. Liff was already looking brighter, and his master had grown calmer, when Enid vanished noiselessly as she had come, though not before she heard, as she went out, a grateful, "'Thank you ever so much.'" 
it was a great relief to wayne that he needed to work vigorously for a time and so expend some of his overwrought feeling it was most aggravating to have this to bear without hope of redress but there was no hope except it might be through a hand-to-hand -hand encounter possibly in that he might come off victor for he had grown strong and become a skilled athlete his lithe slenderness might more than match leon's stouter proportions but the thought of seriously entertaining such an idea was abhorrent to him never would he descend to measures of that sort unless self-defense made it necessary the next afternoon which was the sabbath enid had established herself in a corner of the porch with a book mrs pearson lay in a hammock near by dozing and reading by turns when leon came out and asked enid to go with him for a row on the river thank you not to-day enid said to-morrow if you choose whereupon leon struck a theatrical attitude and quoted to-morrow didst thou say go to i will not hear of to-morrow it is a period nowhere to be found in all the hoary registers of time unless perchance in the fool's calendar but to come down to everyday prose i shall be away to-morrow some other day then persisted enid i really cannot go to-day if you will excuse me leon muttered something unintelligible and strode off to a seat under a tree in the distance his mother watched him uneasily then turning to enid asked why did you not go dear don't you like the water oh yes indeed i do very much but and enid hesitated then went bravely on i have not been accustomed to going out rowing on the sabbath do you think it is quite right to do so you dear little puritan why not what would be quieter than floating about on a peaceful river talking or reading you can take along all the good books you wish yes but enid said with flushing face i have lately promised to live to please my master the lord jesus and i'm not sure about this my dear child your mother and i when we were girls at home spent almost every sabbath afternoon in summer floating about in a boat on a little lake it never crossed our minds that we were doing wrong we turned out to be rather good women did we not the sarcasm was painful to the sensitive girl even though it was accompanied by a smile besides mrs pearson went on i have always supposed that christian service meant doing good to others if so innocent a thing as this will keep a young man from attending a ball game on the sabbath where i presume he is planning this minute to go it would seem that it was certainly right while enid hesitated mrs pearson said in a softened tone we mothers have a good deal of anxious thought about our boys i hope dear if you can find it in your conscience to help me by influencing him for good this afternoon you will do so poor enid in a strait betwixt many opposing thoughts began to feel that at least it might be right to heed the wishes of the woman in whose care she had been placed by her mother then if she could really do good by going was it not her duty and yet with a tenderer conscience and a more logical mind than her hostess there arose the question how could she influence another for good when she was by her own standard breaking the sabbath to accomplish it the conflict ended by her going down to tell leon that she had changed her mind and would go with him when they were seated in the boat moving rapidly to long strokes of the oars over the smooth water leon noticed that enid had a book in her lap upon my word he exclaimed trying to spell out the title the something secret you're a sly midget you've brought along a paper-covered novel french too i dare say ah these demure girls they're deep shall i read to you enid asked opening the book 
oh yes of course i'm always ready for a novel a good one whereupon enid began to read the story of a young man who early in life had a vivid realization that he was a soul that this world was not his permanent home that just over a boundary line was the other world to which he was going and it was everlasting to enid the christian's secret of a happy life had lately become more intensely interesting than a novel could possibly be she forgot her companion as she read on with glowing face until leon exclaimed excuse me but how much of that trash do you think my good nature capable of enduring a happy life indeed i know the secret of a happy life it is to have all the money you want go where you please and do what you please that makes a good time which of course includes taking a pretty girl out boating that is if she isn't pokey see here seriously my dear take my advice and throw that book into the river that is no sort of reading for you it will make you into a disagreeable sanctimonious old maid if such an unnatural prig of a fellow as that book describes ever lived he ought to have been tortured until he got some sense during this tirade enid read quietly to herself as if she did not hear what he was saying come now this isn't very interesting leon said after a silence can't you sing something enid did not feel in the least like singing leon's talk had been an offence to her but the remembrance of what had brought her out there made her resolve to pass it over her voice was sweet and well trained it was a pleasure to leon to hear it even though it did sing the hymn beginning when peace like a river attendeth my way that finished she began one of which leon liked the melody and he sang with her when mrs pearson heard enid's sweet penetrating notes and leon's deep bass float to her from the distant water in the hymn o oh, day of rest and gladness most beautiful most bright she smiled and congratulated herself enid was on the alert to forestall leon's selections and she glided into another song as soon as one was finished but in the midst of a strain he suddenly broke out in a secular sentimental song which had not even merit to commend it of course enid did not sing with him that vexed him and snatches of all the foolish songs that floated through his memory were given then college songs uproarious and bordering on coarseness were shouted out while he enjoyed to the utmost enid's troubled face she begged him to stop but he only laughed and sang the louder then she grew indignant and told him he was rude and his reply was my but you look pretty when you're vexed end of chapter six Chapter Seven of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven A Fateful Letter. By this time, the rising tide had changed the smooth surface of the water, and the sky had begun to darken. You must turn about at once, glancing at the threatening clouds must indeed nobody says must to me say please take me home that's a dear and i'll do it but the girl was silent it began to dawn on her tormentor that she was really becoming frightened here was a fine opportunity to tease and to bring down miss enid's dignity at the same time it would be delicious he told himself to see her with fearful face begging him to protect her when a distant roll of thunder was heard, he examined the sky with mock anxiety, then swiftly turned the boat about as if they were in great danger, and he rowed with mad haste till the boat reared and plunged like a living thing. 
it was on the verge of upsetting several times and the water dashed in over enid who though pale with fear held a strong rein over herself resolved that leon should not be gratified by one beseeching look she knew that all this tossing about was unnecessary and it roused her indignation the instant the boat grated on the sands she sprang out leon clutched at her arm to detain her but she broke away and ran swiftly up the hill for once leon was checkmated he had meant to make it all up with her on the homeward walk the rest of the fun would be to see her beautiful eyes look forgiveness into his own the path that led to the pine woods was hidden from leon's view by a bend in the road and enid turned in here thinking to escape him wayne was accustomed to go to his green retreat on sabbath afternoons with his bible to keep up a boyish practice and worship in this quiet place not his lord but the memory of his mother he went over then the chapters they used to read together recalling some of her dear words perhaps the seed thus sown would yet blossom and bear fruit he was amazed that afternoon to see enid rush suddenly in between the tree trunks throw herself down at the foot of one and burst into a paroxysm of weeping evidently she thought herself alone he must let her know to the contrary but he hesitated to interrupt those tears it must do one good to cry like that however he rose and went toward her when enid heard the crackling twigs she started up as if to run but seeing wayne sank down again covering her face with her hands i'm glad it's you came the muffled voice presently and not that that torment i know you must think me very silly to cry at this rate but i have got going and can't stop what has happened why you are wet what can i do for you wayne asked all in a breath nothing thank you she said putting back her stray locks i shall run up to the house in a minute when there is no danger of being overtaken the wet will not hurt me and nobody can do anything anyway i must endure it while i stay oh that disagreeable fellow a sympathetic listener was a temptation and enid gave an account of the trials of the afternoon adding but after all i am troubled most at my own self i ought not to have gone on sunday and then i got so fearfully angry at leon i didn't know before that i could hate anybody the brute wayne exclaimed he ought to be just then the pine boughs parted and leon's dark face looked in he had heard wayne's last remark and guessed who was meant you puppy he roared shaking his fist in wayne's face i'll teach you to interfere in my affairs get out of here or i'll put you out wayne's answer was a look from bright resolute eyes as he braced himself against a huge tree he was not averse to punishing leon for abusing his horse if it could be done in self-defense so he waited leon made a bound toward him and put out a hand but enid sprang between them don't she cried strike me if you must strike leon gazed for an instant at the slender girl with her glowing face and white robes admiring her in spite of himself then he laughed sneeringly and motioned her aside at this moment however footsteps and voices were heard drawing near the storm had gone round the sun was shining and mrs pearson with a stranger was seen approaching enid fled at once and wayne stepped behind a large tree leon dear his mother said this is judge kemp your father's old friend who has kindly stopped on his way north to see us we are in search of you to walk with us to the beach a fortunate interruption for both young men were in the mood for a conflict the next morning's mail brought a letter to wayne which pleased him 
it was an invitation from a college friend to spend the summer with him at his father's summer home in the mountains this was exactly to wayne's mind his friend was most congenial and the visit would take him away from the place that was becoming intolerable he would have gone almost anywhere though until the opening of college a letter asking his father's approval was dispatched at once and the reply came in a few cold words saying that if he could not treat his mother with respect his absence in the home was certainly more to be desired than his presence the father it will be remembered received an account of his son's offence but not of the apology to do mrs pearson justice though her conscience afterward made her promise to tell him when he should come home wayne waited only to place liff under the care of his former owner and one bright summer morning set off on his journey almost light-hearted he was disappointed though in not seeing enid to bid her good-bye it was quite early but she often got out for a run before breakfast and now he caught a glimpse of her in the distance, seeming in her green dress and cap like a part of the shrubbery. I never before had the pleasure of meeting the dryad who presides over this wood in her very temple, Wayne said as he drew near with a knightly bow. That is only because you don't get up early enough. She is often around at sunrise. Then more seriously, Enid said, I shall be gone when you come back. How nice it would be if you were to stay and somebody else were to go. I have been wanting to speak to you alone ever since Sunday, and tell you how much I liked to have you plant yourself against that tree and stand firm when ordered off your own grounds. It was splendid. And I have wanted to see you to tell you how grateful I am that you risked your life to save my own. They both laughed then, a merry, carefree laugh, such as Wayne seldom indulged in. The young man reached and broke a small sprig from a tall cedar, saying as he handed it to Enid, Keep that till I see you again, I wonder when it will be, and believe that my friendship for you is like this tree, fragrant and perennial. Now can't I have a keepsake? Enid knew where a stray rose-bush hid itself, and she disappeared a moment, returning with a lovely wild rose. Wayne placed it in his coat. Then they shook hands, and he was gone. The wood-nymph went her way, feeling lonely. Leon Hamilton had not the habit of liquor-drinking so fixed upon him that he used it daily. As yet, he indulged only at intervals, or when tempted by dissolute associates. This being the case, it was easy enough that summer to delude his stepfather into believing that his habits were correct. A safety valve was afforded him by short absences, when he went on what he called a lark, returning apparently as usual. He improved every opportunity in Wayne's absence to strengthen Mr. Pearson's belief in him to stand high in his regard was worth working for. Who could tell but that if he maneuvered wisely, the greater part of the estate would fall to him? Therefore it was as if the young man's character hastened to throw on a mask at the approach of his stepfather. Each day he welcomed him smilingly, as if his homecoming was what he most longed for he read up the daily news for no other reason but to be companionable to this man of affairs and nothing could exceed his delicate thoughtfulness he was ever on the alert to perform some service and so cheerfully that it was a pleasure to receive a favor from him as a consequence the atmosphere of home was delightful to the tired man whose life went on its busy way be it summer or winter and he was wont to sigh when contrasting his silent, reserved son with this, his other son. It was unfortunate that circumstances had seemed always to conspire to aid the young man in the course of deception, which had now become second nature. Years before, he had overheard Wayne's father tell him that he should listen to no complaints. This, and Wayne's silence, 
had encouraged him in lawless conduct, carefully concealed from the father. The present summer, too, was no exception. Enid had too much delicacy of feeling to hint by word or look to her host and hostess that her visit was made intolerable by Leon's insolence and tyranny. She simply cut it short as soon as possible. Autumn found the young men in their accustomed places in the university. Wayne, refreshed by his outing, prepared to enter upon the year's study with zeal. Like most earnest souls, when starting fresh, he had forfeited himself by many resolves. He would try to curb the fierce anger which Leon's insolence always awakened. He would hold himself so high above his persecutions that they would cease to annoy. It was only a year. Then he should cut loose from his father's house forever. The thought of trying to make his stepbrother different never crossed the young man's mind. It would have seemed to him like changing Ethiopian skins and leopard spots. It is Christians only who have love enough and faith enough to dare hope for such. He also decided that it was useless to try to enlighten his father as to Leon. A wall of prejudice, strong and high, was in the way. Perhaps, too, Leon had learned his lesson, and it would not be necessary. Scarcely a month had passed, however, when the attention of the faculty was again called to the same clique of disorderly students who had annoyed them the year before. They determined to break up this state of affairs, and had been cautiously watching and taking notes of certain men who supposed their midnight revelings had been carried on with great secrecy. Leon had joined himself to the wild set, and was one of those who received a reprimand and warning. It so happened one Friday that Leon reached home just as the mail arrived. He received it and looked over the letters. There was one that startled him. It was in the peculiar upright handwriting of the dean of the university, and was addressed to his stepfather. This was suspicious just at this time, and boded no good to himself. He quickly slipped it into his pocket, placing the others on the tray which stood on a hall table. Hurrying to his room, he carefully opened the envelope, slipped out the letter, and read what brought a deeper flush to his face, and called forth that long, low whistle of his, a sign that he was in what he would have called a hole. The paragraph which was of chief interest to him read, We regret to inform you that your son Leon is not applying himself to study as he should. We fear, too, that he is forming habits of dissipation. Possibly a word from you, joined to the admonition he has already received, may make an impression for good. We trust so, for the suspension of a young man so bright and attractive, especially one connected with yourself, would give us much pain. For your son Wayne, on the contrary, we have nothing but praise. He is an honor to our institution, and a young man of such promise in every way. Leon knit his brows in perplexity over this letter. His first thought was to destroy it. But of what use would that be? Another could be sent in its place, though of course he should be more careful in future and not give those old donkeys a chance to pry into his affairs. Of turning squarely about and being different he had no intention. Suddenly there flashed into his mind a plan. This letter might be so managed that it would actually serve his own interests instead of condemning him. And yet he hesitated. He did not intend to be wholly bad. His falsehoods were often inconsequent talk, which one might take seriously or otherwise. But to tamper with the mail was, even to his irresponsible nature, not a light matter. Still, it would be an excellent opportunity to pay off some grudges toward Wayne, and also aid perhaps in what he had wished for so long which was an open rupture between father and son, ending in Wayne's leaving home. Then he should have no spy upon his actions. It should be done. Without further hesitation, he carefully erased the two names. Then, as carefully, 
and he was skilled in the imitation of handwriting, substituted Wayne for Leon and Leon for Wayne. Even then there was a risk in letting it go. His stepfather might go up to the university and have an interview with the faculty. Then the truth would come out. He had no fears because of altering the letter, that would naturally be charged to a slip of the writer's pen. However, there were risks anyway. That sharp-eyed Dean might swoop down upon him at Beechwood. Then what? However, knowing father and son as he did, the chances were that it would bring on a fracas, and there would be no interview with the Dean. Mr. Pearson was too busy and too proud. The matter decided, he resealed the letter and returned it to its place on the tray, biding his time, not without much uneasiness, it must be confessed. Wayne had not been unaware, during the month, of Leon's conduct, and a report had come to him within a day or two that large sums of money had been put up by him at the gaming table. Wayne's conscience troubled him. What if his father had been unjust to him? He would not retaliate, not upon father whose head was growing gray. He must and would tell him of Leon's misdoings at once. Mr. Pearson was in the habit of deferring the opening of his evening mail until after dinner, when he retired to the quiet of the library, where he was left undisturbed an hour or two. He had not been long there, on the evening the dean's letter was received, when Wayne came in, saying, "'Father, can I speak with you a few minutes?' His father looked at him coldly, making no answer. Wayne shut the door, came over to a seat near him, and began. "'Father, as long as I was the only one to suffer, I have been silent regarding Leon Hamilton.' but now that your own interests are in danger, I must speak. He told his story then in as few words as possible, while his father gazed at him in utter amazement, interrupting him at last, and in a hoarse voice with anger exclaimed, And you expect me to believe all this? What duplicity! And a son of mine! It is a most likely story, sir, that you would not have informed me long ago had this been true. It is simply a plot to divert suspicion from yourself. I have abundant proof that you are the guilty one. The father almost groaned out the last words, while the veins stood out like cords on his forehead. It was Wayne's turn to sit stupefied with horror and surprise. Before he could speak again, his father said, in a voice that Wayne scarcely recognized, "'Leave me alone!' The son tried to protest, but his father waved him away with an imperative, "'Go!' Then the door was locked after him, and the strong man bowed his head in grief such as he had known but once before in his life. How could it be that his boy had come to this? Was it his father's fault? Had he been unfaithful to his high trust? The back years came and passed in review like a panorama. His mistakes were sharply outlined. He seemed to see again the boy's mother, as she lay dying that summer morning, lift pleading eyes to his face, and murmur with her last breath, Be gentle with our boy. The boy's eyes were like hers. No, he had not been gentle, he had been harsh and impatient. The son had been unhappy, and he had not cared. It was too late now. The years had made their record, the books were closed, and the boy was as he was. There was no sleep for Wayne that night. The time he had thought a year away had come. He must go. Before midnight his trunk was packed, and all arrangements for a sudden departure completed. That done, he went out for a last visit to the woods. The sun shone solemnly down into the still place, still but for the murmured song of a wakeful bird. As Wayne stood and took a silent farewell, he heard footsteps, and there in the open moonlit space was his father, walking back and forth with bowed head no sleep for him either. 
and then to the watching sun there came a flood of tenderness a remnant of boyish fondness and he rushed out the anger gone from his heart crying father father there is some terrible mistake can't we love each other again what can i do to you can take yourself out of my sight came in a loud angry tone from the father there it was out and he had meant to try to be forgiving but the boy was gone gone indeed a few minutes later for he stepped upon the night express and was borne swiftly away End of chapter 7chapter eight of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the upper district though he should live to be a hundred years old wayne peterson believed that he could never experience a more utter sense of desolation than took possession of him that night when he boarded the midnight train stumbled over grips and handbags into a seat and drew his hat down to conceal his face as much as possible he believed that his brain was clear but in reality it was in a whirl his thoughts ran riot about one point it had come he was homeless friendless alone he had imagined such an experience more than once gone over indeed every slightest possibility of that way but always he knew now with an undertone conviction that it would never come to him why should wayne pearson the only son of a man whom he often of late years heard spoken of as the most eminent lawyer in the state ever be homeless and friendless yet here he was deserted his getting ready had been done in a maze he had packed his trunk it is true but if it had not been pitiful it would have been amusing the things that went into it most of his everyday needs were at the university whither he had carried them by degrees through the years always taking from home a full valise and bringing it back nearly empty yet when one is going to leave home for good one must of course take one's trunk so he packed it there were books of course wayne pearson never went anywhere without books he made no effort to choose but swept in those that happened to be lying about his room there was also a pile of old music selected in the same way then there followed miscellaneous articles a small box containing relics of a noah's ark that had been dear to his childhood most of the animals were maimed and part of the ark itself was missing the young man could not have told why he packed it but the fact remains that while he mechanically tossed in any articles of clothing that his eyes happened to fall upon and made no attempt to plan for that or the coming season he deliberately climbed to the highest shelf of his full closet and brought down that noah's ark and packed it with some care there was also the little box containing the bit of ribbon and the half-worn gloves and the dust of a flower or two that his mother's hands had touched there was a photograph of his father taken for his mother but a little while before she went away an excellent picture of aunt crete the only photograph she could ever be persuaded to sit for and there were half a dozen pictures of his mother representing her when she was a fair girlish bride then a mother with her baby in her arms then a matron with the halo of a coming glory already foreshadowing her face and with a pale solemn-eyed boy clinging to her these were carefully selected but the other things merely happened he had packed his trunk but it had all seemed unreal even when he called jonas and directed that the trunk be taken to the station for the midnight express and jonas had answered with his usual respect yes sir and where will i check it to mr wayne he had been dazed he had looked at jonas as one in a dream and repeated mechanically check yes sir said jonas will i check it for you have you got your ticket mr wayne oh 
said wayne trying to rouse himself to the occasion never mind the check jonas i will be down there to see to it but he had not seen to it the baggage man at the station who of course knew all the pearsons had done it for him you're too late to check sir he had said hurrying up the check office isn't open here for the night train but i'll mark your trunk for you and have it put on and it will be all right you're going up to town i suppose no said wayne speaking with a sharpness that startled himself i'm not going to town that is i'm not going to stop mark it for for chicago it was the only name he could recall the baggage master looked bewildered you can't do anything of that kind you know he said looking closely at wayne and when he thought it over afterward he muttered to himself if it had been the other one i should think he had had a drop too much but that isn't this one's stamp i can't be sure of the trunk without a check farther than the junction oh very well said wayne mark it the junction then it doesn't signify it seemed to him such a trivial matter how his trunk was marked or what became of it he was in no clearer frame of mind when the conductor touched his arm and demanded a ticket ticket he said vaguely i have no ticket well sir said the conductor sharply what are you going to do about it am i to put you off the train then wayne forced himself to attend to business he explained that he had not had time to buy his ticket and mentioned chicago again as the place toward which he was traveling and was informed that he could pay as far as the junction which they reached soon after daylight and there he would better get off and buy a ticket wayne vaguely remembered that his friend the baggage master had said something about the junction and agreed to this plan then he settled himself for a night of misery a whole lifetime of pain could be lived through between midnight and daylight and who should have miserable thoughts if not one who had just cut himself loose from all that had heretofore been his life he leaned his head against the car window drawing his hat still further over his face and prepared to go over the bitter story of his wrongs and then in less than five minutes he went into one of the soundest sleeps he had ever taken in his life he was young remember and the day had been filled with strains of one sort and another culminating in that latest one which had seemed to benumb all his faculties when the baggage man had asked him if he wanted a sleeper he had smiled bitterly as he said briefly no i don't nothing had seemed more improbable than that he should do any sleeping that night yet when the conductor shook his arm and shouted in his ear he opened his eyes to discover that it was broad daylight here you are sir at the junction if you want the chicago train you have to step lively that's it on the south track the young man managed to get himself off the car and to bring with him his grip and overcoat but he stood quite still and let the chicago train pull out of the station why should he go to chicago still he must go somewhere he felt almost more bewildered than he had the night before and he also felt humiliated to think that he had been sleeping although if he could have realized it that was perhaps the most sensible thing he had done during the twenty-four hours just passed across the road from him was a hotel and people from various trains were crowding in for breakfast something reminded wayne that he had had no dinner the night before and he followed the crowd a chance to wash and brush followed by a good breakfast restored his wits somewhat and when he saw by the schedule that the next train via the great northwestern road left in fifteen minutes he resolved to take it he had always intended to see the great west some time why not now all day he rode going out with the crowd for dinner and for supper and accepting the kindly offer of a vacant berth in the overcrowded sleepers lucky my friend didn't show up said the friendly stranger who had offered it 
if he had you'd have had to sit up all night there's an awful crowd on board wayne although he had such important matters of his own to think about nevertheless took time to wonder who the friend was and why he had not shown up had he possibly been going away from home for good and had something happened to make it all unnecessary he had arranged a probable chain of circumstances for him and was becoming deeply interested in the plot when he pulled himself up sharply and mentally called himself a fool for allowing his mind to interest itself with childish imaginings instead of giving himself to the serious business of life he did not sleep so well that night as he had the night before despite the berth that dozens of weary less fortunate travellers envied him his benefactor just below him snored distressfully and the air of the car or rather the lack of air was torture to wayne's sensitive nerves so it was a very much jaded traveller who looked gloomily at life upon the second morning of his journey and tried to determine what should be done next it was folly for him to go on in this way besides being monotonous in the extreme the process was making great strides through his pocket-book a young man who has henceforth to support himself must think of such things years ago a hundred years ago it seemed to him when he was a small boy he had imagined a state of things that pleased him when i am a man he had said some day i mean to take fifty dollars and go to the station and get on the first train that comes and ride and ride until it is all gone and then see where i will be and how i shall feel he had laughed much over this conceit and argued with his mother as to his probable feelings behold here he was almost realizing that childish plan what with meals and sleeper and tickets he had spent not so very much less than the fifty dollars already and if he did not feel of all men most miserable it was difficult for him to imagine greater trouble than his own still it was time to think connectedly and he set himself about it there was no use in trying to go over the weary story again he had been at that all night his enemy had conquered him somehow he could not understand it there was a mystery about it and probably there always would be but the fact was plain enough that his father had been entirely alienated from him that woman and her son had accomplished what they had been trying from the first his father had told him practically that he was a villain and that he had been plotting all the while to cover his own guilt at the expense of his stepbrother and then finally when out of the fullness of his heart he had made that last cry for confidence his father had ordered him out of his sight what could have been meant in view of all that had passed before this but that he was to go permanently it was not the going the poor fellow told himself as he wiped the perspiration from his forehead life at home had become anything but pleasant to him he had meant very soon to relieve his father of his presence but the manner of the going like a disowned reprobate was terrible the day was heavy with clouds and the air was chill with the sense of a coming storm other men were buttoning their coats closer about them and examining the heating apparatus at their feet but wayne wiped the perspiration from his forehead and his sensitive blood seemed at fever heat no he would not go all over it again he would never if possible never so long as he lived think of that prince of villains again if he could kill him and thus rid the earth of a wretch who ought not to live there might be some excuse for thinking of him but since he was powerless let him not pollute his mind with such a memory it was in that way that he tried to dismiss his stepbrother from his life now what was he to do he wished to have himself distinctly understand that he had by no means run away from home like the bad boy in the story-book his lip curled in sarcasm over the thought 
and he drew himself up with sad dignity. It was not that by any means. He had been ordered away. As soon as he was definitely settled and at work, he should, of course, write to his father and explain the step he had felt himself compelled to take. Thus much was due his portion as a gentleman. But he would distinctly decline any further assistance from his father and make what way he could by himself. His broken college course, so near the end, and with the end in view so full of expected honors, was a very bitter portion of his cup. He had meant to endure until he should graduate, but his father had himself made this impossible, so he tried to put that part of his life away as something that was beyond his control. Only, he told himself proudly, that he should graduate. It would not be with his class, and the class honors, that he knew they had been preparing to lavish upon him, would be given to another. There would be delay, but some day he should graduate, and from that very college. His father should see, if he cared to see, what the world thought of the son whom he had cast off so easily. The funds with which to do all these great things the young man meant to earn. For several years he had been telling himself that he believed he was intended for a teacher, and down deep in his heart had been an ambition to some time become a college president. Assuredly he had not meant to begin his work by teaching a district school, but he had the sense to see that for an undergraduate, friendless and alone, even a district school might be hard to secure. Meantime he must live. He took out his pocket book and carefully estimated his resources. When he left home he had had a hundred dollars in his pocket, and he knew that there was something over fifty placed to his credit at the bank. His father had been very liberal with his allowance, and he was simple in his tastes and so studious in his habits that the surplus had accumulated. But the long reckless journey had already lessened the sum alarmingly to one who had never before been compelled to count costs. He took out his watch and examined it carefully with a new interest. He knew that it was very valuable. Too valuable for a boy to carry his father had said with an indulgent smile when he handed it to him. It cost two hundred dollars, my boy, but your grandfather decreed that you were to have it on your sixteenth birthday, so here it is. The grandfather was gone now, his mother's father, and Wayne had meant to keep the watch forever. He meant to still, but he told himself, with eyes suddenly dimming while he gazed at it, that if real necessity should arise, he could sell it for a while at least, until he was able to buy it back. Meantime, of course, he would get something to do to earn his living. If not teaching, why then, shoveling snow or whatever was to be had. And he set his lips firmly, making lines in his face that his stepmother would have said, indicated the Pearson obstinacy, and resolved that he would succeed. He got off, toward the close of the day, at a little station where the train seemed to be unaccountably delayed, and for very weariness walked about in front of a little hotel, and wondered if it would be wise to pass another night on the train, or whether he ought to stop at once and go to work at something. His fifty dollars would soon be gone, and he knew now, without further experiment, just how he should feel. Two men held up the decaying pillars of the hotel porch and chatted together. "'What are they going to do for a teacher up there at the upper district?' "'I dunno. Find another, I suppose. That fellow gave them the slip nice, didn't he? Bad time, too. School ought to have took up three weeks ago or more. Here it is the first of November. But you see, they couldn't do nothing till Squire Willard got home, and he didn't come till last night.' Now they'll look round lively for another, I suppose. What school is that? It was Wayne's voice that asked the question. The man leaning against the nearest post turned and surveyed him carefully from head to foot before he made answer. 
it's the upper district stranger the big red schoolhouse about a mile from here along the north pike they had a man teacher all hired and he gave em the slip at the last minute after the last minute you may say they waited for him and didn't hear nothing from him for most a week after school had ought to commenced waited for him every day you know and all the time he didn't mean to come at all so now they're out wayne turned suddenly and sprang back into the train just in time to secure overcoat and handbag he had resolved to look into matters at the upper district End of chapter 8chapter nine of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine i might be a fool hm said squire willard with the doubtful somewhat perplexed accent i don't know i declare it is a kind of a risk especially as you are so young and haven't had experience and come without references as one may say still your references are extra good i believe in a college education myself and i mean my boy shall have one i am a self-made man but every one cannot succeed in that way well i don't deny that we are in a kind of a fix school ought to have been taken up more than a month ago and the assistant teacher have you seen the assistant teacher well she's as smart as a new whip but then she's young too and being well known here it comes hard for her in some ways your being a perfect stranger will help but we've got a tough lot of boys do you think you could manage them i should certainly make an effort to do so wayne said trying to speak with the dignity befitting at least thirty years i may not be so young as you fancy some people retain their youthful appearance longer than others that's so you don't look a day older than seventeen or eighteen now that's a fact but i presume you are older being you were on your last year in college pity you had to stop funds give out i thought likely well it isn't every young man who has a father to push him through no said wayne it isn't i should like to undertake the work here if you care to have me if i don't succeed it will be easy to dismiss me and i think you will find that my professors in college will vouch for my character and scholarship well the fact is there isn't time to wait and see what they would say but i've no doubt it would be all right you don't look like a deceiving young man well mr what did you say your name was oh yes pearson i've a great mind to give you a trial our young folks are getting very restive sarah jane that's the assistant threatened to open school herself if i didn't stir about and get some one fact is they all depend on me and when i'm away things don't go i've been away for nearly a month i believe i'll risk it and give you a trial here it is friday again school ought to begin monday without fail well go in young man and see what you can make of it squire willard was certainly fond of that word well wayne could scarcely repress a smile over its constant and meaningless repetition he was astonished however at the celerity with which the business was dispatched once the great man's mind was made up within the next hour he found himself the duly appointed head of the school which even the squire spoke of as the upper district not only that but he was directed where to find a boarding-house and given the key to the school building that he might explore it at his leisure when he ventured to express a doubt as to the propriety of moving so rapidly the squire interrupted him with oh there'll be no trouble about that i'll call the committee together to-night and go through the form but you needn't wait for that just go ahead and make all your arrangements and consider yourself hired fact is they all do as i say no need for more than me on the committee for none of the others are willing to stir unless i tell em to you just go down to isaiah thompson's and tell em you want the teacher's room and you will be all right oh they'll take you fast enough teacher always boards there 
Isaiah is Sarah Jane's father, you see, so it will be handy for you and her to fix things up. Isaiah Thompson is a blacksmith. He isn't an educated man, but he's a good, honest blacksmith, and there ain't a better girl in town than Sarah Jane. She's made good use of what chances she's had, and although she has only the little ones to teach, they do say there ain't a boy in the school who can puzzle her in arithmetic. You may want her to take hold with some of the big scholars if you get in a tight place. She's great on grammar, too, Sarah Jane is. Well, Mr. Pearson, or Professor Pearson, I suppose I must call you now. Sounds queer, don't it? Still, I believe in it. They do it all together at Westover. That's our nearest city, and a smart, thriving one it is, only fifteen miles away from us. We want our youngsters trained in all the city ways. Give em the best is my motto. Well, Mr. Professor Pearson, I'm in something of a hurry this morning, and I presume you are, since you have to get up housekeeping today, as it were. I've got a pile of letters and accounts to go over. Drop in and see me whenever you feel like it, and when you want advice about the school or anything, don't hesitate to let me know." whereupon Wayne asked for and received minute directions how to find the blacksmith's house, and walked away, his mind a curious mixture of amusement and indignation. Life was certainly pushing him this morning. An hour ago, a houseless stranger, now the duly appointed head of a public school with a boarding place and an assistant ready to receive him. The indignation was because of the utter recklessness of this great man, Squire Willard, in thus trusting the interests of the boys and girls of his town to an utter stranger, without waiting even to learn whether any of the statements he had made concerning himself were true. I might be a fool, he told himself indignantly, or worse, I might be a villain for all he knows, and he is willing to let his own children come immediately under my influence, and to place that immaculate Sarah Jane in my immediate care. Or am I in hers, I wonder? Then amusement got the uppermost, and he laughed outright. It proved to be a busy morning. The irresponsible young traveller had secured his overcoat and bag, but had allowed his trunk to go to the point for which it was checked, fifty or so miles away. He must go to the station and make arrangements to have it returned to him. Since this remarkable village was willing to adopt a stranger, and in five minutes make a professor of him, there seemed to be nothing to do but accept the situation. The trunk planned for, he sought Isaiah Thompson's small plain red house, and was received by a fat, motherly-looking woman who waddled about with pleased alacrity to show him the room, saying, I want to know, to his brief explanation that he was the new teacher. By this time he felt that he must find a spot where he could be, not only quite out of sight, but out of the hearing of curious ears. So depositing his bag, and learning the hour for supper, he explained that he had taken a late breakfast and should want no dinner. Then he made a dash for the nearest woods, and tramped about until he was physically exhausted. Then he sat down on the trunk of a fallen tree, and buried his face in both hands. What had he done, this creature of impulse? Placed a thousand miles between himself and his home, his college, all his old life. Practically run away, however much he might sneer at the idea and curl his lip over the story books. In what respect was his action better than those of the young fools about whom he had read in his very early boyhood, and for whom he had always felt a wholesome contempt? It is true, he would soon be twenty-one and his own master. But did a self-respecting young man of twenty-one care particularly about being his own master? Given the fact that he was a decent fellow with a decent home and a reasonably good father, had he not as a rule learned by that time to appreciate both? It is true that his father had spoken bitter words to him, had in fact ordered him from his sight, but was it presumable that he meant him to go away from home? On the contrary, was he not, probably at that very hour, 
worried and distressed because of his absence. There had been some misunderstanding. That contemptible wretch, who had been his hidden enemy since the first day they had met, had succeeded in concocting some scheme that he did not understand, and that had for the time deceived his father. But of course the truth would come out, sooner or later. And if he had been a man, instead of a silly, impatient, reckless boy, he would have stayed patiently and studied out the trouble, and borne the thousand petty trials of his everyday life, and compelled his father to understand the mistake he was making. There was no getting away from the conclusion that he had been a fool. He had given his stepmother a chance to tell all her friends, with the air of meek regret which she knew so well how to assume, that that passionate boy's ungovernable temper had gotten the better of him once more, and he had actually run away from college. His poor father was nearly distracted. Oh, she did not pretend to know the details. Some college troubles, such as young fellows of his stamp, were always getting into. This was evidently worse than usual, however, for Wayne had been unable to stay and face it, and they really did not know where he was gone. The young professor, on the fallen tree, ground his teeth and stamped his foot in impotent rage as he thought of all these things, and realized what opportunities he had given his enemies. If he had only waited and gone quietly, openly, if it had finally seemed best for him to go away, but to rush away in the midnight and leave no word with anybody, what were even his friends to think of such conduct? It was a pale, worn, miserably depressed youth who emerged at last, toward the close of that eventful Friday, and made his way to his stuffy little room. Mrs. Thompson would have been aggrieved could she have known that the word stuffy was applied to her spare chamber. She had done her best to make it inviting. Her blue and white counterpane was on the bed. Her brightest piece of rag carpeting was on the floor, and the white muslin curtains at the windows had been washed and ironed and darned by Sarah Jane's own thrifty hands. Mother Thompson could not know that the room looked to its occupant about the size of the storeroom at home, and that he had never before seen a counterpane, and did not admire this one. He noticed the muslin curtains only to push them wrathfully out of his way as he jerked up both small paned windows, and muttered that they were the size of the hen-coop windows at home. Then he felt of the puffy bed, and uttered a single dismayed word, feathers. His tone and manner Mrs. Thompson would not in the least have understood. There was time for no more discoveries, for he was summoned to the tea-table. Being hungry at last, he thought he had responded with promptness, but the business of eating had already commenced when he reached the dining-room. Two men, both in their shirt-sleeves, were engaged in shoveling down, in Wayne's estimation no other term would have fitted the act, great mouthfuls of potato and turnip warmed up together. "'How do you do?' said Isaiah, nodding his great black head as Wayne entered. "'You're the new teacher, I reckon. Excuse us, we was in an uncommon hurry to-night, Jim and me was. This is Jim Hotchkiss, and your name is, what now? I've got a mighty poor memory for names. Oh, yes, Pearson. Miss Thompson, I reckon you have seen before. Set right down and make yourself at home. We all feel uncommonly at home at this table, don't we, Jim? You must be pretty hungry by this time, continued the genial host, heaping poor Wayne's plate high with the obnoxious potato and turnip. Didn't want no dinner, mother said. Homesick a little, I reckon. That ain't no discredit to a boy who's gone away from a good home. Come fur? Good land! A thousand miles! Whatever possessed you? What, indeed! Wayne could only be thankful that the blacksmith gave him no time to reply. Well, you've come to a country where there's plenty to eat and plenty to do. Seen Sarah Jane? Haven't, eh? Well, now, I reckoned that you and Sarah Jane was pretty good friends by this time. Where is she, mother? 
why he just came in a little bit ago and sarah jane's in the back kitchen fussing she's been fussing the live long afternoon over his room gettin it to her mind young folks is full of notions nowadays this was not said in irritation but with a sort of motherly pride as though a woman who had a daughter like sarah jane could afford to indulge her in all manners of notions a door in the near distance opened and the subject of this explanation entered a wholesome-looking girl some persons would have called her with clear honest eyes and very red cheeks the color being heightened in effect by the dress she wore hallo shouted her father you've come have you i didn't know but you was going to stay in the back kitchen all night this is your fellow sufferer mr oh yes in obedience to an admonition from his wife that she tried to make undertone professor pearson i forgot i don't know whether jim and me can twist our tongues to that many times a day eh jim i'm blessed if i ain't afraid i'll forget sometimes and say sonny instead you look so uncommon young professor this is my girl my sarah jane and she's a spry one i can tell you you'll have to get up early in the morning to get ahead of her think you and her can hit it off together i'll tell you what i guess you'll have to get her to do most of the walloping she's got more strength in her arms i bet than you have now pa came in protest from sarah jane but her voice was not harsh and was brimful of daughterly affection as well as of suppressed mirth there are young men who would have been able to have met the jolly blacksmith halfway to have discovered at once that he meant no offence and was simply laboring in his blunt half embarrassed fashion to make the young stranger feel at home wayne pearson was not of that type of young manhood or at least he could not at that time rise to the situation his penetration was not at fault he recognized in the honest blacksmith a mere effort to be funny but his annoyance and disgust at fun or friendliness of that sort were unbounded he had never before come in contact with such persons and he realized that he did not in the least know how to meet them sarah jane came bravely to the rescue seating herself near her father she began and kept up throughout the meal a running fire of repartee with him parrying his thrusts at herself and turning the point of the remark back upon him with a quickness and keenness that it was plain the blacksmith intensely admired and calling forth huge guffaws of laughter from the insufferable jim whenever his mouth was sufficiently empty to admit of that exercise wayne in thinking it over afterward was compelled to own to himself that the girl was bright and quick-witted and his conscience made him add that neither had she been coarse but he revenged himself by adding sharply that he detested her and the entire tribe as well and that it would be simply impossible for him to endure life in the same house with such people the meal however had been abundant and notwithstanding the turnip in the potatoes remarkably good despite the coarseness of the napery and the thickness of the dishes even despite the three tined steel forks and the fact that both the blacksmith and jim disdained forks altogether and ate with their knives wayne found himself making a fairly good meal had he but been wise enough to realize his mercies the bread and butter and milk and cream and the general air of cleanliness and neatness were such as to give him abundant reason to feel that the lines had fallen to him in fairly comfortable places he felt no such thing he was dismayed even terror-stricken over everything and put himself into the depths of that terrible feather bed with a groan very like despair end of chapter nine chapter ten of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten wayne lorimer pearson saturday morning was entirely occupied in writing a letter 
Wayne Pearson, who was accustomed to expressing himself on paper, and who had reputation for being able to do it with clearness and elegance, had never spent so much time nor wasted so much paper on a letter in his life. His little room was all but carpeted with discarded sheets, containing the words, Dear Father, and two or three, or sometimes half a dozen, lines besides. When at last he enveloped and sealed his effort, assuring himself that it was the best he could do, he was far from satisfied. Reading it over years afterward, one cannot wonder at his dissatisfaction. It read thus. Dear Father, I hope you have suffered no anxiety on my account. I should have written sooner, but circumstances prevented. It is needless to tell you that I obeyed to the letter your last directions, and took myself out of your sight. I have known for a long time that, for reasons which I only in part understand, my presence was growing daily more disagreeable to you, and I long ago planned to relieve you permanently so soon as I should graduate from college. I regret more than words will express that I was not able to complete my college course before starting out in life for myself. To this end I have borne in silence all sorts of misjudgings, and have for years endured a system of petty tyranny that seemed to me at times beyond endurance. But in view of our last interview, I have no doubt you will agree with me that the time arrived when I had no alternative but to go. I came directly to the town and state from which I mail this letter, and have been fortunate enough to secure work at once. The school of which I have been made the head is to open on Monday next. A misunderstanding on the part of the teacher who was to have filled the place created an unexpected vacancy by which I profited. I am, therefore, pecuniarily independent as regards the future, and I can only regret that I am quite unable at present to repay you for the heavy expense that I have been to you through the years. The time may come when I shall be able to do so. I think I need not assure you that I will keep that end in view. I have gone over in careful detail, many times indeed, the last words you spoke to me during our interview in the library, and am at this date as much in a fog as to your possible meaning as I was at that time. Why I should need to plot to divert suspicion from myself is a mystery, and although you informed me in sufficiently distinct language that I was the guilty one, you failed to reveal to me my guilt. I certainly considered all this a strange reward for my honest, though evidently mistaken, effort to keep a semblance of peace in our ruined family life. It is not, I believe, my nature to boast of my own character or attainments, but the circumstances are peculiar, and you will therefore pardon me for saying that I find it hard to understand how a son who has sustained the reputation for character and scholarship that I certainly have during my entire college course should be the source of disappointment and grief that your words and manner clearly intimated. However, I know, and have known for years, that I have a bitter enemy who has secured your private ear and managed to make me appear to you what I am not. It is not my intention to burden you with details. I have tried to be in every respect what a son should be, and in your estimation I have failed. The least that I could do under such circumstance was to take myself out of your sight, and I have accordingly done it. If you care to hear from me, I will keep you posted from time to time as to my success or failure in life, and I shall remain always as now, your sincere and well-meaning son, Wayne Lorimer Pearson. There shall be no attempt to make excuses for this letter other than to say, what seems unnecessary, that its writer was still fiercely angry. Had he waited a week longer, it might, undoubtedly it would, have been a better-sounding letter. But a curious undertone realization of his father's genuine anxiety as to his whereabouts kept him from waiting, 
although it did not keep him from quoting and requoting the words that had stabbed him and making them as painful to his father as he could the letter was indeed a revelation of the power that anger has over the judgment as well as over the affections if one cares to study it in that light it will be remembered that during his prolonged interview with himself in the woods the day before wayne pearson had frankly owned that he had been a fool that he had caught up his father's hasty words and attached an importance to them that they did not possess and had allowed himself to run away from home like any story-book idiot but to save his life he could not have expressed any thought of this kind on paper the moment he wrote those familiar words dear father the demon of passion seemed to perch at his elbow and move his pen it made him ignore all the patience and faithfulness and lavish expenditure of the years and ring the changes only on that last scene while the father was evidently smarting under some sting that made him for the moment beside himself it is too bad these reckless boys how carelessly they stab the time may come when wayne pearson as a father will learn from bitter experience something of his father's pain but at that time he could think only of his own pain still as has been said he was dissatisfied with the letter after it was gone there were points in it of which he was ashamed and which he would have recalled if he could especially did he realize that that parade of his full name wayne lorimer pearson was to say the least in extremely bad taste why need he have reminded his father just then that he was the grandson of old judge lorimer a name still spoken throughout the country neighborhood of which he had been its autocrat almost with bated breath his father had not joined in the general admiration of judge lorimer on certain legal questions they had differed and at times differed sharply and wayne had more than once heard his father say when reminded that his son bore a striking resemblance to the old judge that he hoped he would not be like his grandfather in every respect wayne knew that he was like his grandfather in character and prided himself on it under those circumstances it was especially silly to have taken up nearly a line in spreading out his full name before his father he had gone down to the kitchen to ask some questions about the mails with the letter in his hand and had found there the worthy blacksmith shaving his bristling chin before the kitchen glass been writing to your father he asked sociably as his keen eye took in at a glance the name on the envelope written in wayne's boldest hand i always had a notion that the young fellows wrote first to their mothers but i must say i like to see them think of their fathers too my mother is dead said wayne briefly oh is that so sho i oughtn't to have spoken about mothers i'm always putting my foot in it there was such genuine sympathy in mr thompson's tone that even a preoccupied young man like wayne could not but feel it and he forced a smile as he said that no harm had been done you've got a good father i'll warrant continued the blacksmith anxious to atone for a blunder i can see it all over you that you've been well brought up and i dare say your father is that proud of you that he don't know how to stand it sometimes i would be i know if i had a boy like you daughters are all well enough here he gave a comical wink of one eye toward sarah jane who was skillfully putting together materials for a gingerbread but i tell you there's nothing like sons to make a father proud you hold on to your father young man and write to him often and tell him every little thing you do or don't do a boy don't commonly have but one good father in a lifetime and they are worth taking trouble for you'll excuse my calling you a boy you look so terrible young i'm blessed if i ain't afraid that the youngsters will forget and be calling you one of the boys sarah jane you'll have to tend up to em and make em understand what's what i kind of suspicioned that he hadn't got any mother 
said Mrs. Thompson, as Wayne turned abruptly and left the room. He looks so kind of sad all the time. I don't know but I might call it gloomy. I wonder if he lost her only a spell ago. I feel dreadful sorry for him, away off here among strangers, and he so young. Professor Pearson, why, I'm afraid I should laugh if I tried to say it. I guess I'll get along without calling him anything, for a spell at least. But I mean to try to mother him up a little. I wonder if he likes custard pie. You better save your petting, mother, for folks that will appreciate it said Sarah Jane, briskly, as she whisked the completed gingerbread into the oven. He looks downright masterful to me. He may be young, but if he doesn't know what he is about, I'll miss my calculation. I don't believe he wants any cuddling, not from us, anyhow. He'll see to it that the young ones call him professor or anything else he wants them to, or take the consequences." In ignorance of all these opinions concerning him, and in supreme indifference as to what the Thompson family thought about anything, Wayne got through with Saturday. He visited the schoolhouse and found it very different from the college buildings with which he was familiar. Still, it wasn't a bad schoolhouse in its way, and the young man succeeded in becoming somewhat interested in it. He meant to do his best for the scholars committed to his care. It is true, he told himself, that he had been forced into teaching before he was ready, and compelled to take that which offered, rather than what he would have chosen, but the pupils should not suffer in consequence. By evening he had forced himself to admit that he must ask for a conference with Sarah Jane, and learn from her what he could about his new surroundings. She accepted the invitation with alacrity, and led the way to the parlor, which Wayne had not seen before. It was a large, dreary-looking room, immaculate as to neatness, but the wallpaper was a distinct blue, while the new ingrain carpet was in vivid green, plentifully bestrewn with red flowers. The few pictures on the walls Wayne pronounced atrocious, and the mantel ornaments were, if possible, worse than the pictures yet Sarah Jane had spent the entire afternoon in trying to make the room assume the proper air for a parlor, and flattered herself that she had succeeded. She had robbed her own little room of its single ornament, a wreath of hair flowers set in a glass frame, and it now occupied the place of honor in the center of the mantel. She could not have understood the feeling of utter disgust that Wayne Pearson had for it, Neither was he able, in the least, to appreciate the little thrill of elation that Sarah Jane felt, as he took the Rochester burner from her hand and set it on the table, then drew the window shades and pushed forward the large willow rocker for her use, while he helped himself to a straight back chair on the other side of the table. Sarah Jane was not accustomed to young men who took such small burdens as lamps from her hands, nor who offered her a seat, and themselves remained standing until she was seated. She had not been accustomed to these things, but she liked them. They seemed a legitimate part of the masterful world to which this young man belonged. She had no objection whatever to securing glimpses of it through him. "'I shall have to look to you for a good deal of help in getting acquainted with my work,' he said, and his manner was more genial and friendly than it had been before. You have the advantage of me in having already taught in the school, while I am a novice as well as a stranger. Sarah Jane laughed. Oh, I didn't have much to do with the girls and boys who belong to your room, she said. I only taught the young ones. I did have a grammar class, though, from that room. Professor Smith gave it to me last term, because he was too lazy to take it himself. If there was ever a man too lazy to breathe, it was Professor Smith. But I didn't mind, I liked the class. I think grammar is nicer than anything else, anyhow. Don't you like to parse? I believe I did rather enjoy it at one time, said Wayne, trying not to have his smile too pronounced. 
I fancy I shall not especially enjoy teaching grammar, however. If I should develop as lazy a nature as your friend, Mr. Smith, am I to understand that you will take the class again? Sarah Jane's laugh this time had a touch of sarcasm in it. You aren't lazy, she said, whatever else you are. I don't believe there is a lazy hair in your head. And Professor Smith is no friend of mine. I detested him. But of course I will do whatever I am given to do. There's a hard lot of boys in the school. A few of them I just feel as though I should like to get hold of. Are they such hard fellows to manage? said Wayne, with a smile that he feared was sickly. He felt that the last thing in life that he wanted to do was to get hold of such boys. Well, no, said Sarah Jane thoughtfully. I can't say that they are. Not if they were managed right, which they haven't been, according to my way of thinking. I don't know as you will agree with me, but it always seems as though boys ought to be treated like human beings that had some rights and did some thinking now and then, instead of either like wild animals or fools. Don't you think so? I should think that there could not be two opinions about that, said Wayne, with a sudden accession of respect for Sarah Jane. He had imagined her as wanting to get hold of some of those boys with her muscular young arms, and try the effect of that walloping at which her father had hinted, and lo, she was speaking of a moral hold. There's Beat Armitage now, continued Sarah Jane. He's the ringleader. What he doesn't do, he gets credit of doing, so in the end it comes to the same thing. Beat is expected to be bad first, last, and always, and he hasn't the courage to disappoint people, so he lives up to their expectations. That's the way it looks to me. I've always said that I didn't think Beat had half a chance at home nor anywhere else, and if a boy don't get his rights at home, why, how can he expect to get them anywhere? That is true, said Wayne, a shadow crossing his face at the thought of his home and his lost rights. What is the matter with Beat's home? What an extraordinary name he has, by the way. Can that be his full name? End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Bethune Breckenridge Armitage. No, said Sarah Jane, it isn't half of it. He's got name enough, too much of it. Bethune Breckenridge Armitage, that's the whole of it. And when Beat is up to any extra piece of mischief, he is sure to write the full name out large somewhere. A sudden flush of color mounted to Wayne's very temples. He shaded his eyes ostensibly from the Rochester burner, but in reality from Sarah Jane. He had been unpleasantly reminded just then of Wayne Lorimer Pearson spread over that page. But for short we call him Beat, and that is what he gets most of the time from teachers and everybody though we did have a teacher once who thought that teachers oughtn't to use nicknames. What do you think about it? Wayne gave an evasive answer, and asked another question about Beat, and Sarah Jane, who had arrested her rocking chair to get his opinion of nicknames, considered his evasion thoughtfully for a moment, then resumed her rocking and her narrative. Why, Beat has an uncomfortable home, I suppose, I never thought he was altogether to blame. I think in most cases like that there is blame on both sides. You see, it is a mixed-up family. Beat has a half-brother, or, well, a kind of a half-brother, his stepmother's son, a regular molly coddle of a boy who has spent his life whining and complaining of Beat and getting him into trouble. He's smart, Joey is, in his way and he has managed somehow to pull the wool over Beat's father's eyes, and he is a stern kind of man, Mr. Armitage is, and the consequence is, 
beat gets all the scoldings and whippings and none of the fun and the village people meddle and make things worse beat's got a bad name around town you see the boy is so brimful of mischief that he can't keep out of it and he's played a joke of some kind on pretty nearly every man and woman in the country round so they are ready to believe everything bad that they can of him and his stepmother is willing to furnish all the material they want don't you see how it might be then the boys in school and girls too are so used to hearing him blamed that they join in and help if anything goes wrong no matter what the cry is right away that beat armitage is at the bottom of it and some of the things i believe in my heart he is as innocent of as a baby but you can't prove that and so he is getting hardened beat is i just expect that boy will go to ruin unless somebody steps in and helps him and it seems too bad he is a nice-looking boy as ever was when he is in good humor wayne's face needed shading still there was certainly contrast enough between beat's position and his yet there were points of similarity that could not fail to interest him was he possibly to be given a chance to study his own life problems as they presented themselves to others he was painfully interested in beat yet he did not want to show too much of it he studied how to word his questions in a way to give his assistant no hint of other interest than that of a teacher but she did not wait for questions her interest was evidently keen and sincere there's one thing about beat she began again after a thoughtful pause that seems to me to be in the way of doing anything for him it's a regular stumbling block he isn't over sixteen years old not a day but i tell you he can hate like a man of sixty and if he doesn't just about hate that half-brother of his why then i don't know the meaning of the word i never saw anything like it not in a young fellow why i believe he would kill the boy if he could get a good chance without any more hesitation than he would have for a worm snake he says old slimy slippery snake he oughtn't to be allowed to live and i hate myself for letting him do it and he looks while he is saying it so fierce and so full of hate that i declare i'm sometimes afraid he will be left to do something dreadful well you can see what kind of a school we are likely to have with a boy like him and a boy like his brother to keep us in hot water half the time i oughtn't to have told you about it i suppose but i don't want you to get scared out before you begin and i did want somebody to come along who would help poor beat i was glad when the other fellow gave us the slip he didn't look of the right sort to do it am i allowed to hope that i look of the right sort a playful response seemed to wane the only one that could be made but sarah jane took it seriously enough i don't know she said with an air of penetrative thoughtfulness i can't make up my mind he needs a master beat does and i guess you could be that if you took the notion but then some kinds of masters would only hurry him on to ruin himself for some reason wayne felt uncomfortable under the gaze of her keen eyes he did not wish to have his inner motives dissected he made haste to change the subject and get on more general ground i shall evidently have to make bethune a subject of special study now as to other matters how has the work been planned heretofore i do not wish to make too many innovations just at first why i don't know as there has been much plan except the regular thing you know we all come into the big room first thing every morning for prayers and then i took my youngsters out and managed them by myself as best i could mr smith didn't give me any help i can tell you he was too lazy for that first thing he had was but wayne's attention had been called to a more important subject than mr smith he could distinctly feel the waves of color surging over his face 
as he asked the question, does the school always open with, with religious exercises? Mercy, yes. You don't suppose we are heathen, do you, because we live out west? We have prayers every morning as regular as we have spelling and arithmetic. Deacon Coulter would look after us in a hurry if we didn't. It is the only thing he is particular about. He's a good man, the deacon is, but he's awful ignorant. And this Mr. Smith, did he conduct the service? Why, of course. There wasn't anybody but him and me to do it. Oh, the deacon comes in once in a while in time for prayers, and I used to be real glad to see him. The deacon can pray, I tell you, as though he meant it, and he does every time. Mr. Smith never asked him to read in the Bible but once. He's a terrible reader, and Mr. Smith thought he could read elegantly. Well, he could, but his prayers didn't amount to shucks. What is the matter with you, Mr. Pearson? Your face got just as red, and now it is pale. You ain't sick, are you? Mother could give you something if you don't feel well. She's a master hand at nursing people up. I am perfectly well, thank you, said Wayne, with unnecessary hauteur. I am interested in learning all about this matter. Do I understand you that it is a rule of the school to open each session with some religious service? What I mean is, do the board of trustees require it? Why, of course, don't they always? Even Squire Willard, who isn't much on practicing religion, some folks think, wants the school children brought up all right. For that matter, he wants everything done that they do down to Westover. Hasn't he talked Westover to you yet? Why, Mr. Pearson, do you really mean that they don't have prayers in college? Oh, yes, certainly. And Wayne felt that his face was growing red again but in college there are generally clergymen among the professors. Oh, well, I shouldn't think they would need a clergyman just to open school with a short prayer. You are one of that kind, aren't you? A clergyman? Oh, no, indeed. It was Sarah Jane's turn to blush to the very roots of her hair. I know that, she said with an embarrassed laugh. You don't suppose I took a boy like you for a minister, do you? but I mean you belong to the kind of people who know how to pray. Aren't you a member of the church? I have not that honor. Is that one of the requisites demanded by the deacon you mentioned? No, said Sarah Jane very slowly. I don't know as it is. Fact is, I never thought about it. I supposed all teachers were church members though I'm not one of those folks that think joining the church is everything. I should have liked Mr. Smith better if he hadn't been a professor. It would have been more honest, because it didn't appear to mean anything with him. But I had a notion that you... She came to a distinct stop, and seemed not to mind Wayne's eyes fixed searchingly upon her. There was a silence for so long that he felt compelled to assist her. Yes, he said insinuatingly, you thought I was not a clergyman, but... Sarah Jane drew a long sigh and brought her eyes back from the floor to his face. Yes, she said, I thought you was one of that sort, a praying man, and if you aren't, I'm awfully sorry, because, I tell you honestly, I don't believe anybody else can do a thing for Beat Armitage. He's got so far along on the wrong road, and has such a feeling of hate in his heart for that tormentor of his, that nothing but a new heart altogether is going to do him any good. And I thought a young man and a stranger might... Well, there's no use in talking, but you'll have to manage morning prayers somehow. We can all rattle over the Lord's Prayer together, I suppose." That is what Mr. Smith did whenever he felt particularly lazy, or when he felt so cross and scolded so much just beforehand that he could see himself that his prayers didn't match his life. I never liked saying the Lord's Prayer in concert some way. The youngsters get in the habit of rattling it off so carelessly, you know, that it doesn't seem like praying, 
but it's better than nothing i suppose wayne interrupted her with dignity we shall be able to arrange all that to our satisfaction i hope miss thompson but now let me learn if i can just what class of scholars we have to deal with and just what has been accomplished heretofore he drew a notebook and pencil from his pocket and began to write rapidly while sarah jane was put through a systematic list of questions that kept her wits keenly at work to give satisfactory answers and increased her respect for a college education didn't he put me through though she said to her father who listened with the keenest relish to her account of the evening's interview i tell you that young fellow knows what he is about i shouldn't wonder if we'd have such teaching in this district as we never had before if he does look like nothing but a boy it's a great thing to have a college education father yes said the blacksmith so tis but it's a great thing to have uncommon sense too i'll risk you sarah jane don't you go to being down in the mouth because you ain't college educated you've done the best you could and you ain't as old as methuselah yet who knows but you will get an addition tacked on to your education some day it was the good blacksmith's dream to give this girl of his not only a college education but the best that life had to give to any girl meantime the boy with the college education went upstairs in no enviable frame of mind it was all very well to put on a brave face before sarah jane and awe her with questions about textbooks and language lessons and the vertical system and other technical words and phrases that were as a b c to him but were new and bewildering to her the fact remained that he was simply appalled with the magnitude of the duties that lay before him he sank into the side of the feather bed and tried to think how he should manage about those opening exercises he lead in a service of prayer above all other efforts the thought of the lord's prayer dismayed him whatever else he might be he assured himself positively that he was not a hypocrite and could such as he repeat each morning those solemn words forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors had he forgiven leon did he even care to forgive him had he any expectation or intention of trying to do so no assuredly he did not on the contrary he distinctly intended at some time in his life to repay the villain with interest for all the injury and pain he had caused him the mode of payment would be refined dignified such as a gentleman might indulge but it should nevertheless be keen and deep reaching and he was sufficiently well educated theologically to be sure that it would not be in accord with the spirit of the lord's prayer he and beat it seemed were in the same condition beat could no more truthfully offer the lord's prayer than he could himself why should the superstitions of an ignorant deacon or two force them to it yet sarah jane had been very emphatic and it seemed altogether probable that such an innovation as a school carried on without any form of religious service would not be tolerated in this community sarah jane well informed though she certainly was on many points had not even heard it seemed that there were schools conducted without any reference to the forms of religion the thought occurred to him that the way of escape might be to put this duty off upon her shoulders he smiled a cynical smile as he told himself that undoubtedly she was one of that kind then he laughed as he imagined her consternation over such a proposal that would be infinitely worse than the lazy mr smith had done she had made it very apparent that the professor and no other was the one who was expected to lead in such a service what was to be done the longer he thought about it the more dismayed he grew as he heard the distant rumble of a long freight train crawling through the town a wild desire to pack his bag and slip softly out at the unguarded front door and board that train 
came to him with such force that he half arose from the billows of feathers that had closed around him to be free once more to bid good-bye to the red schoolhouse that he was afraid he hated to have nothing to do with the burly blacksmith and the insufferable jim to assume no responsibility toward beat and his molly coddle brother to be stabbed no more by sarah jane's keen-cut phrases that she did not know were stabs it was a tremendous temptation he might do it dignifiedly he might even wait until monday morning and then call upon squire willard and assure him that after giving the matter careful consideration he had decided that he was not fit to cope with the peculiarities of the upper district it was really the thought of his predecessor who had failed them that held this young man a prisoner why did mr jenkins fail to keep his engagement with you he had suddenly thought to ask of the blacksmith while they were at supper and the answer had been full and emphatic got a bigger chance somewhere else that's the reason made an out and out engagement put it in black and white and had his box of books sent on ahead and all that and then gave us the slip it wasn't till after the school had ought to have took up that he was heard from and then he owned up that he could get a whole dollar a week more in another district that he knew of and he thought it his duty to go there his duty sho i hate to see a man do a thing as mean as pusley and then whine about duty what become of his promises isn't a man's word good for nothing i'd like to know i'm a poor man and always expect to be and i have to think about dollars as careful as anybody i reckon but i've never seen the time and i hope i never shall when for a dollar a week i can afford to go back on my word his name was ezra too pity to waste a good bible name that way he said he had a younger brother to help and must earn all he could sho a fellow who can't be trusted can't help anybody and wayne pearson who had supposed himself utterly indifferent to the entire thompson family discovered that he did not want to bring his character into contempt before the worthy blacksmith he had promised and for one term at least he must endure End of chapter 11chapter twelve of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the way out reaching the conclusion he had it was like wayne pearson to face the situation manfully and set himself seriously at work to discover if possible an honourable way out of this undeniable dilemma there were three ways out and one of them lay uphill he stated the propositions to himself first the custom of opening the school with religious exercises might be abandoned second a minister or deacon might be engaged to come in each morning and conduct the service third he must do it himself he discussed these different plans at some length examining pros and cons the summing up was something like this the first scheme might be difficult of accomplishment it would probably antagonize the religious prejudices and thus be unwise even if consent from the trustees could be secured the second plan also was beset with objections if he should engage a sort of chaplain he might be late occasionally or some mornings not appear at all then embarrassments would necessarily follow there was danger, too, that such an arrangement might lose him the respect of the school and the community, and his own self-respect as well. Moreover, there was a ludicrous side to hiring a man to do his praying. It was not to be thought of. There remained this, then. He himself must lead a daily religious service in the school. He would not allow himself to argue the point, even. It had to be done, and he must do it. The problem now was, how? He arose from his enervating feather seat, 
and began to pace the floor with knitted brows and arms folded rigidly behind him. While he pondered, he was conscious of an undercurrent of irritating thought going on, as if an exasperating somebody were buzzing in his ears, reminding him, in the words of the old proverb, that he had jumped from the frying pan into the fire, and that, though he had got out of one set of troubles for the present by running away, he had plunged into others, greater? Not by any means. These could be met and conquered, he told himself, and it began to look after a time as if he had reached some satisfactory conclusions, for he prepared for rest with the air of one who has settled something, saying to himself as he was falling asleep, if only school did not open Monday, I could manage it nicely with another week before me. School did not open Monday, and the young teacher had a struggle with his conscience not to feel delight thereat. That very night a merciless storm swept through the valley, uprooting trees and damaging buildings. The only roof that was lifted clean off and laid down in a matter, in the language of one of the villagers, was that of the schoolhouse. It was queer, the trustees told each other, as they stood in dismay about the wrecked building, that this particular roof should be the one to fly off. Looks most as if Providence had something agin us, a sour-faced man remarked. School art to had took up a month ago, and here, just as we get all ready, off goes the roof. No tellin' how long we'll be hindered now. For a week at least, I hope was the mental comment of the teacher-elect, as he stood with the others, surveying the ruin the storm had wrought. "'Miss Thompson,' Wayne began one evening after supper, when order had been restored to the large room, which served both as dining and sitting-room. "'You needn't, Miss Thompson, me,' that young woman disclaimed. "'La, yes,' her mother imposed. "'Sarah Jane'd hardly know who you meant.' Miss Sarah, then. How will that do? And then Sarah Jane had a swift dawning perception that the world to which this young man belonged counted it more refined to use one name rather than two, and she had a twinge of regret that she had not long ago insisted upon being called either Jane or Sarah. Sarah will do, she said, and you may leave off the miss but Wayne had no intention of leveling all walls of formality and putting himself on terms of such intimacy as this would imply. Did singing form a part of the opening exercises in the school? he asked. No, we tried it a while, but Professor Smith didn't sing more than a frog, and there wasn't any one to lead. Are there any good voices among the pupils? Oh, yes, Beat's got a splendid voice, and Joe sings too and plays the violin. Ruby knows she sings like a nightingale. Wayne had heard some stirring notes from Sarah Jane herself as she moved briskly about in the morning. Why did not you or the nightingale girl lead? He never asked us to lead. He thought a girl couldn't do anything anyway. I notice you have an organ in the other room. Suppose we ask a few of the older scholars to come in tomorrow evening and sing, if your mother is willing. Oh, I can't play yet, Sarah Jane demurred, and I don't know anybody who can, on the organ. I only took lessons a little while, and can just pick out a few tunes. I'll do the playing, Wayne said, if you'll help sing. Filled with admiration at thought of a man who could play the organ, both mother and daughter hastened to express their delight at the proposal, Mrs. Thompson adding, in an underflow of generosity, "'Just you use that great lazy room whenever you like.' Accordingly, the next evening saw Beat and Joe Armitage, with a half-dozen others, gathered about the organ in Mrs. Thompson's front room, where the new teacher played and led the singing." They were shy at first of the new professor, those boys and girls, but when they saw that he threw his whole self into it, and played and sang with spirit, 
they found courage to let out their voices and call for favorite hymns or songs, the organist, with or without notes, playing them promptly. Dixie, Swanee River, Star-Spangled Banner, and Robin Adair, up to Coronation and other stately old airs of their fathers. The singing was not artistic. It was better. It filled both performers and listeners with delight, the latter consisting of Mr. and Mrs. Thompson and Jim, who nodded approvingly and whispered, my, but he's a smart chap. It was not by any means for his own amusement that Wayne had gathered this singing company, though he did have an object, two of them. One was to train singers for the school, the other looked to the establishment of friendly relations between himself and the older pupils. What his reserved nature had most dreaded in this undertaking was contact with lawlessness he realized that it would not be an easy matter for one not many years the senior of some of them to establish authority without a certain amount of conflict, unless he could by some means forestall possible rebellion and make those pupils his friends. And surely it seemed as though the question of subduing the worst boy in school was far toward being solved that night. Beat loved music and when he was assured that he had a fine bass voice which needed only cultivation to make it first class, his secret delight knew no bounds. Added to this, when the master did not put on airs as if he knew it all, but asked his opinion occasionally, why then Beat was prepared to champion the new teacher whom he beforehand threatened to thrash. It was cause for pride too, in Beat's mind, that the upper district had a teacher straight from college, who, with all the rest he knew, could play the organ and sing one part as well as another. Westover couldn't go ahead of that. He had stopped singing himself at times to hear the professor's wonderful tenor, perhaps gliding into soprano, and from that to bass, according to their needs. Yes, he was even willing to call him professor now, though he had scornfully declared on the day of his arrival that he never would, because he was nothing but a boy. But now, by those marvellous gifts, he was worthy of all honour. Indeed, Beat was in the way of becoming a hero-worshipper when a day or two later the teacher accepted from him an invitation to a ball-game, and seemed well up in all the ins and outs thereof. Moreover, he had called him not beat, nor Bethune, which he hated, but Armitage. When a fellow got called like that, he was next door to being a man. The conquest of the others who had met to sing was also assured, for greatly to their delight they were invited to consider themselves a part of a school choir to meet regularly for practice and instruction. They would begin at once, and while they waited for the schoolhouse, would improve the time and sing every evening. The zest with which he entered into this work, and the interest inspired by his pupils, surprised the teacher himself. He drew them into conversation after the singing hour each night, studying them meanwhile curiously, as if all were rare specimens in biology. The bright ones sprung questions upon him which he might have been puzzled to answer had he not been an omnivorous reader with fine memory. As it was, the prompt replies, combining instruction with fun, charmed them into admiration and hearty good will. In all this there was no overstepping the line between teacher and pupil. Wayne's natural dignity precluded that, as well as their reverence for his knowledge. Work upon the schoolhouse went on but slowly, the roof being so badly wrecked that a new one had been found necessary. Rain also added to the delay. Meantime, Wayne was by no means idle. He made calls, studied all sorts of theories for conducting a model school, and sent for many things he considered necessary to its success, chief among which was a cabinet organ. An old friend of his father was a dealer in musical instruments in Chicago. Wayne had confidence in his judgment and honesty, 
and wrote asking that a second-hand organ at a certain price be sent him without delay he considered this and some other expenses a necessity if he meant to make his first venture out in the world a success and he did even though the sphere was humble he should do his best when therefore his other prudent self interfered charging him with improvidence he ignored the admonition as youth is prone to do and went on ordering besides several copies of singing books this done he sent home for maps and pictures collected through the years by means of gifts and his own purchases apparently he had forgotten that his stay was to be short in this place and was planning as if for years wayne's first view of the inside of the schoolhouse had been most depressing he had taken in each dismal detail the air of desolation the hacked desks the smoky walls the grimy windows and the indescribable odor adhering to an old schoolroom odors made up of generations of lunches bread and butter and head cheese pie and doughnuts it had seemed to him as if he could not spend months there why should not a place in which young people stayed half of the time be a little better than a barn he confided his desires and ambitions concerning that room to sarah jane asking as the time drew near to occupy it can't we do something to make that place more attractive this was a new idea no teacher had ever suggested the like before the boys would just rack it around and spoil everything if we did sarah jane answered after reflection oh no i think not i was a boy not so long ago and i didn't do those things you and the girl put an emphasis on the word as if language failed to express the immeasurable distance between him and them well we can make it clean anyway she said alertly i'll go right off and get the girls to come and help certain college men would have opened their eyes wide in astonishment could they have seen their elegant classmate actually carrying water for a company of girls who swept and scrubbed and scoured till windows and desks and floors testified to the virtues of soap and water and strength the trustees had hired the walls whitened thanks to the energies and insistence of sarah jane now that young woman said to her helpers as they started for home that night he thinks all's done that's going to be let's surprise him a bit what if we get some shades for those staring windows how many will take a paper and go round and raise enough to buy em i'll give a dollar it's got to be done tomorrow and the next day they must be bought and put up each girl promised and began that very night to coax money out of everybody they met as only girls can the outcome of those days of hard work was that the saturday night before the opening of school saw a transformation in the old place the windows were clothed in neat shades the teacher's desk stood on a large square of bright carpeting the stove shone in blackness and in each window was a plant choice treasures culled from many homes the assistant teacher brought a pot of pinks filled with buds and a monthly rose these graced the professor's desk it remained now for him to do his part toward beautifying securing beats help that evening they went to the schoolhouse with great secrecy a rush of surprise and delight came over him when he saw what had been done though reared in luxury he keenly appreciated these homely efforts he noticed that the room of his assistant though clean was utterly bare she had herself managed that all the brightness should go to his room the unselfish kindness touched him and when the pictures were unpacked he hastened to hang upon the walls of the small room a lovely madonna and two gay little water colors when the organ was set up and the walls covered with maps and pictures it really seemed an exceedingly cheerful pleasant place and the young teacher turned the key with a sense of satisfaction even elation 
which he would not have thought possible for him when first he surveyed that ungainly building, the Red Schoolhouse. Among the books Wayne had ordered was one rather new to him. Its title was The Book of Common Prayer. He sat down to examine it with eagerness. It was to be an important factor in smoothing the way about those opening exercises. While he felt that he could not honestly repeat the Lord's Prayer with that one searching clause over which he stumbled, he had yet no hesitancy in going as far as he could consistently. He was willing and glad, he argued, to acknowledge God as sovereign of the universe, the father and protector of mankind, the one from whom all blessings flow, and deserving of honor, praise, and gratitude. He was not even averse to confessing a sense of unworth in a general way, but the story of the atoning sacrifice was to him as an idle tale. He had not yet apprehended Christ, like that other young man of old, whom the master loved but sent on his way sorrowing. Certainly there could be nothing wrong in reading prayers, Wayne told himself, inasmuch as it was practiced by a large evangelical denomination, and neither would it be irreverent to omit the parts he could not conscientiously repeat when it was but the composition of a man. Why should he not make use of this book? Why should he when his training had been in another direction? The young man did not like to go deep into this question. He would have been forced to admit that it seemed a solemn thing to come before God with words of his own, especially when there had been no public profession of allegiance. He was not at home in the language of prayer. Fluent enough on all other themes, his tongue might here forget its cunning, and that that would be most humiliating, settled the question. When the pupils came trooping into school that Monday morning, they stood in open-mouthed amazement. Was this lovely, clean, bright place school? Pictures and plants, and above all, an organ! It would seem that all this had a refining influence at once, for some of the boys went back to wipe their feet. Even the wildest boys forgot their usual pranks on opening day. And no wonder, for when the bell rang, there went Beat and some of his choice spirits to the upper end of the room to special seats set in a half circle about the organ. Evidently their leader had abdicated. When the professor took his seat at the organ and led off in coronation, Joe Armitage's violin joining, when the trained choir burst into song, the teacher's fine voice soaring uppermost, then the whole school, carried away by a wave of enthusiasm, joined with fervor in the grand old hymn and made the rafters ring. Whoever knew we could sing like that? Their triumphant glances said to each other. Then came a speech from the teacher, brief and practical. He asked them to cooperate with him in making this the very best school in the county. He expected to give them a winter of hard work, and would they not promise faithful study and good conduct in return? Let me beg you to bear in mind, he said, that your work is not simply to commit and recite lessons, but to discipline mind and mold character. The few impressive words of the young teacher his face glowing with earnestness, gave to some of them the first glimpse of an idea that every hour spent in that room was of utmost importance and must be accounted for. There followed a short reading of scripture, then the prayer, and not even Sarah Jane, when she heard the words, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us, knew that they came from a prayer book. True, the teacher had a fine memory, and needed not to glance at the book. After this came another hymn, and the opening exercises for that day were over. So much had they been enjoyed that all were sorry when they ended. Formerly this had been the most tedious time of the whole day, and usually devoted to mischief. On this morning they had no leisure to throw even one paper ball 
or twitch the braids of the girl who sat before them. They were singing for dear life out of brand span new books, and listening to a new Bible, for the teacher had chosen a striking lesson, and made it so vivid by correct reading, that it was true, as they said, they never heard it afore. Strangely enough, the teacher enjoyed it more than any of them. Those rough, untaught voices chiming in with fervor, those eager, upturned faces appealed to him. He wanted to help them. He forgot that he had seas of trouble, and that the place was dreary, and that he longed inexpressibly for college life again. This was his school, his kingdom, and he would make it fair and strong. End of chapter 12「Chapter thirteen of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirteen Progress and Problems. There are reasons why one would like to linger over that winter which marked Wayne Pearson's first experience of independent life. In many respects, it was an entirely different winter from the one he had imagined on the first night when he sank among those obnoxious feathers, and, according to his custom, made a mental picture foreshadowing it. To his own unbounded surprise, he found himself thoroughly enjoying his work. More than once, before spring opened, he told himself with little thrills of satisfaction that about one thing he had certainly been right— he was evidently designed for a teacher. His scholars would have agreed with him. As the weeks passed, and the new plans that had been introduced were continually reinforced with others, thus keeping up the pleasant excitement, every boy and girl in the school voted him in their different grades of language a success. Those morning services especially, that were to have been such a trial to the new teacher, became an actual source of pride. The idea of having a trained choir took possession of the leader. He was charmed with the material that he found in the rough, and spent no little time in developing it. Sarah Jane, he told himself, if she had had proper advantages, would have possessed a really remarkable voice. As it was, it was worth cultivating. As for Beat, or Armitage, as he was now being called even by some of the older scholars, Wayne declared that he should have opportunities. He was still only a boy, and, one of these days, he should become such a basso that there would be a satisfaction in hearing himself spoken of as his first teacher. "'Reflected glory,' said the young man to himself, with a laugh so gleeful that it would have astonished his stepmother. "'Why shouldn't I have a little of that, since my own expectations have been nipped in the bud?' He could think this, and still laugh, because he did not put any confidence in such thoughts. His determination to take, one day, such a position in the cultured world as his father would hear of with pride and joy, was never stronger. Of course he would succeed. His home relations, by the way, were peculiar, and deserve special mention. During the five days that had intervened between Wayne Pearson's disappearance and the arrival of that letter which it cost him so much trouble to write, his father had grown old rapidly. His heart was torn with a hundred different anxieties, every one of them enhanced by the fact that his conscience was by no means at rest. He remembered the harsh words that he had last spoken to his son. What if they should be the last that he could ever speak to him? As the days passed, this torture grew, and he went about with so haggard a face and eyes so sunken that his wife was alarmed. He gave almost no attention to his pressing business concerns, but gave himself to trying to find a trace of his son, and yet to do it quietly, in a way that would shield the boy from further exposure of every sort. His visit to the college and his interview with several members of the faculty opened his eyes in a way that did not lessen the pain at his heart. He had been unjust then all the time to his boy, 
and to the trust imposed on him by the boy's dead mother the faculty spoke very plainly the only fault they ever had to find with his son had been this unaccountable absence from his work just at the beginning as they might say of his last important year they had looked to him to do the institution honor he was without exception the finest scholar that had been with them for years what was detaining him the father mentally groaned but offered no outward sign his manner was indirect but dignified he left the officials thinking that some grave family matter about which the keen-brained lawyer did not choose to talk was detaining their favorite pupil for a few days the dean being confronted by his own letter that had caused all the trouble uttered an exclamation of impatient dismay how was it possible that he could have transposed those two names yet that he had done so was evident his apologies and regrets were sincere and profuse but the father scarcely heard them and was so preoccupied with the all-absorbing question where is wayne that he did not take to heart his stepson's downfall as he would otherwise have done indeed throughout the trying experience leon hamilton if he had but known it had excellent reason for being grateful to his brother for once mr pearson allowed his own boy to fill his thoughts to the almost entire exclusion of that other boy to whom he had earnestly tried to be a father as the days passed and he heard nothing the poor father told himself that to hear that his darling was safe with his mother who understood him and had never wronged him would be a relief yet so strange are human hearts that no sooner had he read the letter which at last saved his reason to him than an extraordinary reaction took place wayne was safe then and comfortable and had been all the time that he had paced his room through sleepless nights the letter sounded to him so cold so hard so insolent to talk about paying him for all the expense that had been incurred on his account and to spread his full name wayne lorimer pearson over half a page of his letter oh the father was stabbed infinitely worse than the son meant him to be in fact justice must be done to that boy who did not understand fathers nor know very much after all about human pain he had not meant that sentence about repaying his father as a stab it had been an awkward blundering way of giving expression to a vague fear he had that his father was being pecuniarily embarrassed and a desire to prove to him that his son could not only take care of himself but hoped to be in a position to do more than that so they did not understand each other these two any better than they had for years smarting under the sense of injury that came with the reaction the father replied to the letter he said nothing about those days and nights of agony that all his friends could see had aged him but in words of smooth sarcasm congratulated his son on having a nature that enabled him to cut loose in a moment of time from home and all home ties and helps merely because his father during a time when he was tortured by troubles known only to himself had spoken a few sharp words this after careful consideration was all the reference that he decided to make to the dean's letter and his own misunderstanding and he made the decision in love too since wayne was not and as a student never had been unworthy of his trust why should he pain him by revealing all that had been believed against him wayne of course knew nothing about it so the father argued and need never know let him continue to consider that that last interview referred on his part to the uncomfortable relations between the two young men wayne could not consider himself altogether blameless here though some time perhaps the father told himself he would say to wayne that doubtless he had been often deceived in this regard as he had in the college life but he could not say it then the pain of wayne's letter was too heavy upon him his own was brief and cold though he closed with an assurance that he should always be glad to hear from his son 
and always ready to help him to the extent of his ability, even to the extent of paying all his college expenses as heretofore. Then he said that he would not sign himself Edward Everett Pearson, as he did in very important business letters, but your affectionate father. Wayne had blushed over this, and then he had sighed a long sigh so full of disappointment that had good Mrs. Thompson heard it, she would have hastened to make him a very thick custard pie. He had hoped that his father's letter would throw some light on the strange charges that had been made against him, but it had not. The letter did not anger him, as his had angered his father. He had had time to grow quiet. It simply disappointed him, and he went on misunderstanding. He had decided by this time that he had undoubtedly been a fool to leave home in the way he did, but he believed that having done so, the sensible thing was to stay away and carry out his present trust. "'My father is in financial trouble,' he said as he folded away the letter. "'I am quite sure of it. That probably is the explanation of the troubles known only to himself. Does he think that I will go back and make his burdens heavier? If he had confided in me, I would have lightened them long ago. As it is, the least I can do for him is to support myself. So he wrote again, after a few weeks, a short letter that he tried not to make dignified, but all the time the demon at his shoulder told him that Mrs. Pearson would read it too, and he must have a care what he said, so that she could not twist it to suit her views. And she twisted it with perfect ease. Poor boy, she said with a sigh how angry he is, and how carefully he nurses his rage. He is not wholly to blame. That is like his grandfather, I think you told me. These hereditary traits are so hard to overcome. My poor Leon inherited such a rollicking, fun-loving disposition that I sometimes fear that he will never learn self-control. All his college troubles, you know, have grown out of this disposition to have a good time." Letters were exchanged, but rarely after that. The father was very busy, very weary after business hours, and very much hurt with his son. The stepson had gone wrong, it is true, but he seemed to be really penitent, and was doing better in college, and was very thoughtful for him when at home, while Wayne, here the father sighed, and the son, who was working harder in the red schoolhouse out west than he had worked in college, looked forward steadily to the time when he should be able to help father, and failed each week to help him as he might have done. They do it so often, these wise, foolish boys. The least satisfactory part of Wayne's work was with the boy Armitage, not in the direction that he feared, no more loyal adherent to the new professor could be found in the school than he, and being a leader, he kept the turbulent spirits in admirable subjection, so that the contact with lawlessness, which Wayne had feared, had not to be endured. Young Armitage had never realized, until he came in contact with Wayne, that his powerful voice was for any purpose but to roar through the woods with and frighten little children. Under Wayne's tuition, he was developing a passionate love for music, which went far toward subduing his rough nature. That choir, by the way, became a continued source of interest and delight. It attracted marked attention in the little village that had few objects of general interest. It was Squire Willard who started the custom which soon became a fashion, that of dropping in of a morning to the schoolhouse for prayers. The trained choir was always ready to entertain any guests who came, and the young teacher, who had grown used to his prayer book and could depend on his memory, had ceased to inwardly tremble, even with a dozen guests present, when it fell to his lot to roll off some of the majestic sentences found in his book of prayer. There is no accounting for the conceits which the human conscience will adopt on occasion. Waynes told him, with a logic that he did not stop to refute, that to read from a prayer book, or to formally quote from the ideas of others, 
was very different from speaking, in prayer, words of one's own. He was not being a hypocrite. He was simply leading the devotions of others in some of the grandest words that had been written through the centuries. He began himself to like the sound of them. It was near the holiday vacation that Wayne conceived the idea of training his choir to give a concert in the little town hall, asking for a silver offering at the close, said offering to be used to buy lamps for the schoolhouse, that the debating society which he had formed might have more light on their subjects than they had been able to secure heretofore. The idea met with instant approval on the part of the choir, and when, with infinite pains, the training progressed and culminated in a triumphant finale in the town hall before a delighted audience, the admiration of the townspeople for the prize they had secured knew no bounds. Squire Willard, especially when the teachers from the Westover High School came down to the concert in a body, and expressed themselves as delighted, felt that his cup of pride was full. The next day it overflowed, for the Westover Chronicle gave a detailed account of the concert, and closed with the statement that, Professor Pearson and his matchless company of trained singers, had given the music-loving people in that vicinity such a treat as they are rarely able to enjoy, one indeed that would do credit to any eastern city. What had Squire Willard to wish for after that? Wayne laughed uproariously over the notice, and sent a paper heavily marked to his Aunt Crete, then sat himself down in his study chair to face and study a problem that continually haunted him that boy beat. He was not doing for him what ought to be done. There was nothing that beat did not stand ready to do or give up doing for his sake. He knew that his influence was unbounded, and it was this that troubled him. In numberless ways had beat improved, but he still hated his stepbrother, the Molly Coddle, with all the intensity of his fierce nature, and Wayne was compelled to admit to himself that he sympathized only too heartily with this feeling. He detested Joey with a vigor that deepened as his knowledge of him grew. The weak, half-developed, wholly spoiled boy was as unlike the stalwart athlete, Leon Hamilton, as it was possible for him to be, yet there were points of similarity in the two characters. Joey was what the girls called slippery, he had a way of making his own conduct look angelic, and his brother's the opposite, that was almost admirable in its skill. As Sarah Jane had said, he was sharp. On occasion he was also sly and small, and stopped at no meanness, however minute, that would help him to carry his point. How could such a nature fail to remind Wayne of what he had suffered at the hands of his stepbrother? He wished that Armitage would not come to him for advice, as he constantly did, or for sympathy, which was worse. "'What would you do, Professor? Would you stand such a thing? He's cheating father, too, and that's the meanest of it. Father ought to know. I've done my best to tell him, but he can't understand. I say that fellow ought to be killed. That's the only way out. He'll go on cheating everybody till he is.' He's such an everlasting sneak, though, that I don't know but he would cheat the grave and crawl out of it somehow if he was dead. Armitage, would the dignified young professor say, such talk is unworthy of you. No matter how much of a villain a person may be, you are not called upon to rid the earth of him. Let the hand of justice attend to such matters. Well, now, I wouldn't kill him, of course, I don't mean that kind of talk, you know. But what I say is that he ought to be come up with somehow. Don't you think so? Say, I've been thinking about a plan. And then would follow a careful outline of a scheme designed to bring the obnoxious Joey into humiliating prominence in the direction where he would most feel it. A scheme so keen and requiring such skill and courage to carry it out that Wayne, who was sure that a word from him would set it in motion, could not help admiring the brightness of it all, but he would gravely shake his head. 
no armitage don't do that it isn't gentlemanly you can't afford for the sake of a little revenge to give up being a gentleman you know on account of your own self-respect let the whole thing pass and armitage with something between a groan and a grimace would mutter that he was afraid it would kill him to be a gentleman all the time if that serpent had got to live but he would turn away and wayne would know that he had once more conquered but deep within his own heart could be heard distinctly the undertone you have only conquered the surface you are not using your influence as you might there were others besides himself who knew this and wayne knew that they knew it sarah jane had only admiration for the brilliant young professor who had won even beat armitage but her father the keen-eyed blacksmith shook his head and said sorrowfully i wished he'd win his heart into the right place it's all outside sarah jane and won't last something in line with the same thought he expressed to wayne then there was jim that insufferable jim who used his knife at all times when he shouldn't and who made a fearful sound with his lips when he ate as though his soup plate were filled with f's and s's and who in countless other ways irritated the nerves of the professor jim said solemnly one day what beat wants is somebody that'll show him how to get rid of the devil in his own heart if that can't be done i wouldn't give shucks for beat's life no matter how much he can sing and they knew all those people knew that professor pearson could do with beat armitage what he would end of chapter 13chapter 14 of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 14 sarah if wayne pearson during his rush through that unique winter had stopped to consider it nothing would have surprised him more than his relations with sarah jane or miss sarah as he carefully called her that she liked the new name as indeed she liked everything that the new professor said and did was most apparent i wish nancy ann wouldn't go around the house yelling sarah jane at me she said to her mother in a burst of confidential indignation nancy ann was an importation from one of the distant farms a girl who wanted to work for her board and go to school and the worthy blacksmith chiefly be it confessed for nancy ann's own sake decided that mother might as well have somebody to step about a little for her now that sarah jane had so many new notions about school that she didn't have much time to help mother did not take kindly to the idea of outside help and would really much rather have done all the stepping herself but every member of this family had imbibed the spirit of the golden rule and tried to measure their lives by it so mother thompson bravely took up her cross and followed nancy ann about and saw that she did her work well and nancy ann did yell names through the house in a fearful manner that shall be admitted mrs thompson smiled indulgently on sarah and apologized for nancy she don't know no better child folks in this neighborhood is used to yelling around you know well she ought to begin to know better she goes to school professor pearson is just as particular with all the girls he never says nancy ann he don't use but one name for anybody they never do where folks are educated i guess it makes me mad every time i forget and call her nancy ann i just hate it myself thereafter the patient mother undertook the task of teaching herself to say sarah she even considered for one entire evening the propriety of her saying miss sarah and decided that that formality would be unnecessary but she should like it if father would begin to say just sarah and jim too they had ought to when the child hated the other name the father being admonished grumbled a little he did not see why sarah jane must take to hating her grandmother's name all of a sudden 
but he did his best. A dozen times in the course of the day he began, Sarah Jane, er, that is to say, Sarah, whereat Jim would, each time, laugh uproariously. He knew his limitations, Jim did, and never, to the end of the chapter, attempted other name than that with which his tongue was familiar. But Miss Sarah undoubtedly improved. Duller eyes and ears than even Jim's would have discovered it. They all knew that she was copying the professor, she knew it herself, and felt no sense of shame thereat. Why not copy one so wise and kind and so entirely her superior? She did not do it in an offensive way. She was not the least servile. On the rare occasions when she differed decidedly from the professor, after she fully understood him, she would argue with him sharply and hold her own in a way that surprised and interested him. Occasionally she carried her point and proved herself the wiser of the two but in speech and manner and even in movement she sometimes consciously and often unconsciously followed his lead to her marked improvement her voice that had been loud and hearty was learning the laws of modulation and wayne was discovering that it was really a remarkably pleasant voice he had his daydreams about her this young man he was interested in her as he might have been in a hardy plant that he had plucked from the woods and brought home and cultivated. Plants seemed sometimes to change their very natures under such treatment. How far would human beings change? It was an interesting study. Almost of necessity he spent much time with her. Endless were the new schemes to be carried out in connection with the school and no more eager assistant with them all could be imagined than was Sarah. Moreover, he contrived to find time to give to her for herself alone. She was a fairly good reader, having a natural manner that was pleasant to wane. With a few corrections, he felt that she might become an exceptionally good home reader, so he set about making the corrections, and was gratified with his success. Suppose you should read aloud to me for a half hour or so each evening in the book I am reviewing, he said. It would rest my eyes and give you practice in a line that would be helpful to you as a teacher. I'd like nothing better in the world, said Sarah with eagerness. Only that book has French words in it every few pages and whole lines of it every once in a while. I was looking through it yesterday when I was clearing up your room. I should make worse fuss with French words than Tommy Carter does with his third reader. That ought not to be, said Wayne, with the wisdom of a seer. He felt wise enough at times to be this girl's grandfather. Their education and environment had heretofore been in such different worlds. You will meet French words very often in reading aloud, and I should wish, if I were you, to cultivate that art. You can make good use of it with your friends. Why not take up French as a study and conquer it? Oh, my land! said Sarah, with one of her sudden lapses into her very recent past. I couldn't do that. I'm too old. I never had that kind of chances. Not at all, said Wayne briskly. The latter part of the girl's sentence had that note of pitiful regret in it that made him always want to help her. I don't mean that you shall prepare to teach French, or even to read aloud in it, but one winter's work would be sufficient to make you feel at ease over stray French words that one finds scattered through English, and you could go on, after you had acquired the pronunciation, as far as your time or inclination led you. After one catches the trick of pronunciation, it is only a matter of study and the dictionary. I shall be glad to help you if you care to try. So the girl tried with all her strength, and was succeeding, as she was quite in the habit of doing with what she undertook. Her teacher was proud of his success as a teacher, and the honest blacksmith had a marked accession of pride in his daughter but I started out to tell you of some of Wayne's daydreams concerning her. He liked to sit by the hour 
and fancy what effect daily contact with a girl like Enid Wilmer would have on Sarah. Enid, with her soft voice and her movements of quiet grace, and, above all, with her exquisite taste in dress. It was really the dress question that troubled him most. In this sphere he could not hope to do much. He had accomplished something by dint of affecting to dislike certain colors that were especially unbecoming to Sarah, and by mercilessly ridiculing certain combinations of color. That the girl had quickly taken the hints thus given was apparent in the marked improvement of her appearance. But she needed more, needed what he could not do for her, and Enid could. He fancied the quick-witted girl developing daily, hourly, under such tuition, and Enid's joy and pleasure in it. She is just the sort of girl to delight in such work, he told himself, and he mentally resolved to bring it about. There was another daydream lying beneath that, infinitely sweeter than that. Sometime, in that mystic future, when he should have secured the college honors that were waiting for him, and proved to his father what manner of man he was, and established a fair home, the like unto which there had not been yet in this world, there should be a lovely presiding angel in the home whose name should be Enid. Enid Pearson. He said the name over softly, reverently sometimes, when quite alone, not often. It was a sacred dream, it must not be touched rudely even by himself. But it was vivid, and the girl, Sarah, bright, energetic, quick-witted, grown quiet enough of manner and pleasant enough of voice to fit her world, should flit in and out of this paradise, doing her work as a teacher wonderfully well, and consulting constantly with the angel of his home, being guided by her, and being a success in every sense of the word, in the higher sphere to which she had been lifted, because he and Enid had prepared her for fitting into it. He was charmed with the thought, and labored to do his share of the work faithfully and well. He was interested in young Armitage, and in Ruby Knowles, Sarah Jane's Nightingale. She sang very well, but Wayne had long ago decided that her voice was really not so good as Sarah's own. Still, he was interested in her, and in a dozen others, and was making an honest and painstaking effort to help them all he could. But this particular girl he had singled out, and invested with a special and steadily increasing interest, because she was always being associated in his mind with Enid, and with what Enid could and would do for her. To this end he mentioned her in his letters to Enid, making a sort of foundation for the interest that he intended should be built up by and by, and feeling complacent over the thought that but for him and Enid, the girl might actually have been willing to marry Jim. There was no danger of that now. Yes, he wrote to Enid. Not often, for her letters were rare treasures of his. Her mother had returned now, and was a wise mother. But he made his letters so wise and safe and friendly that she did not object to their occasional coming and her daughter's replies might have been read upon the housetops without winning other than admiration for their brightness. But sometime he planned to have other letters from her, letters such as should never be shared with any housetop. He could imagine them, and he meant to have them, as fully as he meant to have those belated college honors. Meantime his life was not all rose color. He had put a thousand miles between his mortal enemy and himself, but petty hatred and revenge can reach farther than that. Leon Hamilton had not forgiven his brother for the fearful fright he had given him, and all the trouble that followed the exposure of his actual position in college. There had been weeks together when he waited tremblingly, fearing each day lest his stepfather's displeasure should take the form of a withdrawal of his allowance and an order to look out for himself. No such dire results had followed, owing, Leon believed, to his skillful management, but no less did he intend to be revenged upon Wayne for trying to ruin him. 
rumors of a trying nature began to float through the town concerning the professor's past history he had been suspended from college for inattention to study no he had been expelled for disgraceful conduct no indeed he had run away why he got into an awful fuss and actually killed a man probably they were looking for him now the story grew and grew until when at last it reached wayne in the form of a solemn board of trustees who demanded the right to know the facts its magnitude almost appalled that angry young man himself of course he could make very short work of the stories and he did the united states mail was days too slow for his fevered blood he telegraphed the dean the president three of his favorite professors begging them to reply at his expense in the same manner they smiled these cooler-headed wiser men but they were fond of wayne pearson and every one complied with his request letting the terseness of the telegram aid them in positiveness no young man in this institution ever had a better record we have only one regret that we lose you from this year's class too much cannot be said in praise of his character or scholarship thus the telegrams read in some way it is possible that squire willard might have told how the enterprising reporter of the westover chronicle got hold of every telegram and the next day's paper bristled with headlines the brilliant young professor vindicated and the like it was all dreadful wayne groaned and writhed under it but it might have been worse his popularity was greater than ever after that and he had had one revenge when he handed the last telegram over to squire willard as chairman of the board he said there squire willard i think those will answer your anxieties but allow me to say that in my judgment your caution came very late i might have been the various scoundrel that my enemy tried to make me appear for all that you knew to the contrary when you placed me at the head of your school the winter was quite gone before wayne left the little town for even a single night then but two weeks before the summer vacation he went for a three days absence a college friend with whom he had been quite intimate was about to be married and it appeared that the home of the bride-elect was not very far away from wayne's hiding place so he had been summoned to serve as best man at the wedding ceremony during his absence sarah was to assume the reins of government at the red schoolhouse but by this time the peculiar system of self-government after which wayne had striven was so well understood in the school that no anxiety was felt on the part of either teacher our school has been made over said the assistant teacher complacently it manages itself and squire willard replied with equal complacence i reckon that so i knew what i was about when i hired that chap i tell you the telegrams were all very well and i'm glad for the sake of the ninnies that he got em but i didn't need em bless you i knew the young man on the car platform looked about him with an air of complacence too who would have imagined that he would stay so long in that little town and become such a force in it as he knew he was certain of the older boys were lingering near and blushed with pleasure and lifted their hats in return for his greeting and said good-bye professor wish you a good time they would not have known enough to lift their hats last fall they would have stared and chuckled or at best merely nodded with their hands in their pockets it was a small difference perhaps but a significant one it stood for many others with what different feelings he should reach the little station next wednesday from those he had had when he first arrived the mental statement was truer than he supposed the state of mind in which he returned to the village was not one to be envied he was pushing through or more properly speaking perhaps had passed through what he believed was the fiercest blow that his stormy life had yet given him 
yet it was represented by only a few words. So our friend Hamilton is to take to himself a wife before long, is he? This his college friend had said to him as they stood together on the evening of the wedding, going over old times. He knew something of the feeling with which Wayne regarded his stepmother, and had been by no means a friend of Leon himself. I don't know, really, Wayne had said with a little start of surprise. He had not thought of such complications. I am not in correspondence with that individual, and haven't been posted. Whom is he to victimize? I don't know the lady. Alice has met her and thinks her charming. It is a Miss Wilmer, I believe. Enid Wilmer. Singular name that, isn't it? There had been more talk, but Wayne had not heard it. This, then, was Leon's last horrible piece of revenge. He could not doubt but that the villain had in some way, in the wildness of his excitement he did not stop to explain to himself how, learned of his feeling for this girl, and shaped his course accordingly. At the time, I think it would not have been possible for Wayne Pearson to have given his stepbrother credit for having a true motive or a true thought upon any subject. Fierce as his mood was, he could not but be somewhat soothed with the manner of his reception. The boys were at the train in full force, and gave a glad cheer as he stepped from the platform. One seized his grip, another his package of books and umbrella. They would have carried him on their shoulders if he would have let them. At the blacksmith's there was no less hearty joy at his coming. "'Welcome home!' Sarah had said, in the doorway. She wore a white dress, and her bright eyes had a softened brightness in them that was very becoming. "'Well!' said the good blacksmith as he grasped and held the hand of the professor with painful energy so you've got back i reckon we're glad not that we haven't got along all right we've made things hum in the school same as when you were here sarah j sarah she's a master hand if i do say it that shouldn't but it ain't all school you know not half of it sho you know that better than i do it beats all, Professor, what a hold you've got on the girl. It would kill me, I reckon, if I didn't believe in you through and through, or else I'd kill you, I'm afraid. Sho, I'm talking nonsense, you know, but my heart is just bound up in her, and so's her mother's. We've had ambitions for her, I'll allow, but we never did expect that she'd marry a real out-and-out -out professor, and a brilliant one at that, as the Westover Chronicle says you are and I believe them, too. End of chapter 14「Fifteen of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15. Do You Really Mean It? It is impossible to describe the amazement and chagrin of Wayne Pearson on hearing words like these addressed to himself. He was thankful that they too stood alone in the hall, and that the din of the supper bell prevented other ears from hearing through the open door. Supper in this house was wont to be a cheerful meal, to which Mother Thompson often added a little surprise in the shape of some favorite dainty of her most excellent cookery. The young teacher, with healthy appetite, had usually done it full justice. Somehow the cold pork and cabbage had drifted of late down to the lower end of the table, convenient to Jim's more substantial requirements. Tonight the table was almost festive in its outlay. There was chicken with toast and cream gravy, peach preserves and a raisin cake, of which the professor was quite fond. What, then, was the dismay of mother and daughter when he appeared in the doorway to say that, as he had dined quite late, he should need nothing more that night? "'For pity's sake!' exclaimed Mrs. Thompson. "'And here I went and got up a nice supper of purpose to welcome you home. Better set down and have a cup of tea and a piece of cake, leastways.' 
but that young man excused himself with a smile so genial and a bow so deferential that the good woman felt complimented despite her disappointment her mother heart went out to sarah though when she took note that her face had suddenly clouded over too bad she said to herself when she looked so pretty in her white dress and took such pains a set in the table and then the mother sighed as if that was the lot of woman to plan and try to please a man and fail but she cast anxious glances at her girl who ate sparingly and did not talk it was well that her father was interested in hearing about a lawsuit from jim who had just returned from westover or he would have then and there inquired into the cause of sarah's silence when the evening wore on and the professor did not come down to sing or be read to though the big lamp was lighted and a fire on the hearth glowed cheerily the mother excused him by saying most likely that poor boy is all tired out and is going to bed early i'll fix a little bite and you take it up to his door it would have been like the breezy independent sarah jane to have advised her mother to do no such thing and that if he didn't choose to come after his supper let him go without it but sarah was cast in gentler mould the change seemed to have come when that obnoxious jane had been dropped she took the tray spread with biscuit cold chicken and cake with a glass of milk and going upstairs set it down noiselessly at wayne's door knocked on it then disappeared quickly into another room mrs thompson was listening at the foot of the stairs that way of doing things was no plan of hers she expected to have the tray presented in person but that was not the daughter's way it might have been once but sarah knew better now some mysterious influence had been at work developing womanly delicacy and reserve wayne recognized this as he opened the door and took up the tray he guessed who had brought it mrs thompson would not have effaced herself his heart smote him as he surveyed the lunch and realized that it was tender care for him which prompted it he had all his life sighed for loving appreciation now it had come and he felt like flinging it from him he had been sitting in the dark thinking over those dreadful words what had he done to delude this father into believing that he had any such intention marrying in his mind was a faraway beautiful dream that might never be realized years of hard self-denying work were to come first he went over the past winter in thought there had been absolutely nothing that any sane person could call serious attention bestowed upon his assistant he would have been willing that the whole village should hear every word he had ever spoken to her he should not allow himself to be disturbed further by the banter of an ignorant man it was just too preposterous and he dismissed the subject or tried to there was another something that disturbed him more than that just now and that was the report of enid's engagement to leon could it be possible that it was true if so it must have been brought about by the urgent wishes of their elders so far as enid was concerned for she had seemed to feel nothing but repulsion for him but then who could sound the depths of the heart of a young girl leon's handsome face may have had some fascination for her which she had carefully concealed moreover leon was equal to anything he might have professed to have been greatly changed even to have become a christian after enid's own heart and in need of her sweet guiding to help him in the narrow path that would appeal to her as nothing else could it came over wayne pearson all at once that life looked dark ahead without that precious dreamy hope he had hidden in his heart all these months he reached out his hand for a box on the table among his other treasures was the keepsake she had given him at parting a little withered white rose there was a lingering perfume about it still it reminded him of her he pictured her again handing it to him that morning not coquettishly but with innocent true eyes how dreadful that this white dove of a girl should be in the power of a vulture 
he would write and warn her but not to-night he must be calmer it was a night of tossing and unrest for the young man in dreams he was striving to hold enid back from the edge of a precipice at whose foot lay dark deep waters and then he was being pursued through tangled growths of swamp and wood by father thompson who brandished a huge sledge-hammer over his head the young teacher did not go to his duties that morning with his usual zest all through that day the undercurrent of distracting thought went on it was most humiliating that this man had all winter supposed him to be engaged in courting his daughter how should he disabuse their minds of such a belief sarah was sensible it was not likely that she had a thought of such a thing she was interested in her lessons besides she knew that he had neither by word or look led her to believe that he had for her any other feeling than that of mere friendliness wayne pearson by reason of his peculiar life trials was older than his years in some respects but in others he was not so worldly wise as he might have been even if he had ever thought himself old enough to begin he would have scorned the thought of a flirtation albeit some of the arts a flirt employs were natural to him his eyes would have widened and glowed though and sought the other pair of eyes when deeply interested just the same whether he had been talking with his grandmother or a pretty girl then that grace of manner and thoughtful courtesy more fascinating to a woman than good looks and a revelation to this girl deceived her it all testified to tender regard for herself and these subtle silent factors had naturally not been taken into account by him as the days went on it became evident to wayne that mrs thompson was of the same mind as her husband for she assumed toward him an unwonted familiarity bordering on motherly relations and to his extreme annoyance now that he had become sensitive on the subject the air of the whole community seemed full of the same thing the scholars gave knowing nods and nudges to each other if he and his assistant happened to exchange a few words and squire willard even went so far as to congratulate him in a way hailing him as he went by his office with hello professor heard some good news about you see here if you and sarah jane are going to couple up soon why can't you come back here and keep our school next winter maybe we can all put our heads together and have a first-rate academy or something of that sort by and by there's money enough in all these farms to pay you something nice eventually why not settle down here think of it won't you wayne was relieved that a man just then stepped in and asked to see the squire on business so cutting short the interview had the young man not been so incensed and mortified he would have enjoyed a hearty laugh as he went on his way at thought of himself marrying sarah jane and settling down in harden the upper district at that his duties for that day were over and striking off into a little footpath which led to the woods he wondered grimly as he went along why it was that he had been all his life tramping off to hide away with some trouble was it had it always been his own fault but he could not stop to puzzle over that there was this latest perplexity harassing him night and day gradually he had come to regard that half divine precept put yourself in his place and he had faint glimpses of how the case might stand in the minds of sarah's father and mother it was like this all winter long there had been a fire in the best room every evening a thing unheard of before sarah and her young man had sat there alone they had sung and studied french and read aloud the skeptical parents were wont to nod knowingly at each other when these studies and readings were mentioned a mere excuse that to be together they decided sometimes when the book proved intensely interesting they took no note of time and the reading was protracted until a late hour then the father rousing from his first nap and still hearing the sound of voices was apt to remark sarah jane ought to have been abed two hours ago and the mother would put in soothingly 
la father young folks are only young once do let them enjoy it the professor had also escorted sarah to and from the singing classes and debates and sometimes to a sociable all the neighborhood took it as a thing of course that she would appear with him her rustic admirers recognized it too and stood aside now in the rural community of new england whence the thompsons and many others of this western village had emigrated this was the regular recognized form of a genuine courtship an equivalent to an engagement when persisted in for a few months when a young man had begun keeping company with a girl especially if he had set up with her it would be accounted most dishonorable to jilt her after that the remembrance of this fact gleaned from a book of old-time stories explained why everybody had jumped to the same conclusion concerning himself and did not comfort this much troubled young man putting many little things together he could see that for some time back the thompsons had seemed to regard him as one of the family it had come to be a rule for the mother to trot into the room where sarah and he sat together about nine o'clock in the evening bringing some little delicacy for their refreshment she would mend the fire beam serenely upon them a moment and vanish the unsuspecting young man set it all down to abounding kindness of heart and took encouragement to prolong the reading after his conscience had warned him that he ought to be asleep it cannot be denied that sarah during that winter had enjoyed the opportunity of her life in an educational way even though some of what she read was far beyond her depth it embraced a wide range books of history science and metaphysics with a sprinkling of fiction by the best authors and the listener had realized his good fortune in having secured a reader so good-natured and untiring her voice was good also and she was eager to have all faults corrected the long winter evenings had slipped delightfully away and wayne was grateful for he knew that his already overtaxed eyes could not have borne this extra strain he had occasionally rewarded her by reading aloud choice bits from the poets a new world had already been opened to the girl but this was enchantment to hear in wayne's faultless intonation where the quiet colored end of evening smiles miles and miles on the solitary pastures where our sheep half asleep tinkle homeward through the twilight or the musical cadences of the blessed damozel leaned out from the gold bar of heaven her eyes were deeper than the depths of waters stilled at even and thus it had turned out that the reading for a half hour a day had come to be the business of the evening after a short lesson in french and an occasional music lesson he had to thank his own selfish thoughtlessness he told himself more than once that he had been brought into such a dilemma he had taught french to sarah so that his pronunciation should not grow rusty in fact it was all selfish he had enjoyed posing as a sort of philanthropist wise and good and gracious giving out his gifts with princely generosity and so he had gone on all winter with not a thought of anybody but himself fool if only the girl herself were not harmed he should never have dreamed of such a thing but for the talk that had been started the evenings at home were necessarily broken up now by reason of frequent rehearsals of the whole school preparatory to the closing exercises and the teacher contrived to be so continually occupied that he had no time to give to sarah except in thought the conflict within went steadily on what was to be the end of all this he asked himself his eyes at times regarded the girl who was the cause of all this tumult with a new curiosity most persons would have called her good-looking somehow during the winter she had lost a superabundance of flesh and the intense color which had flamed in her cheeks was toned down to a becoming pink her brown eyes were sincere though rather too wide open perhaps and she walked with a free swinging step which might be trained into grace no there was nothing in her appearance to terrify him 
and she really had a very good mind susceptible to high cultivation. But, oh, that something in the face and presence, that delicacy and fineness, the spirit illuming the flesh, it was not there. Again he thought of Enid and stifled a groan. At the same time it smote him like a blow that this other girl was thoroughly good, kind, pure-hearted, and unselfish. She had anticipated every want and ministered to his comfort like a sister, taking burdens upon herself in the school which did not belong to her, that he might not be annoyed. It was after weary trampings, sleepless nights, and many conflicts, that he came at last to this decision. If he should discover that Sarah, in view of what she considered special attention, had given her heart to him, why then it would be his duty to pledge himself to her. The thought was terrible, but he must be honorable and true to his convictions, whatever the sacrifice. He had written an essay in college wherein he had taken high ground on the perfidy of stealing hearts, denouncing the guilty ones as worthy of far greater punishment than ordinary thieves. He would wait, though, until the last day or two of his stay, before taking this decisive step, and watch developments. He was not reassured when he found that evening a lovely bunch of white violets and spring beauties in his room, nor when the next day he stepped into her schoolroom to make an inquiry, her face became suffused with blushes, and she made stammering replies, increased by a loud whisper from a precocious little woman gossip, who proclaimed from behind her hand, he's her beau, followed by a giggle. It was all over. The last day of school came and went with highly creditable examinations, followed by a brilliant entertainment in the evening, consisting of music and declamation, which covered them all with glory, especially the professor, whom a throng of boys gathered about to clasp his hand in loving goodbyes, and beg him to return the next winter. It was not that young man's purpose to do so if any other place opened where he could earn his living, but he left it an open question. He might be obliged to accept it. Wayne had planned to take the midnight train, and there was but an hour left. Mother Thompson, with unfailing kindness, had prepared for him a generous lunch-box for his journey, and when she presented it, begged as a last favor that he would sing her favorite song before he went. The musician, as he seated himself at the organ to comply with her request, was conscious of a wish that the writer of those words had never been born. Annoyed beyond measure, he nevertheless went through it, singing as effectively as if his heart were torn with regrets, the old song beginning, We parted in silence, we parted by night. With the last line, Mrs. Thompson left the room in tears. There was silence for a little when the two were left alone. Wayne had felt that this last talk would probably decide his course of action, and yet, within the last few minutes, the suggestion had come to him. What need for pledging himself to her now, in any case? Why not wait and arrange to correspond simply? Of course, that would be, in the eyes of her friends, still continuing a tacit engagement. But it would not seem so dreadful to him, and who could tell but what might happen meantime? The girl might be carried captive by the next teacher and forget him utterly. It's dreadful to have you go away. I never had such a good time in all my life, Sarah said innocently. I was beginning to be somebody and know something. Now I'll just drop back and be Sarah Jane again. I was getting on so well in music and French, and now there'll be no more of that. I'll have nobody to help me ever again. The girl was leaning her head on her hand, her eyes on Wayne's face, as one takes a last lingering look at something infinitely precious. Wayne had a tender heart for distress in whatever guise, and now pity sent that regardful look into his eyes, so misleading it was, as he said, I will help you. I will be your friend always if you will let me. 
he was going on to say more that he would write to her regularly and continue her french lessons by correspondence but when that treacherous voice of his with the tender note which was always saying more than he had authorized it to say fell upon the girl's ear in those words the absolute radiance that flashed into her face was something wonderful to see her friend always with that look and tone meant just one thing to her do you really mean it she asked in a tremble of delight i was afraid you would never like me enough for that i i know i'm not good enough for you but i'll try and learn she had mistaken his meaning he saw it in a flash and now he was pledged unless he spoke and undeceived her he could not do it he must abide by his words as she had understood them and she had not feigned this to entrap him she was a child of nature and true end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of by way of the wilderness by pansy and mrs c m livingston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen a counterfeiter's state of mind it was a strange wooing wayne pearson indeed was too young to realize how strange it was he smiled into the face of the girl who questioned him eagerly it was an acquirement of his to smile when his heart was heaviest and he took her hand and pressed it reassuringly then dropped it as it came to him that he was acting more than he felt he spoke a few grave words too words of advice mostly concerning studies with hints of the years of hard work which lay before him then train time came he clasped sarah's hand in good-bye and she watched him down the street until he was lost in the darkness it must be confessed that sarah was disappointed at first why did he not say he loved her as they do in story-books and kiss her good-bye however she loyally put away the feeling of dissatisfaction perhaps refined people like wayne did not do things in that way she said the name over again softly thrilling with the thought that now she had a right to call him that though with it came a twinge of regret that he had not told her she might anyway she would say it to herself and to think she would get letters from him she had never received but three letters in her life how often did people who were engaged write to each other she wondered it would be so great a pleasure to answer his letter for sarah prided herself on spelling and penmanship as well as grammar but she had no nice paper she must send to westover for some let's see shall it be blue or pink or green she could not decide and the other party to this queer transaction he was not troubled by any such trivial matters as he sat straight up in a common car all night to save the expense of a sleeper being moved rapidly on toward the east he was busy at something else not sleeping but calling himself fool and other hard names not because of what had just happened that was unavoidable he told himself albeit it was the result of a winter of insane thoughtlessness it would have been dishonorable as things turned to have acted in any other way he had seemed to seek out one girl and devote himself to her naturally enough she had inferred that he had peculiar interest in her and her heart had gone out to him duty required of him what he had done that night and brave men do not shirk duty however hard the deluded boy did not seem to realize that duty and truth go hand in hand and he had forgotten his beloved shakespeare to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man he was yet to learn by hard lessons that one cannot pass counterfeits in the sacred relations of love and marriage and go unpunished aunt crete had invited wayne to spend the summer with her and thither he had gone with all speed as she wished him to be there on his birthday 
he decided, as he drew near the old homestead among the hills, that he should not at present inform Aunt Crete of any peculiar relations he held with a young woman in the West, time enough for that most humiliating avowal. The quaint old house was open to the May sunshine, and lilac blooms of white and lavender mingled their sweet breaths with apple blossoms and the thousand other fragrances of spring. It was a delightful, peaceful spot, embowered in ancient elms that line the wide streets of that ideal village. Aunt Crete welcomed him with shining face and loving words, bestowing kisses on cheek and brow with demonstrativeness unusual to her. It was grateful to the young man. He was weary of tossings and buffetings and harassments. He felt almost like a worn old man who longed to drop his burdens in this peaceful spot and there rest forever, or like a tired child who wanted to creep into his mother's arms and be rocked to sleep. Wayne's feelings were never on the surface, though. He assumed a cheerful air and rushed about, out and in, exploring the old place anew with all the apparent delight of his boyhood. He had never seen Aunt Crete more happy, and she knew why. Not only had her dear boy come to stay for months, but locked in the old secretary drawer was a long, thick envelope whose seals looked official and important. Tomorrow he would know all. And the morrow dawned in brightness. Aunt Crete dressed the house in flowers and brought out the traditional birthday cake with its twenty-one candles, and gave her little gifts as when he was a boy. A fine handkerchief of her own hem-stitching, a bright pinball, and a box of her homemade taffy. Tears sprang to the young man's eyes. Again he was back in his happy, mothered childhood. He took up the formidable-looking document finally, asking, "'What can this be, Aunt Crete? Have you made your will so soon?' She was silent while he opened it, expecting to find in it some of Aunt Crete's dry fun, perhaps a whole sheet full of good advice. He read far enough to understand that he held in his hand his fortune. Then he looked up and gazed at Aunt Crete in dumb amazement, before reading it again in silence. Meantime, Aunt Crete slipped out and left him alone. After a half hour had passed, she was a little perplexed and disappointed that he had not come out, beside himself with joy, to jump over the tulip bed, or seize her and whirl her about, which were some of his pranks when he had come down from college to spend short vacations. He took it altogether too coolly. Was Wayne putting on airs and trying to be old and grave before his time? Whatever it was that kept back an overflow of spirits on that eventful day, it was something real, Aunt Crete decided, when she returned to the room and found Wayne sitting where she had left him, his head bent forward in deep thought, his eyes intent upon a pattern in the carpet. He looked as if he were puzzling out a problem, she thought, and not a pleasant one at that. The boy had grown up and Aunt Crete, with all her pride in his manly beauty and talent, had a sore heart for a minute as she took it in. It would have been sorer, though, could she have known all. He caught at her hand as she came by, and smiled up into her face. It was her boy's look still, but graver, sadder. She passed her hand caressingly over his head, and put back a stray lock from his forehead, thinking within herself that if any mother loved a boy more than she did this one, she was sorry for her. He drew her down into an easy chair by his side and began to ply her with eager questions. Among others, he asked, Aunt Crete, did you all these years know of this, this wonderful thing that has come to me? Oh, yes, didn't I keep a secret well? Why did you not tell me? Some things might have been different if you had. Most likely. You would probably have turned out as many another boy has, a good-for-nothing, because you had some money coming to you. Besides, I couldn't tell you. I gave my word to your mother that I would not. If I had but known it, 
he said meditatively i would have come to you last fall and gone on with my studies by myself while i waited for all this abundance if i had he almost said if i had this terrible yoke of bondage would not be about my neck this minute yes aunt crete said in an aggrieved tone if i had but known you were going to fly up and off like a parched pea i should have insisted upon your coming to me however i consoled myself by thinking that you couldn't probably have a better discipline for a time than to teach a country school discipline yes lifelong discipline it might be the young man told himself but that's all past aunt crete said briskly now you have your life to plan over again i know you are just aching to get off by yourself and think and think to take it all in so tramp off if you want till dinner's ready and i'll go down to old mrs bowers with some broth wayne blessed her for her thoughtfulness he did wish to be alone for a time and gloom over the situation he had been wretched before this news came but doubly wretched now it was so tantalizing so exasperating that now when he was free from his enemy and had become his own master when he held in his hand the means to go on with study to any extent to travel in foreign lands what he had longed for when a charmed life was opening up before him it should be turned into bitterness by his own folly fettered in his young manhood by a chain of his own forging suppose even that he should tolerate the thought of being bound to this girl how was she in her humble home ever to be fitted for that station in life to which he belonged it was appalling he felt degraded too in his own eyes that she had given to him her whole heart's devotion and received not in return it was not a light thing to have won this and it was by his own mistakes he might have saved her from it wayne had expected to spend this summer in efforts to obtain a more lucrative position but now there was no need study was the next thing and with that joyful thought the student got the better of all depressing circumstances for a time and he went off into making plans he would go to one of the older universities to be graduated after that a postgraduate course in europe after that travel then what oh what and this brought his thoughts back to the hateful present and the remembrance that he had promised sarah to let her know of his safe arrival he took out his pen and tablet to begin what should he say and how engaged but three days and obliged to ponder in perplexity over what he should say in his first letter he saw the absurdity of the situation and half smiled in scorn of himself he sat long on the log pen in hand leaning against the tree but he did not write the letter with eyes fixed on the blue sky and dreamy white clouds he had gone off into dreams himself there was no girl in the dreams they were about books oh the treasures of books he would have he reveled in the thought of his riches and made out a choice list of rare books at once a day or two elapsed before he set himself in earnest to write to sarah it was a difficult task part of the epistle might have been copied from the polite letter writer so stilted and devoid of heart interest was it much of it had to do with french verbs he was more at home there and some of the sentences were written in french for that poor creature to puzzle out by the aid of a dictionary at the close there was some quite plain english however he wrote that having had time for reflection it had occurred to him he should have been more explicit about a matter at which he had merely hinted realizing that it would be years with his long cherished plans for a thorough education before he could marry the boy writhed under using that word but there was no other he felt the importance of impressing upon her with utmost frankness that the waiting time would be long and much of it spent in a foreign land 
if she felt that so protracted an engagement was undesirable he would not hold her to it she was free when she chose to say the word he did not feel it right to continue it unless she clearly understood it was for tedious years perhaps it was all wrong for her to sacrifice her youth in this way if wayne had a secret hope that the simple-minded girl and her friends might become awed at the prospect of great learning and high position as well as dismayed in view of an apparently interminable engagement and shrink therefrom he did not tell it to his inner self sarah thompson knew that she could not expect to receive a letter under two or three days at least nevertheless she began to look for it the second day after wayne's departure it was the first thought in the morning and the last at night as the week dragged by and it had not yet come the hitherto strong-nerved cheerful girl began to be depressed and nervous seized with a fit of trembling when mail time came and dropping everything to hurry off to the post office it came at last and she fled to her own room to read it holding it a few seconds unopened and gazing at her own name in that dear handwriting there was not much in it to give her comfort but the fact that he had written to her at all that she was the only one who had received word from him that he called her dear friend at the beginning and signed himself your friend at the close that was joy enough for now how could he think she would ever tire of waiting for him that showed how honest and kind he was though to tell her the exact truth at the start a more sensitive nature would of course have read between the lines and taken offence at the mere suggestion of considering herself free but this girl had an idol and he was infallible in her eyes when she read parts of her letter aloud to her father and mother that night it was not quite so satisfactory to them it's queer for a love letter ain't it mother thompson said to her husband after sarah had gone to her room but then most likely she didn't want to read the love part out he's a goin to be a great scholar though goin to europe i want to know she mused on more to herself than to her husband my but sarah jane'll be somebody great when she gets him father thompson had been meditatively rubbing his stubby chin while he gazed into the fire with something like a frown on his broad face and he sighed now ending in an audible huh then answered most bitterly maybe ef she ain't most a hundred year old time he gets good ready i tell ye maria i don't more'n half like this business courtin a girl ten or twelve year it most ways ends in smoke then where is she been a mopin and a pinin and a losin her good looks sho i wish he'd never laid eyes on her he scared away sam scott and i most wish she hadn't got the idea of so much learnin into her head and had a married sam and settled down nigh us why sam's got the best farm on all these prairies and he's a likely fellow too now father mother thompson said as she rolled up her knitting work for the night you've got to let young folks steer their own boat providence'll manage what you can't and we needn't worry anything about it but for pity's sake isaiah don't let out anything of this to sarah jane it'll just about kill her if you do it was a perfect morning with summer airs and wayne lounged in a hammock under a big tree by turns dipping into the pages of a book and pausing to take in the delights of flitting birds and scent of apple blossoms aunt creed appeared in the doorway presently with a knife and a pan asking wayne are you equal to cutting some asparagus for dinner you remember where the old bed is down in the garden don't you next to aunt creed's house stood another old-fashioned mansion half hidden by trees with spacious grounds and old-time garden in the back wayne going on his errand stopped by the fence between the two gardens to admire the wealth of bloom on the other side great beds of tulips and daffodils glowing in morning freshness 
to his surprise somebody who seemed a part of the spring morning in a gown of sprigged cambric and a little white ruffled sunbonnet lifted herself up from over the flowers she was cutting face to face they came enid wilmer and wayne pearson each pronouncing the other's name in the same breath and in unfeigned delight wayne was the first to find his speech where did you come from and how in the name of all that's wonderful did you find this out of the way place he asked i came from home only last night aunt serena lives here and mother and i have come to spend the summer the doctor thinks the air of these berkshire hills is just what she needs there i accounted for myself all in one breath now may i ask you the same questions oh yes i have come to spend the summer too and aunt crete lives here then their gay laughter floated out over those old gardens that had not echoed to the sound of young voices for years and enid exclaimed how strange how very nice there followed a talk over that garden fence so long continued that aunt crete was obliged to come in search of her nephew and her asparagus the young man had learned one thing by that talk to his comfort or discomfort in the inquiries enid had made concerning his father's family it was evident by her manner of speaking of leon that the report he had heard of the two was utterly false it had probably been fabricated by that fellow and circulated through the college that it might reach his ears but for this hateful rumor he told himself as he came back to the hammock perhaps he might not have been bound by any promises for he began to realize that it had plunged him into a state of despairing recklessness that probably had much to do with his hasty decision to sacrifice himself to a sense of duty was it duty after all why had he not waited and counseled with somebody older and wiser he had not even the settled conviction that he was suffering for conscience sake since these disturbing thoughts had gained entrance he could not be wholly wretched now though that he had seen that lovely face far back in the little sunbonnet he recalled her joy at meeting him and dwelt with delight upon her every word from this pleasant dreaming he was awakened by aunt creek calling a letter for you wayne and she gave him a quizzical look as she handed it out a little fat pink letter horrors pink and the young man flushed as he recognized sarah's handwriting end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen Educating a Conscience. That pink letter, which was such a source of mortification to Wayne, was not by any means a letter to be ashamed of. Sarah Thompson, by reason of the limitations of her education, might not know just the proper color of paper to use in polite correspondence but she knew how to write a genial newsy letter expressed in such a way that the reader might almost imagine himself present at the scenes described given the fact that wayne pearson had been undeniably interested in many of his late pupils and had done his best for the little western town where he had spent his winter and it will be readily understood that he might be interested in a well-written letter from that place if he could have divested himself of all thought of personality in connection with it he would have heartily enjoyed sarah's letter he imagined himself going down to aunt crete with certain paragraphs in it that described the last sewing society and gave a lively and effective picture of western life as he had been living it if when aunt creed asked who writes the letter he could reply unconcernedly oh one of my pupils who is really a very promising scholar he would go to her at once less than two weeks ago he could have made some such reply now he was sure that the tell-tale blood would flow into his face and that his aunt's keen eyes would ferret out his ugly secret 
for that it was ugly every added day of enid wilmer's society assured him no there was no enjoyment to be had from sarah's letter he put it from him in pain and disgust however in due course of time it was followed by others not all of them pink some were of a pale green others had a delicate tint called azure by the stationer at westover it had especially charmed sarah and she used it somewhat liberally yet there came a time and only that subtle instinct which seemed to be at work moulding her life could have told why it came that sarah used the pink and green and azure paper for her everyday friends and sent only plain white to wayne he had not hinted at this instinctively he shrank from tutelage of the sort his face burning with shame over the idea that it should be necessary but the white sheet and the white envelope that went to her with careful precision every two weeks told their story it may be yes he wrote to her with painstaking exactness sending his letter every other monday morning if he had failed in this his curiously tutored conscience would have tortured him for after carefully going once more over the weary ground he had assured himself that there was nothing for him but to abide by his pledged word others had been martyrs to principle before now why not he yet it must be owned that he was a very cheerful and comfortable martyr having resolved upon doing his duty at whatever cost why should he not have a little cheer on the way it would be years before he could think of settling down to actual life years of study were before him but he surely had earned a short vacation and for this brief summer he would forget that he was other than a boy on a visit to his aunt and that there was a girl on a visit to her aunt who would naturally look to him for friendly companionship could anything be more natural and innocent he did not plan out the summer and look at it steadily he merely let it float dreamily through his brain, contenting his conscience with the stern orders to fancy never to take him down the lane marked it might have been. In other words, he drifted all that summer, often calling a halt it is true, as often, indeed, as the fortnightly letter was written, and making certain stern resolutions, forgotten as soon as he heard Enid's voice in the garden next door for the most part he was content to drift and if he had been so ill taught as not to know that drifting always led downstream who shall be blamed those many colored letters that came so regularly tried him much at first until he hit upon this plan without letting himself know that it was a plan he talked much with aunt crete and with enid about his pupils he told them of beat and of one john loomis who had interested him and of ruby stevens with her unfortunately good voice since it was not better and of little nelly parsons with her dangerously pretty face and her innocence of danger he corresponded with some of them he said and should for a time to try to keep a hold upon them at least until some teacher came who could take up the work where he left it he did not mention Sarah, and he said nothing about the pink and blue letters. Could he help it if Aunt Crete believed that she had received their explanation? And, adoring her boy as she did, was it not natural for her to tell it all over to Enid, and dilate a little upon the unusual quality of helpfulness and protectiveness for those youngsters out west, and he so young himself? As for those fortnightly letters, wayne posted them sometimes at the village and oftener at the town office six miles away when he went for his morning gallop it was as easy to go in that direction as any other and he did not allow any impertinent questions from his conscience as to why he took the trouble to carry his letters there to post he was doing right he told it coldly at a great sacrifice of self and that was enough his home relations during the summer were peculiar. He went dutifully home as soon as he had fully established himself at Aunt Crete's, and meant to be magnanimous and forget all the pain that his father had given him. 
but he began wrong. His father had longed, with an almost pitiful eagerness, for the homecoming of his boy. He had meant to put his arms about him in the first moment of privacy, as he used to do when Wayne was thirteen, and to say, Wayne, my boy, we haven't understood each other very well of late, but your father loves you with all his heart. But there had been no privacy. They had met in the presence of company, and Wayne had risen with an ease that was almost indifference, at least so the father thought, to take his hand for a moment and say, I hope you are quite well? And then to continue at once the conversation that the father's entrance had interrupted. Nor even when they were alone did the son succeed in making himself understood. Throughout the winter he had been haunted with that fear which had taken possession of him, that his father was suffering from losses or heavy expenditures. He knew that his was an expensive household, and could well believe that Leon Hamilton had not improved in the matter of spending money. Almost his first thought, after recovering from the astonishment into which the announcement of his own fortune had thrown him, had been that now he should be able to help his father. He had planned a dozen ways of offering that help, and then, without plan, had hit upon the worst way that could have been found. Father, he had said, the moment they were alone together, you know of my rare good fortune, of course? You have known it all the while. My chief pleasure in it is that now I can repay you all the lavish expenditure of the years. Can you give me any idea, do you suppose, what the amount should be? He had smiled as he spoke the words, and had meant to express by them the utter folly of trying to repay, with mere money, such care as has been his. He thought his father would understand that he pretended to throw a thin veil of business over the transaction, so as to cover the humiliation of a father, still in the prime of life, having to receive at the hands of a son. If, instead of this, he had only said, "'Oh, father, are you having money troubles?' I have been afraid of it, and have lain awake nights wondering how I could help you. Now it is such a joy to me to think that I can. How much do you need, father, to set everything straight? But he said nothing of the kind, and no one could have misunderstood his meaning more thoroughly than did that father. So the boy, his boy, had come home, still nursing petty anger in his heart, and had planned the mean revenge of offering to pay him for his bringing up. Well, if that was his spirit, the least said between them the better. He had smiled in return, a smile so cold that it chilled Wayne's heart, as he said with that touch of irony that he knew well how to use, I am not mathematician enough to compute such a sum as that, and do not care to undertake it. The fewer words we have about it, the better for us both. And then he had turned abruptly, and gone into the inner room, and closed the door. He is utterly set against me, groaned Wayne inwardly. He will not even let me help him. As for Mrs. Pearson, she tried to appear at her best. Her son Leon was away from home, and was at present well up in his stepfather's favor and Wayne was a fine-looking young man with a large fortune in his own right, needing not a penny of his father's money. Why should she not patronize him? She did so to the best of her abilities, talking often of him to his father, telling how Wayne had improved, had ceased to be a boy, and lost all of his sullen ways, and was really delightful in conversation. The sore-hearted father heard it all in silence, and grew more and more disappointed. If he had been told that Wayne was silent and miserable, it would have comforted him a little, for then he could have told himself that the boy was troubled about something, and was trying to put a brave face on it. As it was, he could only feel that his son had nursed his boyish jealousies until he had become utterly estranged from his own father. And the folly of this chafed him, so that he grew colder and haughtier every hour. Wayne made his visit at home very brief, 
and came back to Aunt Crete more thoroughly embittered against his stepmother and stepbrother than before. His version of it was that they had succeeded beyond their fondest hopes, they had robbed him of his father. In this way the summer passed. Wayne by no means gave all his time to Enid, but perfected his plans for the autumn with such success that October found him well established in one of the most time-honored institutions of learning that this new land boasts. Here he set himself to work with such energy and perseverance that the college honors which he had determined regretfully to forego when he resolved upon choosing a new college for his senior year began to pour upon him. Passing all the rules of precedent, he was unanimously chosen as the representative of the class at commencement, and in various other ways did he distinguish himself as the hero of the day. Aunt Crete beamed upon him from the choicest seat that the great opera house afforded, and believed him to be the greatest man in the world. His father had received a formal invitation to be present, and had formally answered it that a court engagement of importance would deprive him of the privilege. There was a girl toiling away in a little western town who would have given her year's earnings for the privilege. She hinted something of the kind to Wayne, and he promptly made her realize the utter impossibility of such a proceeding. Sarah Thompson was given to understand that young ladies of culture did not take long journeys for the sake of visiting young men. Oh, he did not put it in so bald a manner, but Sarah was quick at receiving hints, and had blushed painfully, to the very roots of her black hair, over the suggestion that his reply contained. Yet, beside Aunt Crete, sat Enid Wilmer, fair and sweet, and happy in the honors heaped upon her friend. She had made almost as long a journey as Sarah would have had to take for the pleasure of hearing that one oration. But then Enid Wilmer had an aunt to visit. That must be taken into consideration. Within a week after his graduation, Wayne Pearson went abroad. He had not meant to go so soon. His plan had been to go home for a month's visit, and he had told himself determinately that he would get acquainted with his father over again and insist upon breaking down that wall of cold reserve. He also told himself, with less determination, that he must go to Harden, he supposed. He sighed heavily whenever he thought of this, and forbore to make any definite plans about the going, and put the thought of it from him as much as possible. It was enough that, being a man of honor, he meant to go, of course, some time. In point of fact, he did none of the things thus planned. A rare opportunity of going abroad with choice company and exceptional advantages for sightseeing being offered, this young man of impulse decided in a single night that he would avail himself of it. By October, again, he was established in Berlin for a graduate course, and was writing to Aunt Crete frequently, to his father every three or four or six weeks, and to Sarah, with the regularity of the sun, once a month. He had planned this with care, had explained to that patient young woman that his studies were very heavy, as indeed they were, and that he had extremely little time to spend in correspondence. A letter a month was all he could conscientiously give to her. He nursed his conscience very carefully in those days, to make sure that it would sustain him in all that he did. He had a need to, later, as temptation spread itself out alluringly before him. It chanced that Mrs. Wilmer was advised to go abroad again, and this time she took Enid with her. As she gained in strength, she naturally desired to give Enid all the benefit of travel that she could, and in course of time their route led them to the very town and street where Wayne was boarding. Not without plans to that effect, the correspondence begun so long ago between Enid and Wayne had never been entirely dropped. Wayne wrote only occasionally, his conscience keeping him well up on the remembrance that he had not time for letter-writing, and Enid, whether by accident or design, 
never replied to his letters any more promptly than he had to hers. Yet they kept in touch with each other in this way. And their relations were of such a frank and friendly character that before Mr. Wilmer started for home, after establishing his wife and daughter comfortably for a six weeks stay, he called upon Wayne and told him that any little oversight he was able, without too much trouble, to keep on the ladies, would be duly appreciated. After that, what could Wayne do but call frequently and send cards of invitation or admission as they came in his way, and act as escort to points of interest? In short, he kept an oversight. Who could have done less? Let it not, for a moment, be imagined that Wayne Pearson was, in any sense of the word, doing what is called flirting with Enid Wilmer. His regard for her was too painfully sincere to have tempted him in that direction. His attentions to her, during that winter abroad, were such as any gentleman might have offered, could hardly have helped offering, indeed, under the circumstances. But they helped to add painful weight to the chains in which he had entangled himself. It was not very much better after Enid went home. In some respects it was worse. With her and her mother alone in a foreign land, it was easy to assure himself that he must, at whatever cost to his future peace, do for them whatever would add to their comfort. But it was difficult for that much burdened conscience of his to find excuses for the letters that still occasionally went to her after she was fairly settled again among her home friends. There was another who was more or less troubled by these same letters, and that was Mrs. Wilmer. Her daughter seemed to be entirely undisturbed, and, up to a certain point at least, entirely frank. She carried the letters promptly to her mother as soon as they were read, and they were still such as might have been read aloud anywhere, and would have interested. Wayne knew how to write fascinating letters from abroad, though in the Thompson home it might not have been suspected, but Mrs. Wilmer, mother-like, was troubled. Since this young man cared to continue writing to her daughter, until the years were past in which they could both be looked upon as children, and since she cared enough for his letters to reply, and chose not to do it as much for other young men who would have been glad to correspond with her, why did not they both? Yet here she had to stop. Up to a certain point, as has been said, Enid was frank and communicative. She was gently dignified whenever the mother sought to understand the peculiar friendship that seemed to exist between herself and Wayne Pearson. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Conscience Salve. Meantime, in her faraway western home, the girl, Sarah, received her letters and answered them and lived her life. Those two items are put first because, in a sense, they were her life. Had the monthly mail failed her, it is not known what Sarah Thompson would have done. But it did not fail, and, having put as absolute trust in the writer of those letters as she did in the daily sunrise, she was not unhappy. She had argued the question out with her heart, and accepted, once for all, the fact that Wayne Pearson was not like other men, was far too high above them to be judged by their rules. Her letters— that at first had been so unlike her dream of what such a correspondence would be as to almost make her heart sick, had gradually grown to be models. After a little, she even ceased to mourn over the utter absence of all terms of endearment. Somewhere in her reading, she came across the story of the famous college president, whose words were so weighty that students hung upon them, and great men repeated them for authority. What did the president say about last night's address? So the story ran. Why, he said it was perfectly magnificent. The questioner wheeled in his chair and looked his astonishment at the speaker before he asked, 
Did President Blank say that? No, said the other, with a shamefaced laugh. But he said it's equivalent from him. He said it was good. This story Sarah Thompson hugged to her heart. She felt that it explained Wayne to her. His dear friend at the beginning and always your friend at the close grew to mean far more to her than the darlings and sweethearts that came to her girlfriends. Ruby Knowles, for instance, was engaged to Sam Scott, the young man whom Sarah had once imagined she admired. She wondered over it now as something too strange to understand, and his letters during the six weeks that he was away from home were spread out for Sarah's admiration. They began, My dearest girl, and were plentifully besprinkled with pet words and phrases from sweetheart and lovey down. It was an evidence of Sarah's development in several ways that she was able to assure herself that she would rather have always your friend. As the months moved on and it became necessary for her to absorb herself in something, Sarah Thompson chose the school in which she was still a teacher. To it she gave thought and time and prayer, and it gradually became apparent even to the dullest that she was making of the upper district what it never could have become but for her, a model school. The newly fledged young teachers, who winter after winter found their way to it, early learned that they must try at least to reach up to the standard of the assistant if they desired to hold the position. It became, in course of time, not an easy thing to do. Sarah Thompson had ideas. As she read and studied, they grew. She fell into the habit of explaining them as well as she could in those long, foreign-bound letters, and, curiously enough, Wayne Pearson grew interested in them, and grew intensely interested in the school, his school, as he began to have a kind of pride in calling it, Sarah's ideas, some of them very original, afforded him foundation for many a daydream, that being a habit in which he still luxuriated. He saw himself and Enid Wilmer established and recognized as patrons of the upper district, with Sarah Thompson for the leading teacher. They would assist her to make it a model indeed, and to make of herself a model teacher." When it occurred to him one day that here was a possible solution of his own difficulties, Sarah to become absorbed in her school, to fall in love with it indeed to such an extent as to make all other interests secondary and easily shifted, he hugged the thought to his heart and spent almost as much time as Sarah did in planning for the school. He entered into her ideas and explained them to her, and enlarged upon them until they became plans of which she had never dreamed. Gradually he began to send her appliances with which to carry out these ideas. Boxes and rolls and mysterious-looking packages began to come to her by mail, by express, by freight, some of them ordered from New York or Chicago, some of them actually crossing the sea to her and bearing that fascinating foreign mark or label. In due course of time, it came to pass that the upper district was the pride of the township. Then they began to come from Westover to see the new-fashioned maps and globes and charts and, what not, that that indefatigable young teacher had introduced. They gazed and questioned and wondered and admired, and the heart of Squire Willard swelled within him in pride, and he talked far and near about the upper district, and the strides it was taking. And the Westover Chronicle bristled with headlines once more, reporting its onward march, and making it plain enough, for those who wanted to understand, the real source of the wealth that had fallen upon Hardin Township. For the people in Westover, as well as the residents of Hardin, knew, every one of them, that Sarah Thompson's bow away out in foreign parts kept sending things to her all the time. In truth, Wayne's gifts were royal. If he had been trying to bury a troubled conscience under a wealth of modern educational appliances, he could not have heaped more lavish gifts upon the proud young teacher. 
when he sent a magnificent system of moving worlds sun and stars and earth for sarah to explain to the children of the upper district the mysteries of day and night and summer and winter the delight of the people knew no bounds the thing must have cost many hundreds of dollars why it could go all the district not only but the country around nay all westover in course of time came to see the wonder and to hear the happy sarah's explanation of it for she could explain it at least to their entire satisfaction wayne had written twelve pages telling her just how to do it the westover chronicle fairly exhausted its resources of exclamatory type to do justice to the exhibition and the proud young teacher sent in the next day's foreign mail a marked copy of the effort and cut out another copy of it to wear close to her heart for was not one dear name repeated by those types at least a dozen times happy sarah poor foolish sarah she was developing in other ways besides that of a teacher and demonstrator of new methods as a girl in the district school she had been fond of study in her loneliness she renewed her love for it she had lonely hours in these days or would have had if she had given herself time for them the young people of her world grew uninteresting and by degrees silly she did not enjoy their society nor their amusements and little by little unintentionally at first she drew farther and farther away from them until being friends with all the township she was really intimate with no one they grew to admiring sarah being proud of her boasting of her among themselves and letting her alone the first time they seemed actually to forget to invite her to a halloween frolic she cried a little she had not been to any of the neighborhood gatherings for months she had been so busy but to be forgotten well she must be busier she plunged into study as never before always being fond of books she lived in them now made them the companions of every waking hour she made rapid even amazing progress in french when one considers that she had no teacher but directly that sentence is written one realizes that it is not fair she had an excellent teacher wayne pearson had learned some time before this that he need not attempt to arrange a series of puzzles for sarah's leisure hours by writing partly in french evidently she mastered the letters readily enough her first timid effort to reply to them in the same language nearly took his breath away it was the first time he fully realized what strides the girl was making in the language but it pleased him he made it into a soothing salve for his conscience and spread it thickly what an avenue of culture he had opened to the girl but for him she would not even have known how to translate stray french phrases such as one finds in ordinary reading he added yet another chapter to his beautiful daydream sarah should become a magnificent french scholar she should go to france some day why not and perfect herself in pronunciation and become celebrated as a teacher and he and enid would talk together of her wonderful success and congratulate each other that it was their work let it be well understood that he always took himself severely to task after one of these dreams and assured himself that he was pledged in honor to one with whom enid walker could not in the nature of things have anything in common but he used his powerful influence to increase sarah's fondness for the french language and filled pages with explanatory notes on obscure french rules and by degrees discarded the english altogether and wrote everything in french but he still wrote his semi-occasional letters to enid keeping in touch with her life asking questions in so shrewd a way as to keep himself informed of her friendships and interests and letting his heart rejoice over her frankness that revealed her indifference to all mankind why should you want her to remain indifferent his troublesome conscience asked him occasionally and he sternly bade it be still 
once a wild hope sprang up in his heart sarah had much to say in her letters that winter about her associate in the school he was better educated she wrote than the others had been he reminded her a little just a little bit of him in some things though in others they couldn't be more unlike wayne grew deeply interested in the young man admired him suggested ways in which sarah could be helpful to him and by every method that he could conceive labored to increase the girl's interest evidently it deepened mr bateman had been showing her how to press flowers and had offered to get her some rare specimens not to be found in that part of the country then mr bateman was so glad to discover that she could read french he did not read it very well and was working on a subject that made it necessary for him to read certain french books she had promised to read aloud to him wayne blessed the day that he began to give sarah french lessons and waited in suspense and hope then came total silence two letters and mr bateman's name not mentioned he questioned so closely that sarah blushing with shame while she wrote confessed that mr bateman had misunderstood her helping him and she must have been to blame father said she was he said people ought to know what they were about in this world and not just by carelessness lead others into trouble and she was careless she supposed she had never thought of such a thing she was so sure that everybody knew that she belonged to him that sarah had grown reticent even on paper but she must be true mr bateman had asked her to become his wife and she had told him with surprise and pain that she was almost the same as a married woman and she thought he understood because folks gossiped so much she didn't think he could help it and wayne had groaned in spirit and put the hope of mr bateman forever away from him she was almost the same as a married woman then was he almost the same as a married man in all these ways the months and then the years slipped away and wayne pearson still lingered abroad he had taken his degree and spent an entire year in travel and it came to pass that he was rapidly nearing his twenty-fifth birthday and had not yet definitely settled just when he should sail for home that he was to sail soon he settled with his conscience but he told it angrily that that ought to satisfy it wasn't he to be trusted there were reasons now that the years of study that he had set for himself had been successfully passed and the year of travel that he had hoped for had been indulged why he felt in haste to go home and there were reasons why he felt as though he could never go how was he to face that upper district it was no easier now nay it was harder than it would have been at the first sarah might have improved and had no doubt but that she had she might have become an angel it would make no difference to him he had known all these years just what he wanted and but for that hateful story told him at that hateful wedding long ago he might have secured what he wanted be it observed that wayne pearson was still at work blaming rumor circumstance fate for all his experiences no he reminded himself occasionally that if he had not been a fool and rushed away taking for truth what was a false and malicious story furbished up to ruin him and tumbled headlong into the meshes woven for him out of ignorance and misunderstanding all might have been well but in the main he blamed that relentless fate which had pursued him ever since his father's second marriage and the name of the fate was always leon hamilton he had bitter reason for this it is true the determination to trace the rumor concerning enid's engagement had become almost morbid with him and bit by bit through the years he had ferreted out and pieced together the story until he knew to a certainty that leon hamilton had with patience and painstaking worthy of a better cause planned to have the rumor with enough details accompanying it to make it plausible float through just the right channels to reach his ears by what underhand methods he had discovered that such news could be as gall and wormwood to wane 
that young man had never been able to learn. He was obliged to content himself with the muttered statement that Leon Hamilton seemed always to have been in league with the evil one, and could doubtless discover by his aid what had never been committed to mortals. There had been times, of course, when this sorely beset young man had considered whether he should not take the honest way and frankly explain to Sarah the situation. If he had only done so at the first! If, during those first few weeks after leaving the school, he had written to her and been honest throughout, had told her of the mood in which he had returned from the wedding, and the mistake that her father had revealed to him, and his mistaken idea that as a man of honor he must abide by it, and his discovery of the falseness of the rumor he had heard while away, and the certainty that it revealed to him that his heart was not his to give, it might have been done. Sarah was true. He had not drawn her on, and she knew it. She would have accepted the situation, with pain perhaps, but with true womanly dignity, and in a little while she would have forgiven and forgotten him. But he had not been honest, he had been persistently false, and as the years passed had steadily fostered and cemented the falseness, until now she looked upon herself as almost a married woman. And her father, but as often as Wayne thought of the honest blacksmith, he found it difficult to suppress a groan. He could seem to hear his voice, and it was saying, "'Sho, a man that can't keep his promises can't help himself nor nobody else.' No, in his sane moments Wayne Pearson assured himself that it was too late. It might have been done if— that terrible if! He might well have groaned at thought of the honest blacksmith. He was honest to his heart's core, and wanted to believe in other people, and was troubled and anxious. Sho, he said to the long-suffering Mrs. Thompson, when a foreign mail came in, and Sarah had rushed away with her letter. Sho, how many years is he going on in that way? Teachin' of her. Who wants him to? He didn't ask her to be his scholar for a lifetime. He asked her to marry him. Anyhow, that's what honest folks thought he meant. But he ain't never said a word to me, not a solitary word and it's going on five years, and he a courtin' her all the while, and the queerest courtin' that ever I see in my life or heard tell of. I don't like it, I tell you now, and as sure as my name is Isaiah Thompson, if he don't... And then Mother Thompson would take him in hand and remind him of the steadiness of the foreign mail and of the lavish gifts for the school that came all the time, and why should a young man spend his money on the upper district if he didn't do it for Sarah's sake? Of course it was all right, and Sarah, she wasn't troubled. Only yesterday, when she was talking about some nonsense that the school children were having over, she said, Mother, when folks can make me believe that the sun isn't going to shine on this earth any more, why then maybe they can make me believe that Wayne Pearson isn't to be trusted but until then it isn't worth while to try. The poor father toned down his grumbling into inarticulate mutters, but he was sore-hearted and afraid. He knew the world better than his daughter did. It was an added anxiety to him that he could not talk with her freely about it all. His Sarah Jane had changed. She was just as loving as ever, and she was, for the most part, as cheery as a girl could be, and nobody could be more thoughtful of her old father and his comfort, but, for one thing, he could not joke with her any more, and he could not seem to so much as mention the young teacher to her. He couldn't tell what it was, but something about her stopped him as sure as he attempted it. The utmost he could do was to wish that he had never set eyes on the fellow, and this at times he did heartily. End of section 18。Chapter 19 of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 
Who is Sarah Jane? In the way that he had done all important things in life thus far, that is, following out a sudden impulse, Wayne Pearson at last went home to Aunt Crete in time to celebrate his twenty-fifth birthday. Up to twenty-four hours before he sailed, he had not been sure whether he would start in another week, or in two weeks, or in a month. The accident of a friend having engaged passage and being unable to go finally determined him. He could accommodate his friend by going, and he must go some time. Why not now? It is difficult to explain why a young man so exceptionally brilliant as Wayne Pearson certainly was, and with such excellent mental training as he had undoubtedly enjoyed, should order all his movements by the law of impulse, except on the basis that the one foolish mistake of his life had taken such hold upon him that it held his common sense in chains and left him to be the creature of the moment. It is painfully true that he shrank from decisions of all kinds, because deliberate calculation seemed to bring him nearer to that crisis in his life that he felt must come. To Aunt Crete's eyes, he was vastly improved. In truth, he kept his best for Aunt Crete. In her presence, he was again the genial boy, entering into a frolic with all his heart, yet with a background of manly dignity that he could assume on occasion in an instant of time. His aunt studied him carefully, and there were very few particulars in which she would have had him different. In one respect, he still puzzled and pained her. As a young boy, Wayne Pearson had been his aunt's model of youthful piety. His faith in God as his father, and Jesus Christ as his Savior, seemed to have been born with him, and to be strong and abiding. And Creed, listening to his youthful expositions of all things theological, had been wont to say to herself, Here is another exhibition of what a child can become who is consecrated to God from his birth. Wayne will never know the time when he became a Christian. I presume Samuel did not. Alas for the promise of his youth! What had become of that assured faith, and that precocious wisdom to which all things obscure to others were made plain. Just when and how did Wayne get so hopelessly drawn away from the narrow path as to have lost sight of it entirely? Aunt Crete did not know. She puzzled and wept and prayed over it. She tried all the devices known to a loving heart to win her boy to be frank with her on the subject, and failed. Up to a certain point, his conduct was satisfactory enough. He went to church with her regularly on Sundays, and gave respectful attention to all the services, bowing his head during prayer with every outward appearance of reverence. He even refrained from criticizing the sermon on the way home, out of regard for Aunt Crete. But the fond dream she had had that her boy Wayne, when he came again, would take his place at the head of her modest household and conduct family worship morning and evening, and take part in the midweek prayer meeting, and, in short, be in this, as in all things, a model to young men, this was Aunt Crete's disappointment. She tried to argue with him a little. Why were things as they were? "'You led prayers in your school, you told me,' she said tentatively. He smiled gravely when he thought of it. That experience seemed to have been a hundred years ago. What would Aunt Crete think of the role of those majestic prayers that he used to read? That was when I was a child, he told her, with his fascinating smile. Now I have put away childish things. Then gravely, No, Aunt Crete, it is too bad to disappoint you in anything, but I am no hypocrite. I am not a praying man, and I will not repeat words of prayer when my heart does not mean them. I am as far from being what you consider a Christian as a man can well be, I imagine. But, Wayne, why is it? Your grandfather, whom you grow more like in manner every day of your life, was as stanch a Christian as the country about here has ever known, and your dear mother had as strong a faith as any woman that ever lived. 
it is wonderful and dreadful to me that you have not followed her in this i am sure that you will some time i cannot but be certain that her believing prayer for you will be answered but i cannot bear to think that you will wait to be driven home plenty of people do take the wilderness road i know but i thought you chose the narrow one in your babyhood and would have sunshine all the way then wayne's face would darken and he would say coldly i have had none too much sunshine in my life i can assure you aunt crete if it is your idea that god scourges and drives people in order to win them that way has certainly been tried with me but it has failed as i think it would with everybody he thought this wise young man that because his mother had gone early home to heaven and his father had chosen to marry again and his stepbrother had not been to his mind that he was a terribly ill-used forsaken man hidden away in his heart not fully owned by himself was this obstacle in the way of his giving god his service he ought to have had a happy life he had meant to be good and true and honorable he had been sad but not rebellious he told himself even when his mother went away he had determined to be brave and bright and to be all things to his father he had done his best and with what result his father had turned away from him and married a stranger and brought her home to his mother's room even that he might have borne in time he had meant to try but there had been brought also another boy who had been allowed to steal his place his possessions his home even his father and had gone on through the years unrebuked so that now he had no father and no home if this was the loving kindness of god why then he was too well trained to complete the sentence even in thought but he let the subject rankle as much as it would aunt crete after trying by all means in her power to win him owned to herself that she must let it alone and give herself to prayer and wait for god to find the road by which this child of many prayers would be willing to travel home to his mother there was another person if aunt crete had but known it who was making and had been making through the years every effort in her power to win wayne pearson for christ there had been times when sarah's letters would be full of the subject when her eager prayerful longing for him would crop out every few lines despite her efforts to write about something else knowing as little about the real life of a christian as the young man did he admitted to himself that sarah was evidently growing in that direction also there had been wonderful doings in the old red schoolhouse no longer ago than last winter one after another of his pupils those for whom he had been anxious and those about whose futures he was most skeptical had settled what sarah declared was the all-important question and begun to live for christ among them was beat armitage the incorrigible he had taken his heart full of hatred and revenge to the lord and lo it had become a heart of love sarah was almost eloquent over that description if he could have seen beat armitage one night after a meeting cross the room and take joey by the hand and say so that all could hear my brother i have not been a brother to you but i mean to deserve the name after this i ask you to forgive everything i have ever done to trouble you and let me begin over again with christ in my heart wayne pearson had read the story with a curling lip and had told himself if he had heard it he would have wanted to knock beat armitage down he to ask forgiveness if that miserable joey had done it why and then as if to satisfy him that was the very next news the half-brother joey had become a follower of jesus christ and the two brothers led the boys prayer meeting together but the night before and then wayne though his lips still curled had no word that he cared to speak and he met sarah's earnest appeal then and afterward only by marked and continued silence 
Well, he lingered through the sunny weeks at Aunt Crete's, letting the summer slip away from him, and coming to no decisions in any line. There was somewhere back in his inner consciousness the determination to devote himself to teaching. Certain of his professors knew this, and twice during the summer came flattering openings to him to commence his life work as instructor in leading colleges. He considered them and put them from him. The answer he gave on paper was that there were reasons why he could not positively decide as yet, and he must not keep them waiting. What he told his heart was, that once settled at work, the anxieties of Isaiah Thompson with regard to his daughter's future could no longer be ignored. As long as he remained indefinite as to where he should live and what he should do, nothing could be expected of him. It was all very well for the poor fellow to assure his aunt that he was no hypocrite. He said nothing of the kind to himself. Instead, he told himself, with growing emphasis as the days passed, that he was a hypocrite of the most despicable sort, and found a shade of comfort occasionally in calling himself hard names. One experience of the early summer that had opened his eyes more fully than before to his position ought to be recorded here. On the steamer, during his homeward voyage, he fell in with a college friend who had married and settled in one of the charming suburban towns near New York. Thither Wayne allowed himself to be taken for a few days' visit before going to his aunt's. Behold, but a square away from his friend's beautiful home was settled another college friend, and his wife was an intimate friend of Enid Wilmer, and Enid was that very week making her a long-promised visit. Wayne hugged to his heart the fact that all this had been entirely unknown to him, and if he had believed in providence, as he once did, would have called it a providential arrangement. As it was, he felt, without inquiring into the logic of reasoning, that the accident, in some way, entitled him to have as pleasant a week with Enid as he could. Of course, under the circumstances, there was abundant opportunity. He needed not to lift his hand or express a thought. Walks and drives and sales and tennis games arranged themselves, always with giving Enid to him as a companion. Since the other friends were mated for life, what was more natural and reasonable than this arrangement? They went one evening to Table Rock to get a wonderful view of the sunset. Enid was a girl who was singularly susceptible to the solemnly grand in nature, and, as is the case with true natures, the scene had hushed all desire for conversation. She had stood apart, rapt and silent, gazing upon the crimson and gold of the distant sky, and seeming to see veritable angels moving in and out of the massy bars of golden light that had resolved themselves into turrets and towers, as though they belonged to the palaces of the city of God. All the others of the party had moved on down the hill. Their voices could be heard in the near distance, beginning to chatter again. And still Enid, unconscious of it all, stood and gazed and gazed. And Wayne, a step behind her, stood with folded arms, and waited and gazed, not at the glory in the sky, but at the fair girl who was being held by it. Suddenly some movement of a twig, or the rustle of a bird winging by, arrested her. She turned, and discovered that they were quite alone. Why, she said, where are the others? Have they gone? She never knew how it happened, and certainly Wayne did not. There must have been a misstep, and she must have been nearer the edge of the overhanging rock than she thought. For an instant she wavered and would have fallen, then she clutched at the jagged rock with one hand, and then Wayne had her in his arms and was carrying her quite to the beaten path. And what his white and trembling lips were saying was, Oh, my darling, are you hurt? It had been a single moment of peril. It seemed that a miracle must have been wrought to save her from the fall. The ravine was many feet below, and the way down was lined with cruel, sharp-edged rocks. 
the deathly pallor of Wayne's face was certainly natural enough under the circumstances. But Enid's face, for a moment pale, flushed until, in its fair beauty, it seemed like a reflection of the glory of the sunset. She had struggled instantly to free herself, and then were heard voices nearing them. "'Why, Enid, dear, aren't you coming? We did not notice that you were left behind.' "'I am here,' said Enid, and she ran and clasped the hand of the pretty matron whose guest she was, and walked with her back to the village, while Wayne and the deserted husband paced slowly on behind. Given a sensitive, naturally an honorable, nature, such as Wayne Pearson possessed, and can the night that followed be imagined? For one single, perilous second, he had spoken truth. Truth! let him not deny it to his soul at least. Had she heard? Oh, she must have heard. What was to become of him? In either case, even if she had not heard, what was to become of him? How was this terrible thing to end? He did not think. Not a rational thought passed through his excited brain that night. He just tossed and exclaimed mentally, and saw himself at the bottom of a very real precipice with no way out. What he did next day was what he told himself that, being an honorable man, he must do. He went not near Enid Wilmer all day long. There had been no engagement that necessitated their meeting. It had simply been a tacit understanding between the young couples whose guests they were, that they were to spend much time together, of course and this day, being Wayne's last, various plans that had been until then overlooked came up for discussion. Wayne negatived them all, so far as he was concerned. He had some writing that must be done in the morning, and in the afternoon he must go to New York and look up a neglected friend. Despite fascinating schemes and some coaxing, he rigidly adhered to his program and left for home by the next morning's train without other good-bye for Enid than the carefully worded message that he left with his hostess for her. And the girl? Well, she had heard. Girls always hear. It was not the fright or even the sudden rescue that brought that lovely glow to her fair face. It was the sound of words that, let Wayne Pearson say what he might about being a man of honor, her heart told her she had a right to expect from the young man who had so carefully and steadily been her friend through all these years. That day of desertion was a surprise and a pain to her, but when a woman trusts, she trusts. By night she had quieted all her heart throbs, a touch of rising indignation with the rest, and constructed a theory. For some reason, and since he was what he was, Undoubtedly it was a good reason he was not prepared to speak the thought of his heart. Perhaps he had made a solemn promise to his dead mother that he would not engage himself until he was a certain age, or until a certain thing had happened. Perhaps he had pledged himself to accomplish some definite work before he spoke words that would commit him to any woman. Perhaps, oh, perhaps any one of a dozen theories, what mattered which it was, he was good, and he was true, and he was grand in every way. And she was his darling. Sometime, and it must be that it would be very soon, else he who had been so careful of his words would not have been thrown off his guard even by her peril, very soon, probably, he would tell her the whole sweet story, and then she would understand. Until then, couldn't she trust? Yes, indeed, she could trust him forever. It was under such conditions that Wayne came home to Aunt Crete and managed to conduct himself outwardly as to make her think that he was the same dear, heart-free boy. And he spent, all things considered, by far the most miserable summer of his life. The only salve to his conscience was found in maintaining utter silence toward Enid. She had written the last letter, and their correspondence had never been sufficiently regular to make delays embarrassing. Wayne by no means told himself that his correspondence with her was at an end. 
he simply said that he would wait until he decided what to write, and would not allow himself to ask just what that sentence meant. Enid and her parents had gone west to visit some faraway uncles and cousins, and to see the Garden of the Gods, and Central City, and other places of note. They expected to be constantly changing their address. Indeed, Enid had frankly told him that one drawback to her summer would be the irregularity and uncertainty of their mail. When he wondered what she would think of his long delay, this comforted him. Moreover, he grew irregular even with those monthly letters that had heretofore been so punctual. Some way, to write to Sarah from New England seemed very unlike writing to her from Berlin or Paris. He was frightfully near to her. He must go to her. The exclamations hint at the consternation with which both thoughts filled him. It is not probable that he would have lingered quite so long had not his aunt fallen ill. She was at no time seriously ill, but he told himself with excellent reason that she would miss him doubly while she was ill. So he stayed, and gave his days to petting her in the most charming ways that love and ingenuity could devise, and his nights, too many of them, to miserable thoughts. Then suddenly came one of those bombshells that seemed to be needed to quicken him into action. This time it was a telegram, more imperative in its message than even telegrams are given to being. Sarah Jane is very sick, you must come at once. Isaiah Thompson Aunt Crete was dressed in her new wrapper that morning, and sat in her armchair by the window. She had the open telegram in her hand when Wayne came back from a trip to town, whither he had gone to execute her commissions. I opened it, she said. I thought it was from your father and might need immediate answer. Who is Sarah Jane? End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty The Demands of Decency. How he got his trunk packed and the hundred last things attended to, and evaded Aunt Crete's bewildered curiosity, and got himself at last on board the night express, he could not have told then nor afterward. In some respects it was a more bewildering journey than that first one he had taken over the same route. It affords a curious illustration of the young man's state of mind to note how promptly and unquestioningly he obeyed the summons. This was what bewildered Aunt Crete. "'It is a queer message,' she grumbled. "'I should have thought that at least he could have said, "'Can you come?' If you were going to marry the girl, her father couldn't have done more than that. It is a good deal to ask, I must say, of just a teacher. But then, I suppose they are frightened about her, and want to humor every notion she has. How old is she? Just a little girl, I suppose? Wayne was giving attention to a refractory lock, and with color heightened, no doubt by the struggle he was having with it, allowed his aunt to suppose what she would, and turned her attention as quickly as possible to something else. He will remember forever the curious mixture of pain and disgust with which he finally swung himself from the train at the Hardin station. His reflections during the journey had certainly been very different from those of five years before, but they were not less gloomy and miserable." He dreaded the ordeal through which he was now to pass more than he had any other in his life. He had not believed in Sarah's illness. She was not well, of course, but it was evident to him that the sturdy blacksmith had taken advantage of what was, no doubt, a slight illness, to summon him peremptorily to his duty. Very well, he had come, and his mind was at last settled." if only he had settled it years ago. He should tell Sarah the whole miserable truth and throw himself on her mercy. 
he had not much doubt of Sarah. He believed in her goodness and in her sturdy purity of heart. But the father! Well, if they held him, why, he was held. He should not run away. He was a man of honor. But not of such honor as the blacksmith demanded. It was a bitter portion for this proud soul that he must that day sink himself forever in the estimation of the blacksmith. There was another depth of misery at which he could not himself look. Suppose that Sarah's influence should prevail, and he should go from there free. As a man of honor, must he not tell Enid the whole story? And what would Enid say? Then the train whistled once more, and he was at the station. They were there by the half-dozen to meet him, his old pupils grown to manhood and womanhood now. He resented this. Such coarse publicity! How could decent people endure to make themselves a town talk in this way? He passed them with cold nods, but they seemed not surprised. They held back with strange embarrassment. How do you do, Professor? they said, the men lifting their hats respectfully and looking after him gravely. One pressed nearer. He had to look a second time to be sure that it was Beat Armitage. The years had changed him, certainly. Beat was studying music in the nearest large city and was going to make a success with his voice. Wayne had known that, but he had not realized that Beat had become outwardly a gentleman. He held out his hand, but had no word to speak. Wayne wondered and tried to be friendly. Well, Armitage, he said, here we are again, but you have changed so much that I hardly knew you. I have a carriage waiting for you, Professor, was all the reply he received. The carriage door was thrown open, and Wayne motioned into it. Then Armitage closed the door, and he was whirled away alone. This was a relief. But Hardin must have changed in many ways. Who would have supposed that they would consider the ceremony of a carriage necessary? Nobody had seen fit to ask him where he was going. The whole state knew, it seemed, that he belonged to the blacksmith's family. He sneered at the thought and chafed under it, and was in his most cynical and at the same time bewildered mood when the carriage drew up at last before Isaiah Thompson's door. He half expected to meet Sarah in the hall. Her invalidism, he told himself, would probably be equal to that. A crowd of curious boys and some little girls were gathered not far from the door. This angered him the more. We ought to have arranged for a public meeting in the town hall, he told himself, as he seized his valise from the hand of the officious driver. Even he knew him. Never mind that, Professor, he said respectfully. I'll see to it. Then the door opened, not waiting for his knock, and there appeared not Sarah, not the burly blacksmith, but Enid Wilmer. She is living yet, Mr. Pearson, but you must come at once. Her voice was as calm as the summer morning, and yet as cold as if it came from lips of ice. She turned at once, without giving him so much as a hand clasp, and ran upstairs. Wayne followed her in a bewilderment that was torture, followed her to his old room. There, kneeling beside the bed, was Isaiah Thompson, and there, with her face close to the pillow, was the gray head of Mother Thompson, and lying white and beautiful among the pillows was Sarah. Never in all his tortured imaginings of the scene, when he should go to her, had she looked in the least like this. There was radiant beauty on her face and in her eyes, but it was unearthly beauty. She turned her eyes as the door swung open, and the radiance deepened. Oh, Wayne, she said distinctly, and with a mighty effort tried to raise her head, and it fell back. And the mother gave a great cry, and those who had been watching for the end knew that it had come. Sarah was gone away where she could trouble him no more. An hour afterward, the stricken father came to the room that had been assigned to Wayne, 
and told in broken sentences interrupted by great waves of grief what he could tell of her story he had wrung wayne's hand in a grasp so mighty that the pain of it still lingered in that supreme moment of sorrow all the forebodings of evil that the father had felt were laid to rest wayne had responded promptly to his summons the first train by which they could by any possibility hope for his coming had brought him and he had looked like one stricken to the earth he had loved her then and had been honest with her all the time and had meant the best for her and the endless delays that had seemed so unreasonable had been necessary sarah had been right in that as in all things he was true the father's heart went out to him in utter surrender from that hour he went to him as soon as he could you see it was all so sudden he said trying to apologize for the fierceness of the blow oh she has been sick off and on for three weeks or more but not a mite of danger the doctor said just run down yes she was run down and had good reason for being you know that place we used to call the hollow well there's been sickness there all summer there mostly is a shiftless set as ever lived Sho, to think my girl would have to be sacrificed for such as them that's what it is professor sacrificed she would go there and set up nights with the sick children and bathe em and fuss with em days and do things that their mothers didn't know enough to do and it was too much for her first thing we knew she had the fever nothing dangerous about it the doctor said kept saying it all the time just slow and aggravating like on account of its slowness and you see we was sort of expecting you every day and sarah jane she wouldn't have you scared by any word that she was sick and so it run on till all of a sudden she took this turn for the worse and for twenty-four hours she was just waiting to set her eyes on you once more afore she went to heaven i thank my god that she had that anyhow here the story broke and the father laid his great head on the little table near which he sat and shook the chair and the table with his mighty sobs and the miserable young man looking indeed like one stricken kept his station by the mantel against which he leaned and knew no word to speak that girl named her well began mr thompson again when he had recovered self-control she said she was an angel of light to the folks in the hollow and so she was everybody will tell you that sho it ain't the hollow folks only she was a blessing and a comfort to everybody she came near that girl loves her like a sister and she ain't been acquainted with her but a few weeks you know who i mean the girl with a queer name she said she was acquainted with you the last name is wilmer enid said wayne mechanically it seemed to him that it was the little plaster of paris image of samuel on the corner of the mantel who spoke not he yes said the blacksmith enid curious name i can't remember it but sarah jane took to it and to her they took to each other i never see the like she come here about six weeks ago she and her mother they was going to stay somewhere in some quiet place while the father went on to look after some mines and they just happened here come to see that indian mound you know eight or ten miles north of here well the girl took a notion to stay they wanted her to go to the mountains and to the lakes and i dunno where they didn't want her but she had just made up her mind to stay here and stay she did and she took a notion from the first minute to sarah jane she see your picture that one you had took for the scholars you know sarah jane got it copied she missed her somehow and the girl what did you say her name was yes enid saw that and knew it in a minute and they got to talking about you i s'pose her and sarah jane and it made her feel kind of friendly to sarah jane to find that she belonged as you may say to one that she was so well acquainted with and they just took to each other she has been a great comfort 
I'll say that for her. My girl has clung to her most amazing right through this sickness. And she wasn't a mite afraid, and wouldn't go away when they began to talk about her getting the fever. Nothing catchin' about the fever, the doctor said, nothing at all. It was just a low state of the system that made her take it. Them are his very words. And to think I believed his story to the last, that she would get up and be stronger than ever. Oh my, oh my! Another great wave of pain, and Wayne's misery, so deepened by all he had heard, that it seemed to him the only way of relief would be to lie down still and cold in the parlor below where they had placed Sarah. He lived through the terrible days that followed. From sheer inability to talk to anyone, he kept his room carefully. They brought him food and respected his grief. Enid, he knew, was much in the house. She and her mother, acting as though they were sisters bereaved, instead of as strangers. He heard her soft step on the stairs, and her low voice speaking tender words to the broken-hearted mother, who clung to her even as her child had done. But she spoke no word to him. She passed him swiftly and silently, with a faraway, respectful bow, when they chanced to meet in the hall or on the stairs. He felt as far removed from her as if he himself had sunken into that ravine from which he had rescued her, and she had gone up into the waiting glory. It was young Armitage who came to him from time to time, low-voiced, thoughtful, himself heavily stricken, to inquire as to whether this or that arrangement would suit him. Mr. Thompson had said that everything was to be just as he, the professor, wanted it. Wayne groaned in spirit over the words, and took up his burden. He must be chief mourner then. Decency, it seemed, demanded it. Nay, more than that, regard for the memory of the dead and the sorrow of the stricken living demanded it. He must not say those words to Isaiah Thompson that he had come a thousand miles intending to say. He was free, it is true, but only death had freed him. No, he was not free, he was bound by all the laws that govern propriety and decency to pose before the world as the intended husband of the girl they would meet to honor. It was an awful mockery, but it was a solemn one. He had played the hypocrite for five years, and he must go through to the bitter end. He gave his pocket book, well filled, to Armitage, and told him to come for more when that was gone, and to do everything that money could do to honor the memory of the dead, and not to let him hear one word of the details. And when Beat Armitage went away with soft tread and a face of speechless pain, the poor young man left behind groaned aloud in his misery as there flashed before him the thought that that other one was stricken indeed. He remembered that there was not many months' difference between their ages, his and Sarah's, and that they had been much together, and he translated rightly the look on the young man's face. If they could but change places, he and Armitage! How freely would he pour out his money, and how faithfully he would give his time to making the last tokens of love and respect all that they could be, if Armitage, the honestly bereaved, might take his place as chief mourner. That evening there came up with his tea tray a letter. He devoured the handwriting with his eyes, and left his tea untasted to read the contents. Enid's handwriting. It began without formula of any sort. I was to tell you things that it seems not well to keep from you longer. Her dear love and trust were to be given to you. She wanted you, for some reason, to know especially that she had never suffered one hour of pain through distrusting you. She had been sure that the long separation was necessary, and was pain to you as to her. If you came in time, she would tell you herself how blessed her life had been by your love. But if you did not, I was to deliver the message. I cannot do it justice. You, who know the strong, true heart of the girl whose love you won, can imagine it. 
there was another message more earnest if possible a pleading cry from her very soul she wants to wait for you in heaven and to be sure that you will come i place the word in capitals to express if i can the intensity of her plea i feel that i am but a poor channel through which to pour the love and hope of that brave true heart if you had been with her and heard her for yourself you could never have forgotten the scene as long as you live i feel that i have learned something of what it is to love with an utter abandon of self and all selfish aims i count it a privilege to have had opportunity to be with and minister to the closing hours of such a woman i will not intrude sympathy upon you enid if the poor young man who struggled alone with his pain and his remorse had needed anything to complete his humiliation this was the added touch what must enid think of him now and he could not explain could not make her understand how it all was and that he had meant from the first nothing but honor and true nobility in the name of decency he must keep silent now his brief instructions concerning the funeral were carried out well young armitage had been out in the world of late he knew what custom considered necessary in order to show proper respect for the poor clay that the soul leaves behind he saw to it that everything was as it should be and the town helped him well all hardened not only but the people of the surrounding towns for miles away and many from westover besides came to the funeral the people told for years afterward what a peculiarly solemn time it was and what a long array of carriages followed poor sarah to the grave armitage had ventured upon one question more would the professor ride in the carriage with mr and mrs thompson or wayne interrupted him with such a short sharp no that he turned away at once believing that he understood westover sent its finest carriage for his use and in accordance with the custom of the region it followed close behind the hearse with wayne sitting alone chief mourner of course the blacksmith said when armitage began an explanation that is as it should be it is his right it shall be admitted also that the father's sore heart found a crumb of consolation in it sarah had her rights at last the one for whom she had lived in all sweetness and trust for long years was as close to her now as could be arranged all the world his world saw and understood no none of them understood the weight of misery filling that first carriage to appreciate it let it be remembered that from the first wayne pearson had meant to be true at any cost to himself to his idea of honor that it was a mistaken idea may perhaps be admitted without argument but such as it was he had tried to abide by it alone in that carriage following that fair clay being followed by a father and mother who had lost all they had he felt the veriest hypocrite that the world contained at times it was almost as much as he could do to hold himself from opening the carriage door and shouting out to the decorous crowd that it was all a mistake a cruel mistake and had been from the first of course he did nothing of the kind he sat with folded arms and let the carriage wind its slow way in and out among the graves he alighted at the proper time and stood with bowed head while the simple service was conducted at the open grave the crowd watched him curiously and pushed a little in order to get a better view and whispered to one another that the professor looked like death in one of the carriages not far behind the immediate family rode enid and her mother it was the poor girl's wish mamma enid explained to the bewildered mother you will go with me to the very end won't you she said and i promised as they turned away from the grave wayne caught a glimpse of her pale pure face she was not looking at him nor at the grave the day was westering 
and she had turned her eyes toward the glory of the coming sunset her face reminded him of the hour at table rock that time when for once during all these weary hateful years his heart had spoken and he had said oh my darling it seemed an added hatefulness and hypocrisy to think of it now and he turned away angry with himself and with all the world i didn't think the professor would be so cut up said squire willard as they talked it all over that evening he has stayed away so long that somehow a pause and then a long-drawn sigh but it's a genuine thing sure enough i saw his face when he turned away from the grave and it looked as though he had buried all the hopes he had in life end of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of By Way of the Wilderness by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One Whither. Once again, Wayne Pearson took the midnight train from Hardin, and this time it was Enid instead of Sarah who watched him disappear down the one long street of the village. It might have been a small bit of comfort to his troubled soul had he known that she stood in the moonlight at the window of her room and listened to his last footfall while bitter tears rained from her eyes and yet it is doubtful if he would have been consoled either had he known the cause of her deepest sorrow it was not that she had lost him and that another had apparently won the first place in his heart but that one whom she had trusted and honored had fallen from the pedestal of integrity upon which he had stood in her eyes he had bidden her good-bye earlier in the evening a lingering hand-clasp on his part and he had tried to look into her eyes to see if he read contempt there but they were cast down and would not meet his own then he had gone out and indulged his old propensity for tramping about that he might be alone and not obliged to talk all the old liking and admiration for the professor showed itself on the part of Sarah's father and mother as they bade him good-bye, heaping blessing on his head, even though they were unaware that the envelope he slipped into the mother's hand held a liberal check which he begged them to accept as an expression of his gratitude for all their kindness. So that leaf of his life was turned over, and he walked away free from chains that had bound him what next and whither should he turn his footsteps he shrank from every place he had ever been in before he could not return to aunt crete her questionings would be torture after reflection he decided to go for a time to one of the large western cities and study the vast tract of country known as the west he was too unfamiliar with that region and this would occupy his thoughts no sooner was he established in the prosperous city a gateway to western wilds than there arrived at the hotel he had chosen for headquarters a party who furnished an unexpected opportunity for carrying out a part of his scheme as he entered the dining-room one morning whom should he meet in the hall but his old college friend mcfarlane for whom he felt sincere regard warm greetings were exchanged and the two young men took seats together at the table. There was much to be talked over, as each gave to the other experiences of the years that had passed since leaving college. In part at least, of course, there were sealed records which neither young man revealed to the other, not at the first meeting, if ever. It was while the two were driving about viewing the city that Macfarlane suddenly exclaimed, pearson do you know you are the man of all others that i am delighted to see just now i expect to go into the wildest west in a few days i've joined an exploring party sent out by the government to explore the yellowstone region that vast wilderness lying just on the borders of civilization and i want you to go along i have a vivid recollection that you are a worshipper at nature's shrine think of over three thousand square miles of nature unspoiled by man i know that will be an inducement to you 
a question or two from his listener encouraged mcfarlane and he went on eagerly to dilate upon the advantages of such a trip you know the expedition that went out last year brought back famous reports it must be magnificent according to all accounts there is every variety of scenery and wonders without end mountains plains forests rivers lakes geysers canyons and even volcanoes of course the game is splendid and the opportunity for adventure unlimited come go with us won't you it will be like a glimpse of the primeval world to get up there where nature's heart beats strong amid the hills mcfarlane was surprised that his friend did not hesitate and interpose objections and say he would think about it before committing himself to a decision and he regarded wayne with a keen look when that young man declared with ill-concealed bitterness that he was more than willing to go anywhere away from the world after having urged him with enthusiasm to go he nevertheless felt called upon to warn him that the journey was a perilous one and the hardships great his friends too what of them wayne smiled at that who in the wide earth cared about his comings and goings except the dear aunt up in berkshire as for being free he was free as any vagabond in the universe he caught at the proposition to join the expedition with eagerness the deeper he could bury himself the better it suited him moreover it was in the line of his own plans and an opportunity that might come but once in a lifetime he was soon suitably equipped and the party set out in high spirits the long journey by rail was monotonous and all rejoiced when leaving railroads and civilization behind them they mounted horses and galloped away in the freshness of an early summer morning even wayne caught the infection of buoyant spirits in the exhilarating atmosphere and sense of freedom as they skimmed over the plains the novel experience the keen enjoyment of nature's wonders and the gay companionship left him little room for gloomy meditations he felt like one who had cast his past behind him and entered upon a new stage of existence he wished it might last forever this swift ride among the fragrant pines it was typical of life this pathway through the wilderness but yesterday it lay over breezy uplands and sunny slopes stretching away in the distance was a clear flower-bordered path blue skies transporting views on every side and the gleam of bright wings with a grand chorus of wild sweet airs and it was yet like life when mists turned blue skies to gray and the path lay over mountain passes or in the lowlands where uprooted trees barred the way through the storm-swept valley it was one night when wayne's turn had come to keep watch of the fires which they had built for protection against wild beasts that his troubles came down upon him like a nightmare usually two shared the night watch but wayne had declined the offer of companionship saying he had writing to do and would be unsociable while the others stretched themselves in profound sleep the one silent watcher sat gazing into the fire recalling the events of the past few weeks especially every word and look of enid's when last they had met the memory of which he had heretofore steadily put from him but now haunting thoughts trooped into his mind and took possession oh those days of torture the end of a labyrinth of mistakes resulting in being misinterpreted and misunderstood and probably scorned by her and he with no opportunity to speak a word in his own defence he could see again the cold disapproval in her true eyes when she had met him at mr thompson's door suddenly a resolute look came into his face and he told himself that he did not intend to rest quietly under her censure without an attempt to vindicate his honour it was bad enough but he was not the contemptible creature she evidently believed him to be he would write out the whole plain truth and send it to her as soon as possible he would begin at once 
in a capacious pocket of his coat were writing materials enough to last a considerable time he had thought to make full notes of the topography of the country as well as jot down the incidents of the journey but the writing that rapidly filled the pages of a tablet was of intenser interest than anything of that sort could be to vindicate myself as far as possible i must go back a few years in my history he wrote in his letter to enid then there followed an account of the cause and manner of his leaving home his teaching the story of his relations with sarah thompson and the wretched mistake which the immature judgment of his young manhood had allowed to go uncorrected believing that such was the only noble course and how it had culminated in misery through the unhappy years i may never see you again he wrote but whether i do or not i want you to know that i have been guilty of no greater sins in this connection than the carelessness of youth and what i now see to have been an error of judgment since the morning we stood together in the woods and said good-bye i have cherished in my heart the image of the girl who then gave me a white rose it has been my precious treasure through wanderings on sea and land because it was to me a type of herself never has there been a throb of my heart or even a straying of fancy for any other woman never did i knowingly in thought word or deed give sarah thompson reason to suppose that i had more than friendly interest in her until i fancied that circumstances compelled me to engage myself to her the words i spoke to you at table rock which forced themselves from my lips when i was off my guard were my heart's deepest secret and the truth which i longed to tell you months ago but could not honourably because of what you now know you may imagine my deep distress at being obliged to go through what i did at sarah's funeral posing as chief mourner and feeling like the veriest hypocrite that ever breathed i had already decided before the summons came to tell sarah the truth for i could not longer lend myself to deceit i am glad she was spared that pain now and you can understand why i did not disturb her father and mother by any such revelation and why i was obliged to act the hypocrite to the bitter end my punishment for egotism in not seeking advice from older and wiser ones for violating the strongest principle of my manhood and allowing myself to appear to be true in relations to which my whole soul revolted has been at times almost greater than i could bear especially the thought that your confidence in me is shattered so my friend even if you cannot give me what i dare not ask i pray you let me at least have kindly judgment from the one being who is dearer to me than the whole world besides and believe me that i hate abhor every false way he had not felt so great a sense of relief in a long time as when he folded those sheets placed them in an envelope sealed and addressed it now even if he never came safely through the wilderness his comrades would send the letter and enid would know the whole truth that he had meant to be all that was right and honourable and learn that he had loved her and her alone and then he wondered again for the hundredth time whether that rosy glow that overspread her face at table rock was the mere reflection of the sun or what he hoped it might have been but then he grew hot and uncomfortable when he reflected upon what she must have thought of him afterward no man could be accounted honourable who had spoken words like those to a girl and then suddenly retreated it was after the expedition had reached the heart of the forest that they came one day upon a piled-up mass of trees uprooted by the storm which made a wall high and wide across their path to add to the difficulty the undergrowth on either side was extremely dense every member of the party at once became sure that he could find a way through or around the barrier there was a fascination about exploring for oneself hard to be resisted by the more venturesome and each plunged into the forest in different directions with the understanding that whoever found egress was to signal to the others 
it was after a long weary struggle that the party found themselves upon the trail again their satisfaction turned to dismay however when they discovered that one of their number was missing where is pearson one shouted to another excitedly then the woods echoed to his name and anxious glances passed between the men when no response came to their signals how could he have got out of hearing so soon asked one and another replied you forget it is many hours since we came upon the blockade he probably made a dash into the woods and became separated from us at the very first he is an impulsive fellow said one and a brave daring spirit as ever breathed mcfarlane answered with a frown they drew near each other and consulted finally deciding to put no greater distance than was necessary between themselves and the comrade from whom they were separated and so would go into camp as soon as they reached an available spot and then gradually after the manner of men most of them settled down into the comfortable conviction that it would be all right pearson would surely turn up in the morning nevertheless they instructed the watchman to give the signals at intervals through the night and the one lone horseman who by the light of the moon pushed his way through tangled undergrowth what of him he had fancied when the way became blocked that by circling about somewhat he could reach a clear space visible in the distance which must be the trail but he would experiment somewhat before mentioning it to the others his faithful horse had almost human sense and would work his way through difficult places where many another animal would have reared and plunged and refused to go on he went expecting each moment to shout to the others to follow him unfortunately the rest of the party before discovering his disappearance had decided to move in an exactly opposite direction consequently every advance of each placed them still further apart and wayne by many unavoidable turnings at last became confused and lost all sense of the direction of the trail when shouts and signals brought no response from the others he was not so greatly dismayed as might have been supposed separations had occurred before and they always got together afterward so he rode on confident that he had found the right path believing that his companions would soon reach it by another route even when darkness closed about him it caused no alarm he selected a spot for his bedroom picketed his horse built a fire wrapped his blanket about him and lay down to sleep with the feeling that supper might add to his comfort and that he should have a keen appetite for the camp breakfast next morning he was far too weary to feel either loneliness or fear and slept soundly rising once or twice to replenish the fire at early dawn he was still on his way again it was still dark in the woods but there was no time to be lost certainly he was on a trail that led somewhere although the pine needles continually falling sometimes covered all trace of it it was after weary hours of travel and breakfast still an unknown quantity that wayne dismounted to cheer his discouraged horse by a rub down and a rest good fellow he said with one arm about his neck after the old fashion of caressing liff senior you and i are lost did you know it the faithful creature lifted his pointed ears gave a cheerful whinny and rubbed his nose on his master's hand as if to say cheer up i'll stand by you alas his promises were like some human creatures soon broken wayne left him to browse about unhitched as had always been his custom while he walked a few rods away to an opening in the woods from which he could see several vistas he stood trying to decide which one probably led in the direction of the lake where he thought the party might be encamped it was but a moment or two when he heard a scramble and turning saw one of the smaller wild animals of the forest darting away in one direction and horror of horrors liff in another 
he shouted to the horse but fear had taken possession of him with frantic leaps and bounds that cleared all obstacles he fled like the wind and vanished in the distance it was useless to try to pursue him and yet his master did tearing as recklessly through what barred his way as the horse himself and calling his name long after he knew it was in vain keeping up his weary pursuit until he was convinced of its utter hopelessness liff was gone and with him blankets guns revolvers fishing tackle matches everything gone except the clothes he wore his watch field glass knife notebook and pencils End of chapter 21